Test, test, test. How do you turn this off? Two minutes each or five minutes each? Uh, uh, five minutes each. Five at this point. Um, there will be something coming that may let them. Okay. Just don't take advantage. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Hey. You're my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll call the meeting to order and uh, welcome everybody to the Toronto Police Services Board uh, June meeting. Um, I would uh, ask first and foremost if there are, uh, of my colleagues if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Okay, hearing none, thank you. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of uh, May the 23rd, motion to approve. Uh, Dr. Nuria, second Ms. Muller, all in favor? Now this, uh, before I get into going through the agenda, this is obviously, as we can see, a very uh, packed meeting. I think we have uh, 80 plus uh, deputations. And so uh, I think as we've done in the past, uh, we're light of the uh, large number of deputations. We put a motion before colleagues to say that instead of the normal five minutes uh, for deputation, it will be three minutes. Uh, so the uh, uh, motion is on the board. Is there uh, any uh, discussion or comment? If not a motion, uh, Councillor Carroll, seconded. Councillor Lee, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, let's go through the agenda then. Um, we will, uh, item number four is a hold for presentation and deputation. Uh, the consent agenda numbers uh, five through 12. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to um, hold one of those? If not, may I get a motion to, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Lee, you uh, motion to approve, seconded. Ms. Molnar, all in favor? Aye. Carried, thank you. Um, item number 13 and 13-1 is hold for deputation. Item number 14 is hold for deputations. Item number 15 and 15-1 is hold for deputations. Uh, item number 16, uh, motion to approve. Councillor Lee, seconded Mayor Tory. All in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Item number 17 is uh, a hold to identify the nominee. Item number 18, uh, motion to approve. Councillor Carroll, seconded Ms. Muller. All in favor? Any contrary? It's carried. Item number 19, motion to approve. Councillor Lee, seconded. Dr. Nuria, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Uh, item um, number 20, uh, motion to receive. Uh, Councillor Lee, seconded Mayor Tory. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And the walk on agenda, which is item number 21, uh, uh, transgender inclusive policies and practice retention of a second subject matter expert. Motion to approve. Uh, Councillor Carroll, uh, Councillor Lee, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Thank you. I think given the uh, agenda items and given the fact that uh, we have uh, a number of uh, guests here to uh, present, um, I'm going to uh, move up uh, 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 15 and 17, which we've held ahead of 14. We have uh, 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 the committee here to uh, present on the um, access to historical data, and I think it's not fair given the number of deputations to hold them, and uh, number 17 is a very quick uh, decision. So uh, if you're all in favor of that, I would proceed on that basis. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, Councillor Carroll and Councillor Lee. Um, that takes us to item number four and uh, the presentation of the Corporate Risk Management uh, 2016 report. Good afternoon. We're just uh, working on the technical piece here. Before okay, we get started. And, and Inspector Callahan, you'll introduce your, uh, I your will. team. Wait, thank you. Mm 
So while Detective Kennedy is loading up the presentation, I'll just do the introductions. I'm uh, Acting Superintendent Peter Callahan. Um, I'm formerly the Unit Commander of Professional Standards Support. Um, with me is Detective Ian Kennedy from the Analysis and Assessment Section. Um, and we're presenting the Corporate Risk Management Annual Report today. What, we're, what the presentation will show you is an overview of the trend analysis and statistical re reporting that has been conducted by analysis and assessment for preparation of the Corporate Risk Management Annual Report. highlight some of the initiatives that have uh, been undertaken uh, this past year, um, some of the key information in the annual report. Um, the service is uh, currently transforming, as you know, and modernizing to a new uh, model of policing, and we are remaining focused on our goals of, as you know them from the strategy map, to be where the public needs us, embrace partnerships and create a safe community, and to focus on the complex needs of a large city. The first and the last goals are the most important. Um, we are working to reduce risk and liability to the service, promoting the overall wellness of our members and ensuring that the citizens of Toronto are receiving police services that are um, focused on professionalism at the highest level. Technology is a wonderful thing. Um, colleagues, if we're having uh, trouble with this, um, so. there are a couple pieces in there that have some um, some visuals that we're going to illustrate some of our points. So I'm not sure how you want to proceed, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, we, we can sorted. either uh, give uh, Inspector Callahan and his team uh, a couple of minutes and we can go on and say a deal with uh, items uh, 18 and uh, 17 and uh, 15 and get them out of the way. If you're comfortable with that, uh, Peter, that gives you a few minutes to figure out what the bugs are here. So item number 17, and jumping to that, is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it is the... Uh, uh, the, 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 we need a nominee for the Ontario Association of uh, uh, Police Service Boards uh, Board of Directors um, and a request for the, the, the funds for the OAPSB's Spring Conference. This, uh, uh, may we have a nominee? Yes, Absolutely. I nominate uh, Councillor Carroll. Okay. Interim. You're welcome. Councillor Carroll, do you accept that? It, uh, Yes, sir, I will stand. You. Okay, uh, seconder, uh, Ms. Mulner, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Councillor Carroll, thank you. Um, so, and, and in that is a motion to uh, uh, approve a, uh, an expense amount for the conference, a motion to approve. Councillor Lee again, seconded Mayor Tory. All in favor? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's the 2017 conference has just been pointed out to, to me just for clarification, so the upcoming one. Um, uh, so that was Councillor Lee, seconded by Mayor Tory. All in favour? Okay, carried. Uh, Peter, are you now... No, not yet. Um, uh, let's move on then to the... Um, uh, the the uh, access to historical data, um, and uh, that's item 15 and 15.1. And, and Chief Saunders, are you going to uh, address that first? And then we'll hear uh, from um, the panel. Um, well, what I'll do, uh, sir, is I will bring up um, Ali Musfi to uh, represent me with respect to this issue. Okay. Ali?
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Chair Chief, uh, we have um, uh, the report here with regards to, um, for the first quarter, as required by board policy, the first quarter of uh, access to um, what is defined in board policy as historical contact data. So um, I'll refer you to, uh, hopefully everybody's got a copy of this report. Um, just as a refresher, I think it's important that we uh, reflect first on the definition of historical contact data, um, because this is one of those things where in the regulation and the, uh, the regulation that came out that was put up by the province, the purview of access and retention of historical contact data was left entirely to boards, local boards, in this case the Toronto Police Services Board, uh, to determine what happens with those and specifically about the access. So in this case, in Toronto, um, although the regulation specifically says it only applies to records that to which the regulation would have applied. The decision at the board level here was that it will apply to all records, regardless of whether or not they fit the narrow definition and scope of the regulation. I think that's a, uh, one of the things where the board looked at setting that high watermark and going from the floor of the regulation to the ceiling that was established uh, by the board policy. So historical contact data was a proposed definition from the board policy. The service adopted that definition as well. And essentially, to put it in a very simple term, instead of just looking at the individual files that might have been covered by the regulation, the chief has decided to lock up the entire filing cabinet um, with keys that only he has access to, and members needing to access it would have to get uh, access with the permission or authorization uh, of the chief. And so that's what was done. Those business processes have been put in place here. All of those are laid out in the report in terms of um, the audit capacity, everything being locked up so it's not accessible to our, all of our members <coughs> service-wide. Um, there are some accesses that, uh, sorry, requests and access that happened in the first quarter. This report addresses all of those. Um, and what I can do is I think rather than walk you through all of it, I'll give you some very high-level numbers and then respond to specific questions as needed. I think that would be the best way to do it. Um, and one of the things to, it's important to know, we did include in this report as well, access that is where the public is asking for access to their own records or the services responding because of legal obligations. Those are listed there um, as well. So in a matter of due diligence being completely full and frank and fair that when this, these records are being accessed, even if it's something that the service has no choice about, uh, under law, whether it's the MFIP legislation or court orders or subpoenas, uh, inquests, things like that, that we've also said yes, because that is being audited as part of the process that the board asked for, that those records are also, um, sorry, the, the number of accesses are also recorded and reported in this report. But specifically, what our report has done is break it down into operational access and administrative access. The legal requirements stuff we've called administrative access. Those are things that are essentially responses to external requests from um, uh, organizations or individuals outside of the service. But for our own members, when our investigators are looking to have access, in the first quarter, that's called operational access, and in the first quarter there were only 14 cases, such cases of where members of the service, uh, for investigative type purposes or for case uh, legal proceedings, uh, asked the permission of the chief for um, access to the data, and of those only 13 were approved, one of them the chief denied. Um, and then after they were, after the access was approved, there's also what's called a post-access summary report, which is whether or not access did fulfill the purpose for which it was requested. Um, the purpose um, for which a request can be is another thing uh, of note here. The, the legislation permitted access to historic contact data or to these types of records for six specific purposes, one of them being ongoing police investigation, another being um, anticipated or, or uh, legal proceedings. Under the category of ongoing police investigation, the board asked through policy for the service to take the ongoing police investigation um, as a floor and establish a ceiling of substantial public interest. And in the case of the service, um, the chief has taken um, substantial public interest and in operationalized that by limiting the types of um, per, uh, sorry types of ongoing police investigations for which a member can request access. And though that shorter list, I'll refer to 
Give me a second. Sorry, excuse me. What that list does is it whittles down ongoing police investigation to things that are deemed a substantial public interest. So it would be investigations involving preservation of life and or preventing bodily harm or death, homicides and attempts, sexual assaults and all attempts, uh, occurrences involving abductions and attempted abductions, missing per person occurrences where circumstances indicate a strong possibility of foul play, occurrences suspected to be homicide involving found human remains, criminal harassment cases in which the offender is not known to the victim, occurrences involving a firearm or discharge of a firearm and or gang related investigations. So that is the threshold that the chief has set um, and essentially where again, compared to the regulation, the board policy and the chief's procedures have taken this from a floor of ongoing police investigation, which quite frankly could be a traffic investigation and said, no, the ceiling, the threshold that we've set is much higher. And these are all things of a substantial public interest, serious things that obviously the community and, and uh, the board would want our service investigating. So that's the base minimum for type of investigation for which a member could apply. And then the request is subjected to scrutiny multiple ranks of scrutiny uh, before it even gets to the chief. It may be denied at any one of those levels and ultimately still denied by the chief. Um, so those, four, those 14 requests, again, only 13 of the 14 were approved. One was denied. And then um, if it was the whatever specific purpose did it or did it not fulfill purpose, and I think in all but two, if I refer back to the report, um, in 11 out of the 13, it did fulfill the purpose and in two of them it did not. And subject to that, uh, any questions I'll take. Uh, uh, colleagues, I just remind you uh, before we get, as we get into questions that there are two depositions and there are also um, there's the secondary report from the uh, oversight committee, which uh, with two people here. So do you want to ask questions now or do you want to save it for the end of everything? Okay. Okay. Ali, don't go far, but thank you very much. <laughs> um, the first, uh, I'm sorry. Do you want to do that first? Okay. Okay. Uh, Can I sorry, just clarify? I, just, I yeah. we had a presentation from from Ali uh, from staff. Right. But but I assume that our questions can be on both this and the panel's report. Yes. Does the panel have a presentation? Yes, as well? it's coming in right now. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's do that, and, and, so, and then we'll um, ask the questions. Yeah. I'll ask, um, and I just uh, remind uh, colleagues that we set up this review panel around the discussion about uh, access to historic data, uh, and the review panel consists of myself as uh, a member from the board, uh, and uh, former Justice uh, Thea Herman, and also um, um, Audrey Campbell, um, who, as everybody knows, has been uh, chair of the or co-chair of the Pacer Committee for some time. So um, my colleagues, I'm uh, thankful, are here to present to us uh, collectively. So I don't know, uh, uh, Theo, uh, whether it's you or Audrey, but uh, I turn it over to you. First of all, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Thank you very much for coming to present it. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, now you can hear me. Um, Justice Herman will, will do the presentation. I'm here for support and answering any questions where I can. Thank you. All right. As, uh, as you're aware, our panel was set up under uh, the board's policy on regulated interactions. Uh, by virtue of this policy, it's to be composed of three individuals, a member of your board, and we have the chair on our committee, a community member, and that's Ms. Campbell, and myself, who's a retired judge. Um, our mandate is to review the chief's quarterly report for compliance with the policy, identify any significant trends, summarize our review of the report in a report to the board, and include, if necessary, any suggestions or recommendations for consideration of the board. Uh, this was our first um, report, and as such, we spent probably more time than, than we will in subsequent reports on familiarizing ourselves with the policy, on reviewing the procedure, on meeting with the chief, on having back and forth between the chief's, chief and his staff and, and, uh, and ourselves, 
Uh, we met a total of, on a total of three occasions to uh, develop our report and formulate our recommendations. Um, in our review, we've obviously been guided by the uh, sections 13 to 16 of the policy, um, the understanding that historical contact data is not to be accessed by members of the service without the required authorization, and authorization will only be provided if there's a substantial public interest or legal requirement. Uh, we, we hope that our report is informative, welcome any questions you have. Uh, we look to it to provide a baseline of information from, from which we can assess trends in future reports. In general, it's our opinion that the Chief's report reflects compliance with the policy. How our, however, we're also of the opinion that it would be helpful in future uh, reports to have further information and clarification on a few matters. Um, one issue that, that comes out in the report is that there are 30 individuals who've been authorized to have access to the information including eight individuals who are dealing with requests for operational access. We think it would be helpful to know who these individuals are, that is what positions they hold, and what criteria have been used to identify them. Uh, it would also um, be helpful to have additional information regarding the rationale that the Chief uses in deciding whether or not to approve a request and an assurance that all operational requests, including those pertaining to investigations and legal proceedings, are personally approved by the chief. Uh, we note that there's a, a distinction between approvals of requests for operational access and authorizations of requests for administrative access requests, and we would ask what the difference between authorizing a request and approving a request is. We also note that in both the categories of the operational requests and the administrative requests, there's something called legal proceedings, and we'd like to understand what the difference is between legal proceedings under the one category of operational mm -hmm. requests and the second of administrative requests. Um, the chief reported that two operational requests did not fulfill their purpose. It would be helpful if we could re receive elaboration as to how it is determined that a request does or does not fulfill its purpose. Um, we would also appreciate additional details in the next report regarding the, a detailed breakdown of the steps involved in the process to access data from the beginning to the end. Uh, in conclusion, we are satisfied that the first report complies with board policy but seek further information and clarification on a few matters. We were obviously not able to identify any significant trends because this is the first report, but we expect to look uh, in future reports at the issue of trends. And finally, we note that the vast majority of requests for access to data, that is 1,409 access requests were FOI requests, all of which the service is legally required to respond to. Um, and we welcome any questions or comments that you have. These are two depositions. Um, I think we might take those first and then uh, address questions. So. Yeah, and Audrey, first of all, thank you again uh, for all the work you've done. And uh, if you would just stand by, we'll uh, get people to come. And uh, we've got two deputants, and we'll ask them to come forward. Uh, the first is uh, Norm Gardner. And Norm, I'd remind you, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, that it's three minutes only now because of the number of people to talk today. My speech. I'm sorry, but uh, as a former politician, I'm sure you'll be able to adjust. I'll, I'll try my best. If... <laughs> oh, you have something. Good. Well, thanks very much. Uh... Is that better? Yep. Uh, I, I was kind of, um, you know, uh, embarrassed, I guess, uh, for the board that they had to adjourn the meeting a couple of meetings ago uh, due to. Uh, one of the deputants' uh, act activities on the uh, yeah, sitting here where I am right now, and I think that um, the, the board really should uh, should not surrender its jurisdiction of having a meeting uh, because of someone's uh, uh, activities, uh, you know, un unpleasant activities. The other thing I want to talk about for, for briefly is the budget. Uh, the reduction of the establishment of strength to, I think, 4750, if I'm uh, correct, uh, is going to have some problems. I think it, right now you've got a morale problem in the department. Um, and I, there's a. Norm, in fairness, you really have to stick to the issue, which is carding the, the, the historical data here. 
Okay, so, fine. If you want to start right, on carding. Okay. Um, race has always been an elephant in the room in dealing with, uh, y you know, community and police activities. Unfortunately, uh, in, so in, so in certain neighborhoods, the demographics are such that you've got a lot more uh, s uh, criminal activity than other activities, and consequently, uh, we wind up with a situation where uh, police activities have to be a little more uh, 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 vital than in some of the other areas. The, um, like I, I know that in your transformational policies, and it's kind of hard to stick to exactly what you want me to, but the, you, you're going to have to deal with a lot of criticism, uh, but you have to be able to deal with the criticism objectively. Not all of it is good criticism, but you can't fall into a, 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 an appeasement mode. Uh, because if you do, you will find that uh, your critics will get strength from it, and uh, consequently, you will be saddled with it, more and more of, uh, of the criticism because you, you, you haven't been dealing with it. Uh, you have to also uh, uh, make sure that the communities that are vulnerable do not become more vulnerable because of police saying, forget it, drive on, that kind of an attitude. Uh, I think if you're black, every, certain, every black person I know has suffered some sort of discrimination at some point in their life. And not only black people, but other minorities as well. So you have to be colorblind in dealing with activities in neighborhoods. And um, I think the, the very fact that you've got so many people on, a, uh, on, on an item such as the, um, the school resource officers is indicative of, uh, of uh, success. Uh, there, there are some people that don't want, that don't like police, and they will criticize any police activities and anything that works to the betterment. Uh, I know of many examples where people in the black community want uh, police resources. And um, I, I, I'm gonna have to leave some of the stuff out, but I wanna say that at one point, when I was chair, the president of the Jamaican Canadian Association and a lady who was the president of some of the black clubs came to me because when Chief Boothby was the chief, uh, a policy to withdraw pay duties occurred around black clubs. And as a result, there was a deep uh, drop in attendance at the clubs because of people not feeling that they were safe. Uh, we reinstituted the pay duties at that time and consequently, activities uh, or uh, business activities increased at the clubs. Uh, so, one minute, Norm. Okay, thank you. So, you know, there's always going to be some people that are going to criticize police activities, but at the same time, uh, if you withdraw them, you make the community much more vulnerable, and um, and and that's not a a, a very good thing to either. However, uh, I'll I'll sign off now. Uh, it, uh, anything I say might be a little more redundant, and Thank I'm you. eager to hear what some of the people have to say uh, in terms of other deputations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norm. Uh, colleagues, any questions of uh, Norm? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, deputant is uh, Dina Smith from the African Canadian Legal Clinic. Dina Smith here. Um, is that, uh... I'm letting you know that because we're all getting messages from our There are deputies in here. There's an overflow room, but it's my understanding they can hear me. There's no television outside. Can, can, can they not hear? Mr. Chair, yep. can one of the officers stand there and call out the names in case yes. those people are uh, there? The, uh, I'll do that now. We'll just wait a minute until we've canvassed both rooms. I apologize for the delay.
think, uh, colleagues, as we okay, okay, uh, Dina Smith was not able to make it apparently, and the African Canadian Legal Clinic is submitting a written uh, deputation instead. Um, then, colleagues, uh, questions of Ali um, or the review panel. Um, we, we, we should get Ali back first. Um, do you want to get them both up at the same time? There's no reason we can't. Okay. Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, it probably makes it easier. Uh, colleagues, uh, questions? Councillor Carroll, did you have anything? I do, yes. And I think, I think what I want to do is, is ask the panel first uh, their opinion, and then I'll follow up by asking uh, uh, Ali uh, the follow-up. Um, I was surprised myself that you note in your report uh, the issue of our, our policy doesn't explicitly require that when we do these quarterly reports, we're going to talk about uh, um, requests for data other than, uh, other than when members of service ask for the data. So that would leave out all of the people uh, looking for access to their own information. Um, I'm wondering if the justice uh, sees value in us uh, continuing to get that in a report and even, in fact, amending the policy. Should we keep track of, of how often the the, uh, the personal requests for data, the administrative requests are coming through, so so that it would, might inform when we can destroy the data. I, I would have thought that that would be a helpful piece of information for the board to have. How many people are are making requests for access to mm -hmm. the information? And as you note, it isn't um, strictly required, but it seems to me the fact that this information is being accessed 1,400 plus times is a significant piece of information. And over time, seeing maybe, maybe that's a one-time blip after the, the new policies yeah. in place, and maybe it will go down significantly after that, but I would think it would be interesting to find mm -hmm. out. I don't exactly. know, Audrey. No, no, I agree, because I think there's a direct correlation to what's been happening in the streets and the, the lack of trust on how people's information is being gathered. I think there's a direct correlation to that in the FOIs. People want to see what is in there. So if the policies are in place and if things are working correctly, we should see that number going down. And I think it's important to have that knowledge. Right, right. So if I can follow that up with a, uh, um, the, the, the officer's uh, response. I didn't realize it wasn't in the policy that we have the administrative request, requests uh, included as well in the report. But I don't want to start asking that we amend the policy every quarterly report. So I'm wondering, will, is, is the undertaking to continue to give us that data in these quarterly reports and we can maybe, in the annual review, discuss whether or not we need to just embed it in the policy for clarity? Will we continue to get the administrative data as well? If, yeah, um, what I can say is that we designed the first quarterly report to include that information. Um, essentially, began, essentially, I think we proactively addressed the issue of the data is being accessed, yeah. Um, yeah. whether or not it's at our behest. Um, so we included it in the front end in the first quarterly report. I, I think the concession would be that it's easy enough to continue to report on that. Okay. I won't move a motion if, if there's an undertaking that will continue to get that every report, and then in the annual review we can look at, okay, the numbers have gone down, but let's, let's put that in the policy. We, we, you know, because I don't want to start amending the, the policy every three months. So that's understood? It's an undertaking? It will always appear? Um, I, I don't know if I'm the, necessarily the person, the ranking authority, to make that concession. The spirit of this is to get it right. We're yeah. not trying to circumvent anything. Yeah. It's a learning process as the justice has explained. Things get exposed and we try to do our best to maintain as much transparency and as much accountability as possible. So, right. so we, the let's not yes. policy ourselves to death. Right, right, exactly. That's exactly what I want to avoid doing. Um, the, and the other one was I'm wondering if uh, 
the panel could unpack a little, because I, I highlighted it as well. Um, your recommendation is that the Chief should clarify in the next report how legal proceedings differ in each category. I'm wondering if you want to unpack a little why it's important to do that, and then, uh, then I'll, I'll follow up by asking, is it possible to do that a little verbally now, uh, so, that, so that we have some comfort uh, right now in a verbal report way, and then it'll be included next time? Part of the answer that, to that question also relates to um, our request that the, ish, the distinction between authorizing access and approving access be explained, mm -hmm. because I mean the chief could ex could explain what that is. I, I assume now, but I would assume that those 1,400 plus requests that are made, the chief isn't personally paying attention to them the way he pays attention to the operational requests. So because the, that distinction has been made, um, I think it's important for us to understand well, what follow, clearly what follows under each category and the degree of the chief's uh, involvement in, in particularly the operational requests. Uh, and we, so we were wondering what, the, what, the, what legal proceedings meant in the two because there seems to be a distinction between how those two kinds of access requests are treated. Okay. And so then my question, I guess, is to uh, Chief Saunders or, or your officer, is that easy to, to just give us a, a quick uh, uh, verbal preview of, uh, of how defining the various categories would look if we ask that that be added to the report in future? Yeah, um, for sure. We had it in, in the initial quarterly report, and having seen the questions from the review panel, um, I can certainly address it now. I think that the challenge becomes in trying to understand what is the difference between legal proceedings being asked for under operational and versus being asked for under administrative. And I think if we actually step back for a second and look at the distinction between administrative and operational um, first, because when it comes down to the authorized versus approved, um, uh, Madam Justice is right that the chief is not going to have the time. and based on other things that obviously the board requires of him, uh, to sit down and look at over 1,400 requests from individuals when they're seeking information about themselves, um, or subpoenas, or judicial orders, and things like that. So those are where um, the chief has authorized um, members of the service, specifically within units, that deal with those things. Um, and it may be helpful to actually answer one of the questions the panel had, which is, um, who are those 30 members that have access to this data, or have, sorry, not have access, who have been authorized? Um, not all of them actually access it. Um, and it, essentially, if you look at that, the first 12 members are people who work in our access and privacy section, dealing exclusively with freedom of information requests. So they're authorized because, um, as is the services information officer, um, to authorized to have access for that when it's, those requests are coming from the outside. Um, it's also the same case for uh, members of legal services and our business intelligence unit, which actually takes care of preparing the underlying data for this report, um, and of course a member of technical support. So those members have been authorized to access it for those purposes. Um, and so some, when it comes to, for example, um, whether it's a, a subpoena request or a judicial order, um, a motion, an inquest, those types of things, where the service is obligated to comply with the law under which those things are being requested, um, then that's, those are where the uh, units like legal services and access to privacy have already been authorized to access the data. It is still audited, and that's why we're able to report on it to you. So the difference in that type of legal proceeding compared to the operational, legal, uh, operational request, which may involve legal proceedings, for matters that the police have put before the courts. Right, right. And that's the distinction. So legal proceedings covers inquests. It covers okay. judicial orders, children's aid hearings, uh, custody hearings, things where those types of records are being requested, but it's not necessarily in police-initiated um, charges before the courts. Okay. Okay. And then if I can ask one more. Um, yeah. uh, Turn that off. No, I did. Uh, so I was just to say it's, it's oh, you, you know, you to finish, and then uh, Mayor Tory, and then Councillor okay. Lee. Okay, I was Ms. surprised. Mulner. I was surprised to see because in your presentation, you 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 talk about uh, keys that only he has access to, that the, the chief has access to, but. As the, the report says, and then it's highlighted again in the panel's report, the chief reports that it takes a total of thirty members of the service be permitted access to the data in order for the chief to comply with the policy. 
So now we're back to a lot of people have the keys. Uh, if it takes 30 people uh, for him to do it, I still need to be I still need to be assured because this is what the community asked of us that that you've got to go through all those hoops. Uh, the 30 people are facilitating; they don't actually have direct access because if they if if 12 or 30 have direct access, I'm back to wondering if this is going to accidentally find its way to a background check. I can, I can definitely address that, and, it's, and that's, I thank you for that because it's a very legitimate concern. Um, I think it's, it's important to revisit that we have over 8,000 members on our service, and initially, not necessarily the entire 8,000, but certainly thousands of members had access. Years ago when we started this process, um, there were essentially every police officer and most of our civilian staff had access to this for uh, whatever purposes they had uh, with regards to their own particular units. So we are taking that 8,000 plus number and moving it down to 30 to start with. So it's significantly smaller. And then I can break down and explain exactly what that 30 is. Uh, as I said, 12 for access and privacy. So those 12 individuals, um, one of them is actually the, uh, the person who's in charge and doesn't actually necessarily look at the access herself, but is, uh, oversees the members who do, but they are that 12, that group of 12 is specifically um, tasked with dealing with the freedom of information requests. Um, in terms of whether or not this might find its way into a background check, for example, um, there's a couple of things that prevent that. Um, first of all, the integrity of that unit. I'll tell you that even when we were trying to do with some board compliance stuff to do some testing, uh, they refused to let us do a check to test the audit capacity. They said, no, we need a file number, a freedom of information request file number. So they don't do checks for any other sections of the service to start with. Um, so that's one of the first things. Second of all, um, through procedures and routine orders, the chief has specifically uh, reiterated the fact that uh, uh, 208's carding historic contact data is not used for um, police reference checks, the vulnerable sector screening, or any of those things, and the unit-specific policy uh, for the police reference check program has been updated to make sure that that's reflected. So there's several layers of governance and business process that prevent that from happening to start with. Um, legal services operates under the same sort of diligence and integrity as the access and privacy in that. Um, they also wouldn't do that audit test check that we wanted done to see if our audit mechanisms were working. They would also not do that for us because they only operate with file numbers. So it specifically has to be a, uh, a requirement, whether it's a subpoena, a court order, a judicial proceeding, something that has, has compelled the service. That's the only time that they access it. Um, the other section is the business intelligence. Uh, so sorry, there was five members in um, in legal services. There's five members in business intelligence, and those are the business intelligence unit is the one that actually puts together all the underlying data, um, gathers all the audit information, the underlying data for the annual reporting. Sorry, for the quarterly reporting as well as the annual report. So that's the reason they have access. Interesting note there is they don't actually access the individual records. They're more looking at the aggregate level, but nevertheless, it is the database. Okay. Um, and that is actually where we had to go to get them, and, and they agreed to do the audit test check for us because they said, yes, working under strategy management uh, unit responsible for ensuring that the service is in compliance with board policy, they said, yes, that would fulfill our mandate for compliance with law, right? And then the last person is a tech, tech support because without tech support, we'd lose access to the system, uh, and that's it. So the other, the last eight group, I think, is one of the ones that's most interesting, though. The last group of eight members working at intelligence services who actually access the data for the operational requests, they are civilian members of the service. And one of the things that's, uh, I think, a key to keep in mind here is, again, thousands of officers, over 5,000 officers who had access to this in the past. Now the business process is an officer submits an operational request to the chief through their uh, chain of command. It goes all the way up to chief. If approved, that officer is still not getting access to the data. That group of eight members who um, work at intelligence services, the civilian staff who oversee this project, um, this data, they are the ones who the chief has said, okay, I have now given permission to this officer. You can go in on behalf of that officer, take a look at the database, and then provide the results. So the officers themselves don't actually, still don't access the data. Um, if we were to turn it on for individual officers, then 
that was one of the challenges. Well, how do we know they're only accessing it for the purpose that the chief has approved? So that's another part of the auditing mechanism and control. So hopefully that explains. Okay, Councillor Carroll, Mayor Tory. Well, I'll just follow on, uh, Mr. Chair, with uh, uh, Councillor Carroll's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not satisfied with that answer in the, in the following sense. I know you were trying to explain who all these people are and what they do. And I would say 7,000 officers to 30 is good progress, but I think we have more progress to make because certainly I think the way it was described initially by you, which is that the chief had the keys and that the vault was only to be opened you know, by the chief, certainly doesn't, in my view, need to extend to 30 people. And I, I look at it this way. I mean, if you look at the 1,400, uh, and if you divide that by 100 workdays in a quarter, it's 14 of those requests a day, and most of those are people asking for their own records. And then the rest of them, there's a total of, of I think it's 30, or was it, or some, some such number, uh, or 13, I think it was actually, over the entire quarter, spread across 100 days. And I just, I, if I have to do it by way of motion, I'm happy to do that, but to ask you uh, and the chief, and, and perhaps assisted by our uh, advisors, uh, to take 30 and take it down further, because I think notwithstanding all that explanation, um, it sounds like an awful lot of people for, for that kind of numbers. I mean, 14 of those requests a day, is not a solid day's work for one person, I wouldn't think, uh, notwithstanding whatever the administrative requirements are. But as I just would, would be asking that. Uh, so that was a, a question as to whether you would undertake to do that and see if you can get that number down substantially from 30, because I think you could. I just think the less people that have access to this, uh, the better. That was the idea. So, Chief uh, Saunders, you wish to respond? For the most part, um, as the administrative process was explained, the um, access still has to be okayed by me at the end of the day. Um, the assumption that 30 people are working at the same time, we have to have redundant processes in place. We have people working days, afternoons, nights, weekends. We have people on holidays. We have people on courses, conferences, all kinds of things. There are a lot of uh, business processes that go on. And so having that number uh, allows the opportunity for us to meet those capacities because you know the 1,400 uh, plus um, is a concern right now to make sure that we meet the uh, adequacy standards with requests that are being made. Now, having said that, as, as time goes on and if the trend shows that those numbers are reduced, um, I certainly would be the first in line to reduce the number of redundancies that may need to be in place. Well, I'll probably make a request in any event, which I can do by way of a motion. My other question, Mr. Chair, was for the uh, advisors, our, our review group. Would I be right in saying that when you look at your recommendations, the one about providing information regarding the rationale utilized by the chief, and then I take that going together with clarification regarding the two operational requests that didn't fulfill their purpose and why, um, that that's you asking, looking for more granularity with respect to the circumstances? Because I would certainly yeah. want to know that you felt you had, and obviously this suggests you need more information as to the basis upon which decisions are being made or, or, or to approve or not to approve. There, there's right? the, the upfront approve or not approve, and then there's at the end of the day, it's a couple of them didn't fulfill the purpose. We want right. to understand uh, what goes into making a decision to approve and understand what kinds of um, requests aren't fulfilling the purpose for which they're made so we can identify any trends or issues or problems. And then the second two I've paired up, and thank you for that answer, is there three are, are the one about assurance that all requests are approved personally by the chief together with the beginning to end process map. Mm -hmm that you really need to see from the minute somebody asks yeah. all the way through who touches yeah. this. And this relates to the 30 people question too and are there yeah. other people that are doing this that feel they have delegated authority? Because I don't, myself, I didn't ever see this as involving delegated authority. That, that you'd say yes to a request, it would be executed by a person and, and would move forward. But is that, are those two tied together as well? So I yeah, guess it would be absolutely. fair, with, Mr. Chair, to ask the chief or somebody to respond from the police service as to today or at the next meeting uh, as to how they respond to these requests, which strike me as being extremely reasonable and well-founded. Uh, you know, well, uh, uh, the, the order is next, uh, Councillor Lee, and then Ms. Molnar, and then Mr. Jeffers, you had your hand up too? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, on this 1445, uh, is the expectation that you're going to split it up into two, whether it's a FOI request by the public? Because 1409 of that is uh, from a request by individuals. So are you going to break that out in terms of granularity into two different lines? Um, sorry, if you can just clarify in terms of... Okay, uh, of this 1445, 1409 is a request by individuals, so it should be in two lines then. 
So there were of the you're talking within the administrative access. Right. Those 1,409 were FOI requests right. under MFIPA. Should be a, be a separate line um, uh, from the other one. The other one would be uh, 4936. So 30, uh, 35 36, were... 36, yes, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. 35 were still... In, those were all for the services but compliance no, no. with law. Yeah. So 35 of them were legal yeah. services, again, responding to whatever... But and will it be reported out policy. separately in terms of two lines Each rather than just one the, line? Yeah. For the administrative access? No. Right now, you have the uh, report saying 1445. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see in two lines. Uh, one is uh, by FOI, requests, individual requests. By break, individuals, break down what the administrative access yes. clustering is. Yeah, and uh, can, are you at liberty to say how many came up with uh, no information found? How many people? How many? Excuse me. Requests uh, came back uh, with uh, no information found. Councillor Lee, may I just interrupt for a minute? There have been a number of people walking back and forth behind the deputants. Uh, we want to keep that area as clear as possible. Clear, yeah. um, so. And uh, no movement back and forth there. If you've got to go around from one side to the other, please go out and uh, go around. Thank you very much. Of this request, can you quantify how many came back with no records found, like nothing found? Um, I cannot, and I can tell you I specifically cannot because of compliance with law. Um, and this was one of the challenges we had with regards to the FOI requests. We're not able to, again, the integrity of the unit, they will not report to us uh, or, or even to the chief as to what the results of those checks are. Um, we're not entitled to know whether or not the person, what, what essentially was given to the person, whether it said yes no, or no. We, I'm not asking yeah. for what no, was I'm given to the yeah, so access. All I need to know is how yeah. many came back with the no, no information found. And that's what I'm saying. Access and privacy will not even tell okay. us that. You won't allow us. Okay, yeah. it's privacy. Okay. We're not allowed by law. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my, I have two questions, one for the service and one for the panel. And so I'm going to start with the service. And my question, uh, it, it builds on the mayor's reference to a process map. And I'm wondering if you walked us through what that would we heard what the process map yep. is. Perhaps for the next report, you could actually map that out. I think that would be very helpful. Yep. Thank you. Um, and including in that, I would expect to see how much time the process takes from the request to approval on the operational side. I'm less interested in the freedom of information side. So on the operational request, not the administrative request. Because I assume if I asked you that today, there's 14 requests. Mm -hmm you wouldn't necessarily be able to say, on average, it took this amount of time. Is it, you don't know that yet. Uh, no, and, it, and it, in, in order to be in compliance with policy, we initiated a paper process that's just recently become an electronic right. process, so we will have better uh, reporting capacity for that. I think that'll be useful to know as well. Thank you. Okay. And if, of my question for the panel, first of all, thank you very much for your work on this. Um, and I'm interested more in the, the qualitative side of this process. The board has been working hard on transparency, accountability. This is one of our first initiatives on a very topical subject, a hot topic, to sort of engage outsiders in how this can work with the, in the service and with in, in uh, relation to our responsibility to the community. How did this work from your perspective in terms of the ability to get the information you needed? Was, were there any areas where you felt things were more forthcoming, less forthcoming? I'm interested in the, the how of this process. Thank you. Okay, I, there was a back and forth process at the beginning, which I thought was very useful. We're all feeling our way for, the first, for our first report. And um, I don't have any problems. There were issues, the questions we asked, and, and the chief and, or his staff answered them. And at a certain point, we thought that we should <laughs> stop the back and forth, present the board with, with a, uh, a report. And if we had further questions uh, or questions for clarification, to put those forward to the board, because we perhaps could have gone back and forth for quite some time. Um, but certainly, I found the chief and the staff helpful in clarifying questions that we had. Uh, when we saw earlier drafts of the uh, of the report, I don't know if either of the other two com panel members have any comments on that. Well, I I've, I've been volunteering with the with the uh, service for a few years now, so I, I tend to understand um, that there's a certain mindset of how things work, 
and we come at it from a different lens. So it was, it was just pulling all of that out because when you're accustomed to doing things a certain way, you just assume, well, I just have to make these minute changes. As we got further into it and we delved into it and we asked more and more questions, that's why there was so much back and forth. And that's why you see the recommendations that we have are the same things that are coming out at this table. So we are pushing and probing and um, digging to make sure that the, the transparency is there. That's, what we, that's the drum we keep beating. There has to be transparency where they think, well, we were, we're being transparent. We're not agreeing at certain, at certain um, points. But to the chief's credit and to his staff's credit, they've been responding accordingly. Sorry, Ken. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 Chief, could we stop the movement back and forth behind the screen here? It is disruptive and, uh, and unfair to the deputants. Perhaps we could just take a... Okay, there, there's space over here in this corner, right, right behind you here. Right over there. Uh, uh, Mr. Coles, uh, Desmond, sorry, if you wouldn't mind just moving away to the side too, please, and uh, because uh, you're crowding in on the space for the deputants. Thank you. And I apologize, I recognize it's crowded, uh, but there is space down there and space along that wall, so please utilize it. Thank you. We're trying to accommodate them. I'm told that they have uh, video access and there are people, there are people out there, there are people out. So uh, there is only so much space and we have people out there to call people's names and we will wait if they're out there for them to come forward. In the meantime, please make sure we keep this space behind the deputants clear. Thank you. Um, sorry, Mr. Jeffers, uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> um, you'd mentioned that, the, that uh, it's still too early to to determine what trends there are. Um, can you give us a sense as to what, based on the whole historical evolution of all of this, what sort of trends would you be looking for you know, so that we can uh, address that at some point? Well, first of all, it's the number of requests and the kind of requests that are being made. Um, if we see a trend of a lot of requests being made and they don't and are they're approved and they don't fulfill their purpose that would obviously be a matter of concern requests being made that um, understanding how the approval process worked um, trends we talked earlier about trends in foi requests although not strictly following under the policy would be a significant trend to watch as well i would think um i don't know do a, do you have any comments Audrey? i i think um uh, what Thea said, uh, I agree with that, and and I think as the process goes on, more things will be highlighted. So it, it's still a little early. Well, you know, the, the part of the, the the rationale for my question is also um, based on what has gone on before, race-based data, and all that sort of thing, and all of that. Um, and there's a major concern, and and you know, by the by the communities. I'm wondering how you're going to address that because, you know, the, the whole question of transparency, question of trust and all of that, that factors into it. So is there any way you're planning to, to look at that? Well, we can only report what we find, right? And we made a commitment, everybody knows the way we have worked, especially on PACER as well. We're not afraid of bringing anything to the forefront. So we can tell you very specifically and very honestly and very earnestly that whatever we see will be brought forward. But at this point, like uh, Thea said, there are certain indicators we can look for at this point, but anything that comes out as we probe will also be highlighted and reported.
Okay, uh, no other questions. Colleagues, Mayor Tory, did you have a, uh, a motion to put forward? Um, yeah, I, I would just remind people to answer. Uh, we do have Wi-Fi. It is working. Uh, the username, uh, TPSBM1, uh, and the password, capital N, capital F, dash 35, uh, small case MHA. So it is working. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just had someone do it, and that's what he told me. So, uh, Mayor Tory? Mr. Chair, that uh, the Chief be asked to report to the next meeting of the Board on measures which could be undertaken to reduce the total of 30 members between the two categories authorized to access historical contact data to a lesser number, which is as small as possible in keeping with the intention of the access policy. Uh, discussion, colleagues? Uh, if not uh, opposed by Mayor Tory, seconded. Uh, Council, uh, no, Chief Saunders, sorry. Um, could I have one more month because the deadline for next meeting is a couple of days from now? Uh, I think that's fair, Mr. Chair, because we do, we're not expecting the next report. And, and, uh, you know, I, I'd like but, as soon as possible. If you say it's 30, 60 days, then. Ideally, what I'd like to do is I'd like to incorporate it with the next. Um, so I'm not creating another I, I, report I, I, on top of another report. I, I'm satisfied with that because okay. you'll tell us that hopefully those numbers we will. will be changed. Yes, thank okay. you. That's thank fine. you. Yeah. To the next quarterly report. Okay, that's the motion put forward by Mayor Tory, seconded by Councillor Carroll. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Thank you very much, and uh, Justice Herman and, and uh, uh, Ms. Campbell, thank you very much for all the work that you've done. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it, and it's very important. So thank you. And Ali, thank you and, and your team. I appreciate it. So um, we also need to pass a motion receiving both reports. That's uh, 15 and 15-1 and the deputation. Um, motion, Councillor Carroll. Seconded, uh, Ms. Muller. All in favor? Any contrary? Carried unanimously. Um, I think, uh, are we now ready for the uh, Corporate Risk Management Report? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, I apologize for the delay. Okay, Inspector Callahan, over to you. All right, uh, so go ahead to the next slide. And I think we've all had a chance to, to read the report, so if you could, uh, Inspector, go through it fairly quickly, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we'll do, sir. We, um, we trust that everyone had read the report, so what we've done is tried to highlight a few of the, uh, the key points um, from this year's report. So the analysis and assessment section uh, provides the statistical an analysis and the trend data um, relating to public complaints, internal conduct complaints, uh, civil litigation, human rights uh, complaints, collisions, uh, vehicle pursuits, SIU investigations, and uh, use of force. So the data is maintained in the uh, professional standards information system 
and is used proactively to identify and analyze trends surrounding the practices and conducts of the TPS members. Public complaint. Skip ahead to public complaint. There we go. Uh, so we're committed to fair and open uh, public complaints process, and um, we have a liaison officer assigned uh, to work with the Office of the Independent uh, Review Director uh, to ensure that complaints are uh, dealt with in an expeditious manner and thoroughly investigated. Um, the information from this complaints we use um, to inform our training, which we are going to hear about in a little bit. Um, we have uh, the professional standards investigators also doing outreach training. I think that's a key uh, component. They uh, take the information they learn from their investigations and they're using it to identify for members trends we're seeing in uh, conduct um, so that we can improve the service we're delivering to the public. For instance, in 2016, um, investigators noted a trend in uh, public complaints being lodged um, because of um, the complainant's perceived lack of communication from the officer. The complainant stated that they didn't feel that the officer sufficiently explained the reasoning behind their actions. Um, so the training focused on the importance of officers ensuring proper customer service to the citizens of Toronto, taking the time to adequately explain their actions and decision making um, was stressed as part of the presentations. That was also incorporated when we got uh, later in the year and um, the regulated interactions um, legislation came out. We incorporated a component, uh, a large measure of that program, the training that was mandated for it, was focused on customer service. So that's using that information um, to inf inform our training and service delivery. So just a few points from the uh, trends from the 2016 complaint data. Uh, there were 680 public complaints filed in 2016. Of those, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director um, had 340 investigated and 340 were screened out. I think it's interesting to note here that the last year when the, the legislation required that the Toronto Police Service do its own screening process, um, we screened in 60%. So we defaulted to, when in doubt, to investigate more complaints than we would screen out. Um, the director has gone and screened out more, more complaints. So I think that speaks to um, our cautious approach to making sure that we look at all the issues that are brought forward to us and um, in fact, um, we were probably a, a little bit um, overzealous in screening things in, if anything. Um, there was a slight increase in complaints last year. Um, we attribute that um, to an outreach uh, and process improvement on the part of the uh, Office of the Independent Review Director. The director had his staff do more um, information sessions in the community more people became aware of the complaints process and he um, did some process improvements in his office to make it easier for people to file complaints. So we're attributing some of the increase uh, last year to that, those efforts on his part. So 25% uh, of the complaints were concluded with a disposition that the allegations were unsubstantiated. Only 2.6% uh, of the investigated complaints resulted in a finding of misconduct. So the uh, Office of the Independent Review Director also um, has undertaken um, some in alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, and we've worked with him to implement those dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, in the Act, it's referred to as customer service resolutions, so we are permitted at the front end when a, a person brings a complaint to, to the station, um, if their concern is customer service focused, the staff sergeant at the station can work with the complainant to resolve it at the front end. Once the complaint has been lodged, um, the Office of the Independent Review Director has a mediation process where the officer and the complainant can be brought together to um, mediate the situation and hopefully arrive at a solution that resolves the customer service issue on behalf of the complainant. And we've worked actively um, to participate in that process when it's brought forward to us by the uh, director. So in 2016, 
There were 17 um, successful local resolutions and 41 successful customer service resolutions. Police officers may be required to use force to protect the public and themselves in the course of their duties and uh, um, an authority granted in the criminal code. Um, there's also um, extensive regulations uh, from the Minister of Community and Correctional S Services. Um, I'll, sk I'll skip ahead on that part. The analysis of uh, the use of force data also goes through the Toronto Police College and that also informs our, our training efforts. Um, in 2016, after a review of the data reports related to both use of force and special, special investigations incidents, it was determined that a re relatively high percentage of the SIU-related um, injuries were due to custody injuries, which very often were related to the grounding of suspects uh, when an um, arrest was being effected. So in 2016, the in-service training program um, introduced new techniques um, in the use of force component in an effort to reduce the number of injuries. As a result, custody-related injuries decreased 19.6% uh, from two, the 2015 numbers. Just another uh, important note there too. In 2016, there were approximately 28,000 arrests. And in those 28,000 arrests, use of force was required in only 3.9%. Uh, pursuit reduction uh, initiatives. Uh, the service-wide um, e-learning training was conducted in 2016. Um, the training is mandatory requirement for any officer who might engage in a pursuit, and the training ensures uh, members are conversant with the TPS procedures, which focus on identifying risks associated with the pursuit and introduction instruction on alternative strategies. So go ahead to the next slide, Ian. So we're just going to show you a little video here of this is a simulator that's being used as part of the pursuit training. So what you'll see on the screen here is what the officer would see in the simulator at the college. And if you look at the upper right hand portion of the screen, you'll see there's a speed reading there. So you can see the instructor operating the car for our, our demonstration here. You can see the speed is climbing here. So the speeds get up. So the instructor has followed the Ontario Highway Traffic Act. He stopped for the red light and then proceeds when it's safe to do so. But once again, the speed climbs to a very high rate. So you're gonna see something comes up on the screen here very shortly. The officer is traveling in their uh, marked lane. Uh, we have oncoming traffic here and we see what happened there. The bus in the other direction, an impatient driver has pulled out in front of them and right into the officer's path. The point of this for the training that we're trying to get across to the officers is engaging at pursuits at those high rates of speed um, reduce the amount of time that they have to exercise their judgment and avoid a collision. So this is something we could only do by using a tool like this. We wouldn't be able to do this kind of um, judgment training um, and reinforce these kind of safety lessons um, uh, in a real vehicle that only the simulator can deliver us. So, so this is the alternative methods that we're using, using technology to deliver better training, to reduce the number of, of accidents and injuries from pursuits. Okay, next one, uh, Ian. Let's go ahead to the less lethal shotgun. So over the years, there's been a number of issues with um, use of force, particularly around um, uh, people in crisis. And um, one of the questions that's raised uh, on, on occasion has been um, what other options could have been used as opposed to uh, the firearm or other lethal forms of force. So last year, the less lethal shotgun was introduced. And here you can see the chief uh, trying out the new shotgun at the uh, range at the college. Um, this is a standoff weapon that's allowed our members now to, to use a less lethal uh, option from a distance. So if we have an individual armed with a weapon and we can keep our officers back, that gives them time to engage in communication with the individual. The distance um, provides 
time for the officers to react if the person does um, all of a sudden become aggressive. And um, this has proved to be a very effective option. Skip ahead, Ian, please. Um, uh, we'll leave the early intervention part. It's well explained in the report. Skip ahead. Yeah, Inspector Callahan, if we could just uh, move it up. Uh, actually, may I interrupt for a minute, Councillor Carroll? You've been outside yeah, the on a, point on of order. Yeah, on a point of order, uh, I, I just went out there to clarify on behalf of the board what service we are offering right now. We have fewer chairs in here than we have deputants. So while we may have prioritized getting deputants into this room, there are still many deputants out there, which means it is wholly inadequate that there isn't a television out there. Uh, there is Wi-Fi, but it is not adequately explained. Uh, uh, no one out there knows that, they, that the network they should be looking for is T-Guest, and then they use the information that is on the wall. So they are all typing the username in as the network name. So as best I could, I have tried to explain how to access Wi-Fi, but the fact that there are deputants out there who really do have no way of knowing what's going on in here is, is creating a very difficult situation. I think that is a point of order because procedurally we should be serving someone who's registered to speak when they're out in the room. I don't know where in the building we might have another TV set, but it should be in that lobby right now if that is in fact the secondary space they're supposed to be monitoring the meeting from. Uh, Councilor Carroll, first of all, thanks for doing that. Uh, Chief Saunders, second of all, uh, can we send someone out uh, immediately to explain the uh, properly explain the access to Wi-Fi so that indeed people can get there and um, uh, identify, it should be easy to identify deputants uh, uh, and uh, we've got the list of, the, we'll call them in and, and just uh, keep them available and, and there must be another TV, uh, there's certainly one up in my office so we can get it and bring it down. Um, we should be doing that. Yeah, first and foremost, what we'll do is we'll put up the right uh, access and password and we'll put it in notification outside so that people have an opportunity to get the right Wi-Fi. There is an overflow in uh, Corpcom that has a camera and sound system as well. And um, we will uh, rest assured that anyone that has taken the time to come here to have their say will have their say. We'll create a mechanism so that uh, as a name is called, as we did with the first, and we did the investigation, found out they were not here, so no one has missed an opportunity yet, nor will we make that happen, nor would we make that happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, Peter. I, we're just going to show you one more thing and we'll, we'll wrap this up um, Thank you. and get to questions. So um, one of the things we did last year also was we uh, did a media training day at the college and we had a number of members of the media come in and run through the exact same scenarios that our officers are trained on. So this did a number of things. One, it inf informed the public about how our officers are trained, what they're, what they're um, taught. And I think what it shows you as well is how difficult some of the uh, the certain scenarios our officers face are, and uh, you'll just get a quick uh, glimpse here at exactly what, uh, what what our officers are are learning at the college when it comes to use of force situations. Go ahead again. Yep, this is Austin Delaney, CTV News. You can see there, in these scenarios, one of the important points too is you can see Mr. Delaney came in there with the weapon in place, the instructor immediately jumped in. So it's very interactive, it's, it's an opportunity in the middle of a scenario to stop and for the instructors to work directly with our officers um, to provide the, the training. The same thing would happen if one of our officers made those same kind of mistakes, we could stop, we can do a debrief. The good thing about that particular scenario is that scenario has been built on in the 2017 training. So in that one, the scenario is presented so that the woman is immediately being attacked. In this 2017 scenario, the, the stabbing has already taken place and it's in a schoolroom setting. The, the, the victim in that scenario is a teacher, they're on the ground and the student is still in the school. And so what we wanted to do with the officers was to, to show them that it's not always this scenario. The option in that case is to try and um, get between the 
uh, victim and the, the student and engage the student with conversation and then get help so that we're providing some nuance to the training every year and each bit of training builds on the previous year so that we take the lessons we learn from our data and teach our officers um, and hopefully we get a better product and we're seeing that generally over time the, the, the we're getting service improvements and that's the, the main purpose of collecting and analyzing this data. Thank you, Inspector Callahan. Uh, colleagues, questions? Dr. Nuria? Yeah. Uh, my question is about the percentage of use of force, just for me to understand it. You said that there were 2.2 2 .2 million documented contacts that you had last year, yes. of which 28,000 were arrests made. Okay. And the percentage of force that you talked about is 3.9%. Just so that I understand, is 3.9% excessive? Is 3.9% the median? How does it compare with the major cities that we, we are usually compared with? There is, there is data comparison uh, to other major cities when it comes to complaints. Um, but the use of force I'm talking about. We don't have access to um, use of force. The province does keep that um, data. Um, the use of force reports a provincially mandated form, so it's for, uh, forwarded to the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Um, we could make a request of them to analyze that, that, that data, but we don't directly have access to the other um, services uh, use of force data. In other areas, when you don't have a baseline data, what you generally do is to compare with what happened last, the previous year or the previous Correct. year until you have a good comparator yes. for Toronto. Yes, and, and one thing that the board asked us in the past was um, we, we had been reporting the data uh, year by year, and a previous uh, version of the board asked us to also provide a five-year average so that we could kind of get a sense of, of where we are over a, a period of time as well. Okay. So if you can answer, what is, uh, the, how does 3.9% compare with the previous years at the TPS? Okay. That, that's... It's in the it's in the range. It's 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 within the the average range. Good, thank you. Other questions, colleagues? Ms. Muller. Again, on use of force, I was uh, reading and listening to your reference to the less lethal shotgun, which was used four times. Yes. And I, it may be in the report, but I didn't have the time to find it. What happened in that those four occasions? One and two. How does it compare to more lethal uh, shotguns? Um, I assume the deployments were successful in the four the four times. Um, sp specifically, we'd have to go in and, and take a look at each each incident. We weren't, weren't expecting um, to go that deep in, into the data. We could we could explore that. Um, I'm not 100 percent clear on what your so the distinction you want me to make between the less lethal and the and the lethal areas, uh, if I can. Well, it's a completely separate area. So if there's lethal, I assume there's something that I may have overlooked that's called a lethal shotgun or an equivalent, which is, and so when, how many times was that deployed and what okay, was the, um, and I know that that data exists in relation to. Um, that, if that were, if that were used, um, it would show up in the general shooting data. It would yeah. just be collected with pistols, um, C8 rifles, or the, the MP5 that the emergency task force used. So um, that, that would be captured among that data. So it, it, it wouldn't be broken down specifically uh, by shotgun. In so that I'm manner. not a researcher, but it strikes me that a researcher, but it strikes me that if we're looking at less lethal, it begs the question, what about more lethal? So I leave that with you to think about how you may capture those nuances for a further reports. Fair. Thank we'll you. we'll take that under uh, advisement. Thank you, colleagues. Any more questions? We have one deposition from Ms. Ross. That, uh, but are there any more questions before we move? To, uh, counsel, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Jeffers. Yeah, just a quick question here. <clears throat> I was just looking at the training video that you um, showed there. Um, is there a correlation? Well, not a correlation, but it, when you look at the, at the training for, for in, in, in use of excessive force, etc., the imaging that that uh, and the examples that they use, um, I'm, is there a, a, a concern that the, you know the imaging sometimes brings uh, an impulsive reaction based on the profile of the individual by race, etc.? In other words. 
you know, um, I remember looking at a documentary you know, about training in the United States, and they were, there was a discussion around some of the, 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 the subjects in the training who were being taken down, et cetera, and they were largely African Americans. And there was a, a, a major discussion in Chicago ar around that. So I'm just wondering if that's a factor at all. No? Um, like most of our units, the, the Toronto Police College has got a very diverse staff that includes the um, the, the staff in the uh, in-service in training uh, section. Um, that's a very good question. I'd have to I'd look at the, the composition of the in-service training section. My experience for my in-service training is you, you get a diverse uh, background um, in that in that section, if I had to if I had to say anything, if there's any flaw in the in-service section, it's probably overly skewed male and white, um, and that if that if there's any flaw, that's the flaw. And I know that um, Superintendent Lennox is uh, working constantly to improve the diversity of the unit based on the overall diversity of the service. Um, but in terms of the subjects in the scenarios, in our scenarios, they're they're probably skewed the, in the other direction. Yeah, because um, that became, as I said, uh, it was a, uh, a major po point of discussion uh, in police training. Uh, and so that an impulsive reaction based on yes. the training where you see a particular image of, her, of, of the criminal or, or whatever, you know, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm familiar with some of the research you're talking about in the United States, and I know that the, the training standards section at the college is very aware of that. Um, it, that's also incorporated in our implicit bias training that was part of uh, fair and impartial policing, that was part of the regulated interactions training. So we're also reinforcing those lessons to te teach our officers about implicit bias and the impact it has on their judgment. That's one of the reasons why we do that and the video simulation training um, so that we can discuss judgment as part, as part of the use of force option and we can identify by watching officers in practice those that might be um, inclined to demonstrate poor judgment. That's the other reason that we maintain the early intervention program too, where we track the number of use of force incidents compared to um, the baseline officer and look for uh, instances where officers are using more force than their, than their peers would be. Okay, uh, Dr. Callahan, thank you. Uh, we've got one deposition, so don't go too far away, but uh, uh, the one, uh, the, the person to uh, make a deposition, uh, Brenda Ross. Brenda, are you still here? Yes. Oh, thank you. And Brenda, I apologize, but it's three minutes, not five. Given the composition of the audience today, I don't, I'm not here to create a problem for the board, but I do have something important I wanted to say about risk management. Specifically, the topic that I wanted to speak about was the section on page 11 regarding the Mental Health Act. And the gist of what I would be talking about was the fact that the police have been using a mental health act to silence complainants. And in fact have said to my face, if I don't stop complaining, I will be taken away under the Mental Health Act. Now, as you all know, my family is of mixed racial heritage. And I believe that we are being targeted by the police, that I am being defamed by the police, with stories that if I continue to come, if I continue to speak, if I continue to complain, I will, have no doubt in my mind, I will be taken away. So I'm going to leave it to the board. If I'm not, if it's decided that this is not a topic for today, given the audience that's present, I'm going to ask to speak at the very next meeting on this topic. And I'm going to tell you that one of the reasons I, I believe kind to ask you this is that after 19 years, I have obtained this from a court, finally with hard court proof from a court that police officers showed up at a legal proceeding 
to say that I am mentally ill and convinced others to say this. Here is my proof that I showed to a senior officer in this building a couple of weeks ago. I believe he's still in the audience. He read it, did nothing about it. I then contacted another office in this building, spoke with one of the assistants <coughs> to a member of this board who gave me the name of someone I was going to look into, the accusations that I have been making since 1982. Now, once I hand this out, I can't and I won't take it back. So once I hand it out, it does name officers that showed up to say this, one of whom is now a senior person in the police force. Do you want me to go ahead and hand it out? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can if you wish, yes. All right. The poor and the disenfranchised are being threatened with the Mental Health Act. Shame. Shame. And having nothing to do with your mental health. It's simply, you better keep quiet or we're going to take you away under the Mental Health Act. Shame. 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 We're going to get 30 seconds here. I can't do this in 30 seconds. Well, so I'm going to ask the audience then, to allow me to have my full five minutes. Uh, that's the not going to happen. Uh, so, Brenda, if you said you would be happy to come back next yes. uh, meeting, and we'd be glad to see you then. Thank you. May Thank I you. give everyone a copy? Yes. Yeah, every one of the board members, yes. I don't know. Do you want a copy, Mr. Pringle? I don't know. No, I do. Thank you. So Thank you, Brenda. And I'm going to keep you to promise that I will be able to finish with my other two minutes at the well, next meeting. Okay. I'm actually going to ask you if I can have a couple more than two. Okay. So that people have a chance. To Hopefully we won't have as busy a meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chair okay. Pringle. Um, uh, Colleagues, uh, any other uh, questions of uh, Peter? Uh, if not, uh, may I have a, uh, uh, a motion to receive the uh, uh, risk management report? Uh, Dr. Nuria, second. Ms. Mulder, all in favor? Any contrary? Inspector Callahan, thank you very much. Um, that uh, moves us on to item number 13 which is the uh, access to city services undocumented Torontonians. Um, and we have, uh, is it one deputation? Um, and that's Carl Gardner from No One Is Illegal. Uh, Carl, thank you. You've got three minutes. Yeah, push the red. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Carl. I'm with the group known as Legal Toronto. We work with non-status migrants in the city. I've been here a few times before, so you've probably <laughs> yes. recognized me by now. Um, I'm here today because the Canada Border Services Agency recently revealed that over the last two years, they received 7,497 calls from the Toronto Police asking about the immigration status of non-status uh, of immigration status of Torontonians. These were not calls due to warrants, outstanding immigration warrants, as Chief Saunders would tell you, but they were based purely on the sus officer's suspicion that an indiv individual would not does not have status. So the report you're receiving today from Chief Saunders, Saunders does nothing to change this alarming fact. In November 2015, I co-authored a report with the University of Ottawa professor detailing the high rate of immigration enforcement done by the Toronto Police. And City Council took this up and requested that the board review its practices. And so what you're looking at today is Chief Saunders, almost a year and a half later, his response to this. Um, and in this, he defends Toronto Police, the Toronto Police's right to do immigration enforcement work and only recommends one small change in the report that's before you today. The change is to not ask people who are uninvolved with an investigation for their immigration status. 
Now I say this is small because he says so himself in his report, stating that the service both historically and currently does not ask and uninvolve people for their immigration status. So all this is to say that the Chief's report in front of you today does not make Torontonians with precarious or no immigration status safer. It does not encourage them to trust the police and does not instill faith in immigrant communities that they can call the police in a time of need. This is because despite the Toronto Police's conditional don't ask policy and despite Toronto's sanctuary city policy, the police continue to perform thousands of status checks on Torontonians every year. In 2015, the Toronto Police made 4,957 calls to the CBSA for immigration purposes. While Chief Saunders' report states that police only enforce warrants issued by the CBSA, only 201 of these calls were warrant inquiries. That means that 4,316 of these calls, or 87%, were made um, based on what the CBSA has told us is called a status check. Are you raising your finger? One minute. I don't, one, one minute, minute left? left? Yeah. I don't think that was five minutes. No, it's three. It's three. I was told I got five minutes uh, on the phone for the... I was told I got five minutes when I registered to depute. Because we have 80 plus deputants, we cut it back at the beginning of the meeting. But keep going. Okay. I won't do I, do I get that 30 yep. seconds back? Yep. Okay. Totally. Um, the story is the same in 2016, where the Toronto Police made 3,721 calls and 85% of these were status checks. So I'd like Saunders to actually clear up this, this discrepancy for the board, because on the one hand, he claims that officers do not ask victims and witnesses of crime for their status, and, the, and he claims that Toronto Police only get involved when the CBSA has issued a warrant. However, on the other hand, the CBSA is telling us through freedom of information requests that over the last two years they've received almost 7,500 calls performing status checks, which are based on officer suspicion that an individual might not have status. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't tell somebody's immigration status just by a short interaction with them. So we know, we know what this is. This is fertile ground for racial profiling. This is racial profiling. And so in doing so, they're undermining Toronto Sanctuary City policy. They're putting the most vulnerable communities in our city at risk. The report today that you're receiving today does not address the thousands of times the Toronto Police are performing immigration enforcement work. And so uh, I would recommend that the board ask the chief to provide a full response as to why the Toronto Police are going out of their way to contact immigration enforcement any time an officer has a suspicion that they, may, that they can report an immigrant to the CBSA. And I want to know why Chief Saunders is defending their right to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of the uh, deputy? Yeah, uh, so the, the numbers that you quote, um, are you getting them, them from a place that is publicly available, the 4,000, the 7,500? Yeah, this is, this is public record. These are through freedom of information requests that we file with the CBSA. And they oh, tell okay. us directly how many times the Toronto police are calling them. So you got them via FOI. Yes. So, so have you posted them somewhere so that we can look at the documents? Well, well? I, I've given you guys multiple uh, copies of the report that I wrote in 2015 uh, already. Right. All of you guys have had one in your hands. And yeah. uh, we are right now, we have just arrived at new data. Um, and I don't yeah. know, I mean, I can keep doing all the work to give you guys more reports. I remember but, the 4,000 number, but, but this the 7,500 was new. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, I don't want to keep doing this work just so you guys can take it and forget about it in a year, right? So this is a real problem. That, and like, you know, don't take my word for it. This is the Canada Border Services Agency admitting that Toronto police officers are using purely suspicion about immigration status and making thousands of calls every year. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, but it was, it's not posted on your website. I, I remember when you came to us. That's why this report is here. But I, I don't now have that document in my hands. Yes. So I'm just wondering if it's posted somewhere. Not yet. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'll prepare a report for you. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll have questions of staff when we get to it. Thank you very much. Uh, are there no other questions, colleagues, of, of Carl? Okay. Thank I you would very really, much. I would really recommend the board make sure that Saunders has to answer to this. Well, we're now going to ask him some questions. Thank you. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, questions of, of the chief on his reports? Yes, there's only one deputant. Okay. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I was going to ask that question uh, about, because I remember the 4,000 uh, when this began, but now we even have a more up-to-date number. Um, I'm wondering if we have a problem of semantics. The, the issue of status check, I would have thought we covered in, in the motions that, that uh, 
that the city put forward, but maybe you were using the wrong language, and maybe you can clarify this for me. One of the motions that came, that was referred to us from, from the city's uh, committee was uh, council requests the, the TPSB request the chief to provide data on the number of times a person was investigated, comma, reported, or arrested on an offense related to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. I think they thought that the word investigated was going to lead to how many times do you investigate a person's status, a status check. Is that, is that not how that motion has been interpreted up until now? So perhaps, uh, perhaps I can answer the question. Um, we interpreted the motion from the city as an inquiry into the number of investigations. That's a more formalized term for us. So we were pursuing some line of inquiry based upon some act that has occurred. So that's the data that's available on page six of the report. Now, it, it may be that within that investigation, a number of separate inquiries are made, but the number of investigations we undertook is captured in the report. But as the board knows, we are making inquiries of the CBSA. We're not asking the person their status. So we may be investigating people we haven't had contact with as a result of a legitimate law enforcement inquiry or we're trying to determine uh, the person's location in, the, in uh, Canada as part of a pursuit of an investigation, for example, a missing person. So we're not asking the individual their status. We're making inquiries of CBSA, and there can be a whole host of law enforcement, lawful, proper reasons to do that. We'd be speculating without knowing the exact inquiries, but many of them are to determine the nature of the individual we've got a legitimate interest in. And we've cited some few examples of actual investigations we've undertaken, and that's what page six refers to. Yes, I saw, I saw the examples. But there, so there's a big discrepancy between 7,500, 7,000, whichever of the numbers we use. And the report we have today talks about 684 cases where, where an IRPA uh, offense is a significant component of an investigation. So if the others you're just checking because you're creating a profile on someone, uh, uh, is there a danger that that then flags for, for CBSA? Because if they turn around and inquire of you, uh, where is this person, um, you're, you're, it behooves you to, to report where that person is, does it not? Are we, are we in fact flagging investigative work for them? Well, I can't speak for CBSA. We have a legitimate reason to make an inquiry. CBSA has its own lawful mandate that may compel them to take certain actions or make inquiries. I, I can't speak for CBSA. Okay. And, I, and I wouldn't want the board to be left with the impression that as a result of our inquiries, whatever the number of thousands that's being referenced were somehow jeopardized or deported. It's not the that's not a conclusion that can be drawn from the nature of our, either the volume or the nature of our inquiries to CBSA. Okay. Um, I want to move on then to, to another piece of the report, um, uh, which starts to, to get into to our responsibility when, when, when CBSA um, makes a request. There isn't a lot of information in the report about when there's a, CBA, a CBSA request of us and it's to do with someone who's in school. But that was a, a significant component of the, the uh, discussion that took place at Council before this report was listed, and it's now, of course, part of the, the issue we're, we're dealing with in, in, in uh, item number 14. So what are the next steps? If CBSA is, is making an inquiry of us about knowing the whereabouts of someone, what, we're hearing anecdotally stories of, um, you know, upwards of 5,000 students have been marched out the door of a school and handed over to CBSA. What are the procedures if, if, uh, if there's an inquiry made of the TPS, do you know the whereabouts of, of this individual? And that's a person that we do know the whereabouts of because we know where they go to school. 
What are the protocols? Uh, do, do they, uh, do they uh, uh, match up with our protocols? Uh, when, when, when police are called to a school, uh, local police, municipal police, about, uh, about an incident involving a student, uh, their guardians must also be, be uh, informed. And so there, there's a strict protocol. Is that strictly observed when there's an IRPA component as well? So let me try and answer it. We have memorandums of understanding with the schools about how Toronto Police will take action in the schools. Right. And it's subject to right. very specific conditions exactly. and understandings signed by the schools and signed by Toronto Police. Yep. That would cover any type of action, including CBSA inquiries. So the, the, um, the schools would be fully informed of the nature of the police inquiry or action on the schools. And that might include anything we might do as a result of a CBSA um, action or CBSA inquiry. But I'd, I'd like to reinforce a point made in the board report. Um, the service only executes warrants under right. the CBSA if the service is made aware that somebody they're having contact with is wanted by the government of Canada for having violated the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. That's the only time the police will take action. Now, right. The police might have information about the whereabouts of an individual that CBSA is looking for, and we're duty-bound, as explained in the report, to share that information because CBSA has a lawful mandate to carry out their activities, and in the law enforcement, security, and enforcement community were duty-bound to share information and mutually support the lawful mandates and directions of other enforcement and security agencies. We couldn't deny that information. But that does not mean, I want to emphasize, that that does not mean that it's instigated by Toronto Police. It's in response to the CBSA. No, uh, it, it may be not instigated by, but do we have the right to say we have, you know, if, if this, this uh, uh, comes to, uh, to light while a student is in school, even though we've been asked to provide information or, or whatever, help them uh, uh, execute a warrant, are we still allowed to invoke the protocol that we have about how that takes place in a school? Excellent question. Yes, we are. Okay. Our protocols with the school dictate our action in those schools. I just have one more. Uh, and I just have one more. There's a lo long explanation in the report about the uninvolved, uh, uh, describing what uninvolved is with, with respect to uh, uh, investigations and uh, recommending that they haven't till now been articulated in our, our policy and our training about uh, what to do with regards to, to uh, immigration status and they're suggesting adding it. Is, does, is the report indicating to us that up until now, the uninvolved have been vulnerable? Is, is that what this report is telling us? No, the report's indicating that historically we have not asked uninvolved people, but it hasn't been stated publicly to provide that reassurance that we will not ask. So our board policy and our procedures that derive from it have identified certain individuals who will not be asked in the first instance unless there's bona fide reasons to do so. We've Does been that mean silent it hasn't been part of the training? Excuse me? Would that mean it hasn't been part of the training? It, or it, it hasn't been our practice. We simply have, okay. not, have not been doing it. What we're suggesting is to make it abundantly clear to our community, we actually codify it in the policy, and that would be codifying a practice that we've been following for, for decades. We have not asked uninvolved people their status no intention to do so unless there's a bona fide reason but by putting it into the policy we can provide transparency to our community that those who are bystanders or those who might be providing information they want to not become involved and it's perfectly acceptable that they not be involved they would not be asked their immigration status okay mayor tory i just had two uh, deputy chief first um, there's the sort of, I'll call it the prohibition or the policy against asking people their immigration status in many circumstances. What, is it possible, given what we've heard today, that somebody could be standing beside a police officer and the police officer would not ask uh, the status, but they could at the very same moment or while they go back in the car uh, call or be in touch with the border 
uh, security people to make the check. So is, is that would that be the view of an officer with regard to what the policy says and perhaps doesn't say? So in other words, you wouldn't ask the person if you were following policy, but it would be okay while the person's still standing right beside your car to be calling the. Would that be the the interpretation people would place police officers on the policy? So a, a police officer may have very good reasons to inquire to the CBSA. That could be the result of information the police officer receives um, kind of um, obliquely or tangentially, and the officer may feel it's appropriate and important to pursue and, and do a check without speaking to the subject of the check. Um, there are a number of situations where that might happen. There may be, for example, a neighbor dispute where there's a, an assault taking place, and one of the people involved indicates they have a suspicion that the other person is undocumented and has some issue with Canada border. The police officer is duty bound to inquire, not of the person, but to check and see if that's the case. It might be relevant for the investigation and justify an inquiry of CBSA. And my second question was, if one of those inquiries was to be made. Um, we've heard that there were 7,000 some odd of them. I'm assuming if, we're, if there's a record at the other end, the receiving end of those calls, we would have a record of those calls. And I just wonder if we do, whether we could start to include that uh, in the reporting here and perhaps even more relevant, break down those calls by, you know, sort of why they were made. Because there may be a good and valid reason. I don't really know but uh, enough about this. but. There may be a good and valid reason, but if the 7,000 was broken into categories, such as we saw in some of the information earlier on today, where we saw things you know, broken down quite in a quite a granular manner, is that, is that a possible thing for us to report on our version of the 7,000 calls and why they, you know, why they were made? Because I assume there must be a notation as to why somebody picked up the phone or however they do it to be in touch with CBSA. That's something we'd have to consider. We don't have a system-wide way of collecting that information. These are individual phone calls many occasions that an officer would undertake, we would have to look at a more system way, systematized way of collecting that type of information. But we'd take a look at it. I appreciate the Mayor's question. It's along the lines of what I was thinking about in terms of how do we know other than what CBSA might tell us uh, was the source at this end. So I think that question merits you agreeing to report back to us on what you can identify. I appreciate you have 7,000 officers, maybe all 7,000 or members called CBSA on one day and there's your 7,000 number, but I'm sure at the CBSA end, they know why the call was made. So perhaps the first stop is to find out from them and maybe that's some of the information that's in Mr. Gardner's report, I don't know. But I would like to know what we can put in place because 7,000 is a very high number and we should understand why those calls are being made and I'm sure they could be categorized into categories that would help us understand the necessity for those calls. Thank you. Chief Saunders. Well, I certainly want to get this right, and I know that that's what the issue is here. Um, the fact that it just went from 4,500 to 7,000 causes me to wonder a few things, and I think the only way to get this right is to work with the CBSA and see what their measuring mechanisms are, and then to drill down further to see if we can find reason for to articulate the numbers of. Um, I find it hard to comprehend that the men and women of Toronto Police Service are running around and overtly asking status. Um, I don't see that. It's not in our training, um, whether it be our general constable training, whether in our specialized training, which uh, enhances that that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we want people not to feel victimized. We want people to report crimes. And if they're going to hesitate to report crimes because of that as an issue, then we know we're not doing our job right. So um, whatever the mistranslation is, is something that I would like to get to the bottom of. I'm going to need some time to do this because when I'm working with other agencies, um, I, I think I spoke with Councillor Carroll earlier, and I think that there, there are, we're missing the mark because I think the proper way of going about it is dealing with IRPA as well as CBSA, as well as us in the room collectively, and then coming out with an answer that fits to answer everything so that it enhances the transparency. Uh, so, Councillor Carroll, do you want to make a motion or? Well. <laughs> I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the motion should be. I, you know, I would be happy if just as a first step that what the chief reported back on, and I know I told, whoops, there's way too many mics on. Jimi Hendrix. 
um, uh, if we could, if we could uh, just have the Toronto Police Chief uh, report back on reconciling the statistics we're receiving from CBSA on Toronto Police inquiries to what he he uh, knows to be proper police practice, and uh, and take it from there. I think I think it, we're we're at the point where we've hit a wall on asking to break it down. I I actually want to go back to the big number now and say, if only if there are only 684 investigations where an IRPA uh, might be a, um, infraction might be a major component of a case. Then why are we making 7,500 inquiries? So it's I think it's a very simple motion and. Uh, um, I'm satisfied that the that the that the the chief of police is now sufficiently curious. I'm not sure I even need to put a timeline on it. I, I think we want the chief of police to report back on reconciling the the CBSA statistics on Toronto Police Service annual inquiries uh, of immigration status with our routine orders. Saunders, how long do you think uh, you'll need to come back? Um, can you give me a precursor opportunity? Because what I want to do is personally speak with RPA. I want to personally speak with CBSA, explain what the situation is so that we have an understanding of what their databases are, what their measuring mechanisms are, what they're capable of yeah. doing, what timelines they can do it, and we can all get together and finish this once and for all because the fact that uh, people are thinking that 5,000 students are being marched out due to immigration because we're involved is a problem. So, do so you want, you can months. you come back? Uh, can you come back next month then and just update us on on how long it will take? Yeah, I can precursor that and come back with a definitive answer with a timeline and of what it will look like. Okay, so the motion, okay. Councillor Carroll, you're putting forward that Chief Saunders come back uh, next My month. My motion is what he said. <laughs> uh, no, the new report back in August on on how to proceed in reconciling the CBSA. And the timeline you can do it in. Yes. Yes. Maybe um, I can wordsmith it with Deirdre uh, yeah. before the before we're out of here, so it's yeah, properly well, let's minuted. Let's get on with the next uh, because people are. But I think the board knows the intent. Um, uh, may I have a seconder for that, uh, uh, Councillor Lee? All in favor? Any contrary? And it will be wordsmithed by the. Um, and and we'll have to then on the two reports uh, motion to approve. Uh, Councillor Lee, Councillor Carroll, all in favor? Any contrary? Thank you. Um, and thank you, Carl, um, if you're still here. Uh, that brings us to the final item, which is everybody's interest is the holdover from the last uh, meeting, and it's the review of the school resource officer program. Uh, and Mr. Jeffers, it was your uh, motion that we uh, uh, deferred. Uh, there are no questions. Thank you, though. There is no question. Thank you very much. We don't take questions from the floor. Thank you. We will get, I understand, and we will hear you all. We're prepared, we're, we're prepared to stay all night to listen to everybody. Uh, Mr. Jeffers. We have uh, a large crowd, and uh, some of the police officers are interested too. So thank you very much. We will get that message. We, uh, and and we will get they will get a chance to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the community can have a voice, and we're happy to listen to everybody, but I'd like to get on with it, if we may, please. Uh, uh, come on, guys. We, we, I don't think, Mr. Coles, we've ever had this large a crowd before. We're, and we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Thank you. It's not being militarized. I've merely asked the guys at the front to keep people. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, Chief Saunders, have you got... Um, Anyone that wants to leave or go can do so freely. There's no problem. There are a lot of people here that want to put their piece. Right now I'm hearing five people making a lot of noise and there are a couple of hundred people in here. So if we could get on with the process, we'd appreciate it. So thank you very much. We, Desmond, we have made every opportunity for them to participate. We do not have room for... Uh, fine. Well, I'm sorry you don't. It's not a room full of police officers. I see far more a community here than I see anywhere close to police officers. Uh, thank you very much. We're just going to proceed with the meeting, if we may. Um, Mr. Jeffers, this was your motion. Could we please have quiet? I've heard you. Thank you very much. We don't agree. We need to get on with this. Thank you very much. Mr. Jeffers. Yes. Can I have quiet for a minute, please? Uh, we're going to try and get on with this. I recognize that neither side is entirely happy. We have got, we will, we will sit here until it takes to hear every single deputy. I would uh, appreciate the fact if we could just get on. I've heard your concerns. I'm sorry uh, we can't accommodate everybody. We're certainly trying to, but I think we need to get on with it uh, and get on with the process. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Desmond, please. Sid, uh, I, I I understand, but we have a, a rules procedure. It's straightforward. Uh, we have a, a 80 plus deputants we want to hear from, and I think we just need to get on with it. Could we go, please? With, uh, Mr. Chair, on a the point of order, I feel certain that if we start going through the deputant list, deputants currently occupying seats will vacate those seats and deputants outside will then take the empty seats. Thank you. And everyone will spend Thank some you. time in the room. Thank you. If we could just get on with it. There are a number of people, quite a number of people in the service that are interested in these discussions as well. So I, I'm sorry. I, I am trying to. You're just not agreeing with how I'm addressing it. I'm sorry, but we need to get on with this. Councillor Carroll has made an excellent suggestion that as people make their depositions, they will leave and it will allow more and more people to come in. And I have committed that we will go through and hear from everybody. So, colleagues, I think we just need to get on with it. Mr. Jeffrey. Is there, on a point of order, is there yes, a, a capacity to this um, room here? What is the capacity? Well, first, first of all, uh, there, are, there are a few more seats over here. If there's some few more people we can let in, that's great, but, okay. So, I, uh, let's get on with the process. Is there any? Okay. Then please sit down over here and that will create some more space. Well, if you sit down here when the seats, we can get some more people in. Otherwise, let's get on with it. Uh, okay. 
Ken, um, you wanted to make a statement. Let's get on with it. Okay. Um, um, May we have quiet, please, to listen to Mr. Jeffers. Well, um, since the last meeting, um, I have had a number of um, concerns raised by the public and, and, and a number of unanswered questions. I'd uh, just like to pre, pre, you know, give a context for my amendment of, of the motion that I made in the last meeting. Um, and I also want to say this, that my emphasis right now is on policing and not the police per se. And there are others who will speak to that who are more, um, you know, who, who, who uh, encounter that every day and they can give their account of that. I want to, and so I just want to provide this context. Um, what was amazing to me since we last met, not amazing so much, but it was a, a bit surprising, is that a number of people 10 years ago when SROs were in schools, uh, when the first, Bill Blair first made, first made that, um, uh, decision with in conjunction with the board. There are a number of people who think this is a normal or a normalized situation where you have police officers in schools that happens to have a lot of um, black people, a lot of poor people living in marginalized areas. And that became almost normal. That, very, that is very concerning to me. And when I reviewed the previous reports, it was obvious that the primary purpose of, of uh, police in school was to quote unquote, prevent crime after the Jordan Manor's tragedy. And in my view, that, I mean, I can understand where people would feel unsafe, but that was a temporary measure as far as I, as, as I can determine. Um, now, the, some of the other unanswered questions for me are the cost of the SROs in schools. What does it cost the public? Um, what is the basis or criteria for signing um, officers to schools? Because there's a profiling that goes with the, with the location of officers in schools. And that, that, and, and, you know, that to me is very, very concerning. Um, what is the basis of the criteria for assigning those officers? What do officers do all day in schools? And what, is their, what are their qualifications? Uh, we talk about community engagement and we talk about uh, prevent, um, and, and, and we talk about engagement and we talk about preventing violence occurring in the schools. So, what is the role of teachers in maintaining discipline? Do they, um, at a time when there is a, a, a situation, do they call the, ask the police who are in the schools to solve it? I don't know. Um, what, you know, I asked the chief at uh, the last meeting, what was the, the response, average response time for if there was an altercation in school? I understand it's five minutes or less, which th says to me that, you know, this, the, the rationale for keeping police in the schools um, to prevent uh, violence and what have you is, 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 is not necessarily something that I would accept. Um, the question of gathering information uh, to prevent crime, how is that done in the schools? One young person told me last week that uh, there are some people in his school who he felt will, will um, cooperate with the police and giving information and, and so it led to a, a, a serious accusation, I, and I'm very concerned about that. Um, so I want to say that 40 years ago, I happened to be involved with then Chief Jack Ackroyd to talk about police in the schools. 40 years later, we're talking about this again. And what we, the compromise we came to, we said, look, we don't want police to be located in the schools. First of all, they must be in plain clothes. They must work with us as community people in, in, in resolving situations. And so that's when we started, and it was called a community service officer program. It worked quite well up until this day. We had a number of young people in the first youth advisory committee based on looking at the community services officer and evaluating them on an, as one of the, the, the duties of the, or responsibilities of the youth who were, we met regularly at the police headquarters. So um, the, the question here is, um, why are we there on an ongoing basis? I've happened to, I happen to know and, and, uh, a little bit about Chicago, and I saw 
in the south side of Chicago, what happens when um, there's a, there are many uniformed police in schools? And without having to say that, you know, it's very easy to say, let us talk about um, the behavior of police and, and distract it from the real, for me, one of the primary objectives of the, you know, that I um, see here, and that is to ensure that our students are not profiled, they are not, uh, neighborhoods are not profiled to the point where, um, as one young person said to me as well, he said, we're from the bad school, man. They have to bring the, the cops here to deal with us. So it's a prescribed role for young people, and some of them do act, act it out. Um, so this normalization is not acceptable because the, the police responsibility with all the training and all the money that we as taxpayers, of course, pay, I mean, I don't know what, you know, if a police officer is trained and he wants, he or she wants to be in a school all day, I mean, like, it doesn't add up to me. Um, and so it goes on and on, right? The stigma of being in a school where there are uniformed police officers with, with uh, as we know. Now, I believe that we have a teaching and learning opportunity here, right? where a number of people have said they have not been consulted, they have not had an opportunity to give their points of view, that when decisions are made by, by the board and, and the police, they are not involved. I think we have a responsibility as representing communities to ensure that, 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 that everybody has a say in this matter, not those who some people feel are selected to do this, to make a point. Um, and, you know, in talking to some of the people who I worked with, as I said, 40 years ago, is that it's not a question of living in the past, but the past lives in all of us. The past lives in me because, as I said, when I, when I saw that and I heard the anger and the passion with which, and people said, well, why is, is it always us? We have to consider that. Um, we, we, when we look around and we say the police, service, poli the police services, uh, in order to do their, their jobs effectively, they need support. Mental health, there is support. Um, and other areas we can go into, right? They get official support. In the community right now, I challenge any one level of government to, to let us know who will be the liaison, as I mentioned, we did as, as community people with the police now. There isn't one African-Canadian organization that's getting infrastructure funding, right? And yet, there's an expectation that the community is going to be involved in this solution on volunteerism, people who are uh, underpaid, and we have a responsibility to, to advocate and to ensure that, that um, groups are properly resourced so that we can work, to this in a, in a, work on this in a holistic manner. This is a teaching and learning opportunity. The, the young person in Forest Hill who doesn't have police in the schools doesn't mean that, that there's no crime in there. You know, it doesn't mean that, that there are no drugs there, okay? And I, I can give details about that, but I won't do that right now. So when a young person or, or passes by a school and see the, the police officer's car there every day, what is the image we're putting out there, you know? You know, and, and, and that is not, in my view, the kind of, of city that we, we want to, 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 to create. And, um, you know, I will say that we shouldn't have to have, when we want change in this community, always have to protest. People, you know, um, come out and, you know, and, and, you know, like Black Lives Matter, they spend all the two weeks in front of the police. I mean, that, that to me is, is, very, is very demeaning, right? And, and we shouldn't have to do that. So we have an opportunity, a learning opportunity and a teaching opportunity. Because the very kids that I talk about in Forest Hill, I don't know what they have, they, maybe they have never spoken to somebody who lives in public housing. I don't know. This is a learning opportunity for them to have dialogue, and it has to be pro properly facilitated so that we can hear the views of the young people, not only the officials of the board, you know, and us. 
They have to, the young people have to have their say, and they have to have it now, right? And, and in closing, I, uh, with, with you know, my short preamble. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty short. <laughs> I would say this, that um, we have to expand this consultation because all of these people here want to see, you know? And I don't think it should be a review, with all due respect, um, Mr. Mayor, I don't think it just should be a review, you know? We have to hear um, in an in-depth and, and get into that conversation and hear from everybody. Black Lives Matter, hear from the police, hear from the young people who live in areas where there are no police officers in the school. And so we get into that dialogue and discussion, not them on us, okay? So that's a, a, a preamble a, a, to my... A new resolution then? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you're asking for my resolution? Yes. We're talking about your resolution. You said it's a preamble. I just yeah. wondered okay, if you were going to make a resolution. I, I'm making an amendment. I'm saying that um, I will ask the board to consider this, that supplementary to the motion moved by the mayor to respect a review of the SRO program, the board appoint a steering committee comprised of two board members and the chief of police to establish terms of reference and governing principles and to oversee and participate in the development of the report on the SRO program requested by the board at its last meeting. That as part of its mandate, the, and following the board's receipt of the interim report in August meeting, this steering committee expands its membership to include participants who reflect a diversity of views on the SRO program, including but not limited to youth, educators, school boards, parents, school administration, youth advocacy, youth advocacy organization, and other community representatives. That the board defer consideration of my motion with respect to suspending the program until all of these people are consulted. Thank you. Until December the 31st. This year. My microphone. Ken, thank you. Um, um, colleagues, uh, comments, additions, other thoughts? We'll, 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 we'll come to that in a minute. We'll come to that in a minute. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Tory, I just had a question of you, Mr. Chair, on procedure. Yep. Uh, I'm quite happy to speak to this now, and supportively of it, but are you suggesting we should have our comments on this now before we hear from the deputants, or, because uh, uh, I'm quite, uh, just in your, I'm seeking yep. your guidance. No, I'm, I'm just, if you can put a, a revised motion on the table, I wonder if anybody has any comments on it, because we do want to hear from the deputants, yes. Yeah, uh, could, could, we, could we hear from the deputants? Yes. Yes, we can hear from the deputants, but with this, okay. with this uh, um, context, so in this we, context. So we will work our way through this. So this is the revised motion that Mr. Jeffries is putting on the table. Consideration, uh, Mr. Chair. For, for consideration, but we'll hear from the deputants. I would say that... In answer to the uh, yell over here, yes, there are uh, a bunch of comments on this now, but Ken, you're envisaging something more than just deputations. We're going to have comments from uh, all sides of the question. Um, so there will be other opportunities for people to speak to this, obviously, if we pass this motion as Mr. Jeffers has put forward. In the meantime, there are how many deputations? There are 74 deputations. And we'll get on with it. And I remind people it's three minutes. And, and to the degree, Darla, to the degree, would you make sure that we are ferrying people in and out as we have room? Thank you. Um, I'm, we're going to get started. Thank you. Uh, so we have colleagues outside. We have colleagues outside who will call the names. The first uh, deputant is... David Bradley. David Bradley, please, is the first deputy. David, thank you. 
because there's only so much space. We will do that. We will do that. David, you have three minutes, uh, starting right now. Instead of prioritizing the community. Good afternoon. My name is David Bradley, and I have worked in Toronto schools since 1991 as a hall monitor. Could we have order, please? Uh, and Too close? David, uh, hang on a second. Hmm? I'm sorry, Councillor Carroll, but why do there have to be police in the school when you outside? We ask you to stand up for us. Uh, Desmond, we have got uh, people outside. We will get as many people in as we can, and we will, you know, as soon as more space become available, we'll do it. But I'm not throwing some out to communicate with others. I, I, th there are police that are interested in this discussion, too, yes. So that's why they're here. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get on it. If we don't, I will clean up the room, period. So let's, let's get on. David, I apologize. The floor, the floor is yours. That's what he's trying to do. You are delaying the people who need to help us. They don't want to get back to school, and you're stopping them from getting on here and getting their pressure. David, could we calm down, please, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, David, uh, Mr. Gardner, please, uh, would everybody please calm down? I don't want to lower, I don't want to move everybody outside, but we need to get on with it. Let's get on, let's go. David, over to you, and we'll start your three minutes now. As I was saying, my name is David Bradley, and I have worked in Toronto schools since 1991 as a hall monitor. Until the tragic shooting about 10 years ago, we did not have a police officer assigned full-time in the schools. From 1991 to 2003, I was working at Lawrence Park Collegiate, but through the Community Response Unit and Street Crime Unit, we did have officers that would wander through from time to time or ride by in bicycles or just drive along Chatsworth Drive to fly the colors. Once, a caper about a stolen car was solved because the police were involved, but after two Community Response Unit officers popped in for a visit, many students came to me asking if they were there about the stolen car. I knew nothing of what they were talking about, but after enough concerned scholars had approached me, I was able to piece it together, and indeed, there were students making use of a stolen vehicle, and thankfully, they were relieved of their access to this automobile very promptly before anybody was hurt, killed, or the car damaged. Over the years, I have cultiva I cultivated relationships with both 32 and 53 divisions as we were on their border, and there were times when incidents would occur on both the north and south side of Lawrence Avenue. And thus, it was good to be a known quantity if there was an issue worthy of reporting and or following up on at both stations. One lady officer from 53 volunteered her time and skill to help coach the girls' hockey team, which was very much appreciated. I started in 2003 at Lawrence, sorry, Earl Haig Secondary School, and our relationship with the boys in blue continued much the same until the SRO program was launched and we were assigned a school resource officer. He was there most days, and little by little, he got to know people, they got to know him and his mighty laugh, and when invited by teachers, he visited some classes to talk about online safety as well as other helpful subjects. And he was soon viewed by most as another caring adult in the building, sometimes in uniform, sometimes not, and he was affectionately known as Sammy because that was his name. Then came Hugo, and while he was in the same role, he was unique and different. Not better, not worse, just different. Once again, in short order, Hugo became part of the fabric of the school, and in fact, there was one particular student who he was able to reach in a way that nobody else could, despite many people desperately trying, and Hugo's over there. He's in the, he's in the, um, where are you, Hugo? That's Hugo. A great man. Since Hugo is now shared, a shared entity between three schools, we have only had a part-time presence, which I find is okay, but not nearly as effective as when somebody is there throughout the day. At the moment, I hardly know any of the officers from 32 Division, as we have not had nearly as many incidents 
when they need to be summoned. Some people may not get this, but having the presence very often helps ensure we will not need the police. Prevention is much better than ever having to arrest a 30 student. 30 seconds, David. And our SRO was, was very often part of the prevention, mediation, and conflict resolution, and less often, and very rarely, were students arrested, typically by other officers, not our school cop. Talk about popular at one school, I heard the SRO was so beloved that each year the drama department would include her in a cameo. Last thing, I'll quickly, I, I hope that the last thought I'd like to be with somebody who has spent many years under both systems is to remember that regardless of the daily presence of a cop or not, that sometimes, sadly, poor choices will lead to bad things happening and on occasion charges being laid. But whenever you decide, please do not do it because of a few loud voices pointed out pointing out very isolated incidents over, let overshadow all the prevented troubles and positive relationships built because indeed the quiet voice of reason and compromise, while not as loud, is just as valid and while it might not ring in your ears or make headlines, it should be given as, just as much consideration. We do not need a knee-jerk reaction. We need calm, sober David, thought. thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, but I have to. Uh, we've got right. a huge list here. I'll, I'll leave, I apologize, I'll but thank I'll you. I'll leave this for, for whoever. We appreciate it. And if anybody else, uh, uh, the written is always appreciated, so thank you. Second deputant is Barbara Spiropoulos. Oh, well, that's fast. Well, well done. Office, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. So You've got coincidentally, three minutes, in 2008, seconds. we started a restorative justice program in our division. Um, and as the two programs evolved simultaneously, it became very, very clear the number of problems that we had in the school. Um, our kids, folks, have challenges that we did not have. Um, many challenges arising from the use of cell phones, social media that is causing all kinds of problems in the kids because they don't have the maturity to handle this. Having the SRO present in the school has meant that we can get in and nip things in the bud, teach them how to solve their, their differences in a peaceful manner, um, attend to the more difficult problems uh, together with the parents, the police, the school, and the community acting as one cohesive, very strong team. The SRO's role in this is absolutely critical. That's the person who's spotting things. That's the person who comes in with a different perspective from the teachers. Teachers have to deal with the kids all day. I mean, seriously, they're only human. Having an SRO in there is the difference between night and day. We've got kids in there who, honestly, they're broken. They make you cry with the problems that they have to deal with. The SRO is the guy in there who's looking for the resources, summoning people in the community, desperately looking for, for other people who can help out. Because we need, we need to, exactly, we need to fix the kids. Please have, have a little bit of respect, please. Have a... I never interrupted you. Okay, then please give me, please give me the respect to finish my work. So, what we've got? Oh, geez, yeah, uh, yeah, we want to protect the kids, so that's offensive. Uh, Barbara, one more interruption. Listen, uh, this is uh, we have to have respect for everybody, and we will hear everybody. If we were interrupted again, I will clear the room. There are rules. Uh, we've been very tolerant. Abide by the rules. Barbara, over to you. Thank you. If we've, got, if we've got kids who are engaging in destructive behavior, those are the kids that we desperately need to help because we need to get them to a point where they can enjoy their life, all right? Um, the way forward, your action plan, it's all about proactive community-based policing. And that's what the SRO pro program is all about. And honest to God, I do not understand the negativity, the us versus them things that I'm hearing, the job, we've got the same goals, and the job is so huge. I don't understand why not everybody is working together to get this job done. It's immense. We cannot do it bit by bit, and we can't do it by infighting. And now I'll give my space to someone else. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Alan, Alan Burke. Alan Burke. Chair Pringle, can you please let people inside this room who are outside of it? Yeah. Uh, Dada, would are you, you join us here? Sure. Are our very legitimate requests? Uh, I am. I see I've, how I've, upset you're getting, Mr. Lee, 
but we are more upset at the fact that people spent hours, also, two hours before this item even started waiting De patiently. Desmond, you've made, made your point. I will ask you to leave you if don't you don't. Get my point because I, you sorry, I do. I'm not doing what you do. Is this what you feel is fair for people who came here to be heard there, Tori? Be quiet for a minute, Desmond. Uh, let me just say. We will, uh, though, to the degree we have spaces, would we ask the people there to sit down, Why and that will make, we're not going to let everybody in, the room is not big enough. To the degree we have There's seats and available. There's more police to keep coming into the room, though. Also, I have to no, it's not. Real. Yeah, sorry. Okay, then you can stand. Desmond, uh, we will continue on this basis. I've asked uh, Sergeant Tan Hill to. I've asked Sergeant Tan Hill to make sure people. No, we're, we're going forward. Sorry. That is not an Alan, unreasonable request, Mr. Pringle. I'm sorry, Desmond. I hear you. I don't agree. I do not agree. Thank you for your input. you guys organize people. Chair. Could we have quiet? Would we listen? And they are left outside. Chief Saunders. Um, Uniformed officers sat here and we've kept got, uh, young people, and I'm cool with that, as long as it doesn't mean that other people have to wait outside. We've got a lot of people here that have taken their time to be here, that are abiding by the compliance system of this governance process. I do not feel that it is fair, or they're given a fair opportunity to be uninterrupted those that do not comply with that are not going to be welcome here, should not be welcome, this because this is, a, this, this is a governance building. process that should be respected. Building. And the other aspect is I, my it's fear is business. that some of these people will feel intimidated by this, and I don't want that type of environment to be here. I agree. So, so we will continue on. Uh, quiet, please. Alan, you have the floor. Okay, good. We good. need you to hear our voice, Chair Pringle. We're not going to allow the people who are here to talk to you to stay outside. It's not for you to say what you allow and won't allow, Desmond. Who is it for? It is for this board to say, and we are making a space available. So we're not clearing the room. Alan, please go ahead. Okay. Not militarizing. Yeah, I cannot hear the deputy. All right, because of all this noise. Listen, listen, listen. This is very well orchestrated. Let them in. 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 Five minute break, and uh, the board will reconvene. Alan, I'm sorry for the interruption. We'll come back in five minutes.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please find your uh, seats and uh, 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 Norm Gardner, if you could uh, close off your interview, please. Um, thank you very much. Media, if you could please get uh, in the, the, the media area, I would appreciate it. Alan, I apologize. Uh, it's now the floor is yours. You have three minutes. Push the button. Oh. There you go. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor Torrey, Chief Sanders, and the rest of the members of the Toronto Police Services Board. My name is Alan Burke. I'm president of the East Beach Community Association, which is in the, operates in the extreme southwest corner of 41 Division. For those who don't know where that is, that's on Kingston Road. My boundary is the east side of Victoria Park, the, the Toronto Hunt Golf Course, for, down to the lake. But my boundary down on Queen Street is the east side of Nursewood Road. So as soon as you step on the grounds of R.C. Harris Water Treatment Plant, you are on the boundary of the East Beach Community Association. It's not on the beach like everyone in the beach thinks. Anyway, um, I, have been, I have been the president of the association for about 20 years when I incorporated as one of the founding directors, and I've been involved with the organization for 25 years. I felt it was important for me to come out today to speak on this issue because it's important to my residents, and I think it's an important citywide issue. Just for the record, I wasn't requested by, by anybody in the police service to come out here. That was a decision I made based on the coverage I saw on the Toronto Star and what I understood of what's going on here today. Now, as part of preparing for my presentation today, I went to a few staff sergeants and said, I want some good news stories from some of our SROs who are deployed. I spoke to PC Alfonso Carter, who's an SRO working out of 41 Division, who was assigned to Cardinal Newman High School, which is a Catholic high school near, I believe it's Brimley and Kingston Road, if memory serves me right. And the letter that I just distributed to the board is a letter that was sent to me by PC Carter, which he received from a student talking about her experience, or his or her experience, I forget now if it's a, if it's a, a girl or a boy, in dealing with, with uh, PC Carter from grade nine to grade 12. Now, one of the things this school does as a way of trying to orient the students, the students in grade nine go on a summer or a camp experience. So you'll see references to some camps, and, and PC Carter, goes to those camps as a way to bond the students and then introduce them. Now, I'm going to be brief because I don't have time to go over everything I'd like to say, but I'm going to... Okay. So finally, I would like to say I heavily support the program, and I think, one, before the board decides to scrap it, let the Ryerson study go ahead. I would also challenge the board members in September to go out and work and see what those SROs do in our schools. And I would make a few recommendations about how to improve the program. One, I think we should look at the idea of in future that, that the SROs not worry about immigration status of students and so be directed to not worry about that and not deal with CBSA in relation to students and their immigration status. I would also say that you should have mandatory meetings between the supervisor of the SRO and the school community probably four times a year that they would meet with the principal all right, and finally, to sum up, I would say that the training and the selection of those officers would be important, and I would welcome any questions from the board. Just one, and I'm not going to do this 79 times, but I just want to be clear. So, Mr. Burke, you have a, a very good experience. You're for this, but I just want to be clear. You have no problem with the Ryerson study going ahead. You, you do want us to evaluate and find best practice and make sure that's consistently what's happening. I think it's important for the Ryerson study to go ahead, and I would also say in the election of 2010, I ran for school trustee and got 5,140 votes. As part of that process, I went and spoke to principals in East York in the challenging schools, so I speak to this from also having understanding of the school board issues and the limitation of the school board budget and the fact that you and I know if we pull 37 SROs, the school board doesn't have the money to put back in youth workers and social workers to fill the gap. So that's another reason why I support this program. Thank you very much. Okay. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, Mackenzie uh, Kinmud. Uh, uh, would someone ask Mackenzie uh, if she's out there? She left? Okay, thank you. Uh, John Sewell. 
And John Sue, we have a written told us. So are, are you are you speaking on behalf of um, John Sewell? No, this is McKenzie. Ah, McKenzie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. They've been invited in, I'm told. So we've got a lot of depositions. We're going forward. Uh, so your name is, please. You're sitting in. We are going to let people come in. Your name? I don't mind waiting, and I don't mind waiting. Uh, I'm sorry. We have 79 depositions. Okay. We, we don't I, want to I be here till midnight. So please, uh, you've got three minutes. I also want Thank to you. say that I also want to say that I am reading on behalf of of Mackenzie, but I also have my own deputation a little bit later. Okay. Am I able to do both? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is on behalf of uh, Mackenzie Kinmund. Uh, what's your name, please? If, if, my name is Lindsay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, Lindsay, please go ahead. I agree with him, though. <laughs> um, I want. Desmond, sit down. Please, Lindsay, go ahead. Lindsay, please go ahead. Um, okay, this is an experience of somebody with the SRO program, um, Mackenzie's experience. Uh, she said that uh, this student was working hard to get his life back on track. He wanted to go back to school. On the day that he went to register, he approached the door of the school and the first person he saw when he entered was the SRO, whom he knew from the neighborhood. The youth felt deeply uncomfortable and fearful. The SRO made what the youth took to be judgment, a judgmental remark, and the youth turned right around and left the school. He did not register and thus did not return to school. I know this is one story and it is anecdotal, and that there are many stories of people who are happy with the SRO program, but this is an important story. This is a story about how youth who are already marginalized and face systemic barriers interact with the school system, how we support them to feel safe and welcomed in educational settings. I have worked with other youth who talk about their experience of feeling unwelcome in the school system, not just for the SRO program, but for the way that systemic racism plays out in the school system. In comments from teachers, from actions of principals, from the response of social, wor social workers and guidance counselors. So the problem is not with the SRO program alone. However, the SRO program is an important manifestation of a misguided approach to improving safety in our schools. This program has to end because it is the wrong solution to the problems the school system is facing. I recently came across a document online on the Ontario Association of Police Chiefs website. It is a completed nomination form for an award of excellence. The officer nominated is a school resource officer. The person who nominated her, who is a staff sergeant, outlines how this SRO had a positive and profound impact on the students, staff, and surrounding community. He describes that she did this by employing a proactive, she had this in quotes, proactive restorative practice approach, which included approaching the parents of youth who had been identified as gang involved, as well as involving staff and community youth One justice minute. programs. Thank you. To, create a team approach to provide an intensive counseling and training program for the youth. In addition, the youth received mentoring and the SRO had an open door policy where they could get support through difficult situations. If this is the image of good police work, then great. I suggest we retain the entire police force to do community policing in a way that helps people have real choices, that empowers rather than criminalizes and treats people as needing support and mentoring rather than a jail sentence. 
but we don't need armed, uniformed officers doing this work in our schools. We need community leaders doing this work. We need school staff and support staff who are properly trained in anti-racism, community accountability, and restorative justice to do this work. The SRO program sends the wrong message about what schools need to be safe for everyone. Thank you and so it should much. end. Thank you. Uh, John Sewell and uh, Anna, are, are you... Uh, and we have the, de we have the uh, written deposition colleagues in your package. Yes. And Anna, three minutes and I'll give you kind of 30 second warning if that's okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So you have our written deputation. I just yep. want to add a, a couple more comments. We've been uh, coming to the board on this issue since 2008. And uh, particularly at that time, we're concerned about the lack of consultation with communities, uh, with schools, with anyone, it seems, and the lack of benchmarks to measure the success of this program. So this program was introduced without any uh, uh, real uh, specific ideas about how it could be measured in terms of su its success. Uh, the um, research that I've seen on this, because I have been interested in this for a long time, is that students who have had either no or positive interactions with the police feel safer with a police officer around. And students who have had negative interactions with police officers or their family members have, don't feel safer with a police officer around. And that probably makes sense. Students aren't dumb. Um, I want to point out that this is a very expensive way to introduce ha helping adults into the school. And Councillor Carroll made this point at the last meeting that um, Mike Harris took cut funding to schools and took all sorts of wonderful helping adults out of the schools. And what we have replaced them with is very expensive police officers to the tune of $2 million a year. Uh, that we have no way of measuring the success of this program except anecdotal evidence and whether you're positive or negative, that's anecdotal. Um, I also want to point out that if the relationship between police officers and young people needs repairing, we have to ask why. Why is it not good? And that we would be much better to put our energy into improving the practices of officers in the field that lead to the breakdown of this relationship, racism, classism, sexism, uh, and those kinds of things, and that that is where our energy needs to be put, not in occupying schools with armed officers and normalizing the concept of armed officers in our schools. This normalizes a looking outside of ourselves for authority. It takes away from the authority of the teachers in the school and puts it in the hands of the officers. If I, as an adult, had officers in my workplace because something violent had happened in another college somewhere in the system, I would be outraged and so would you if you had armed officers wandering the halls of where you worked in, uh, as a response to some act of violence. We are treating youth differently. Uh, if we want uh, social workers in school, let's Let's put social workers in school. Let's give the $100,000 that it costs to have an armed officer in the school to those schools. They can use it. They are under-resourced. They can't fundraise. So they can use that $100,000, and I invite the police service to take that $100,000 for that officer and to give it to schools directly to use in ways that make a real difference for their students. Thank you very much. I also want to point out Thank that you. you do have the authority to direct the chief on this. You are not to tell him how to deploy his officers or how to, be spe how to specifically, but Justice Morden, after the G20, made it very clear that you are to set policy, yeah. you are to direct the police service, and I plea with you to direct the police Anna, service to get out of our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and this meeting should have been at City Hall, and we any, would not have this mess today. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, Anna, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marielle Stapleton. Where? Well, thanks for coming. Uh, you get three minutes, and I'll give you kind of a one-minute warning. I'll try. Um, is there a place where I'm supposed to give my written? Yes, just right down here. Thank you.
afternoon. Um, I've just attempted while I was sitting there to uh, edit down this to three minutes. So if it sounds disjointed, I apologize, but I'm hoping that the written one will speak for itself. My name is Murray. Is my mic on? Okay. My name is Murray Stapleton, and I would like to speak from two different perspectives as a concerned educator and most importantly as a concerned mother. And I wish to clearly express my support of the school resource officer or SRO program as it relates to my own children and the children I work with currently and in the future. Since its inception in 2008, I have watched the evolution of the SRO program over the past nine years. I've taught in schools in which the student population has represented groups from diverse ethnic, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Every one of these schools has benefited from the SROs involved. Since high school is likely the first time for many where poor choices find students in, con in conflict with the law, it also seems to be the primary place where this culture of animosity, mistrust, and disdain towards law enforcement takes root and permeates. Despite the open and welcoming engagement so many children experience in elementary school, if SROs are not present in the schools to provide a continuation of the positive police presence and their interactions at the secondary level before adolescents carry their formed ideas and experiences into the real world, then as adults, the culture of change that the Toronto Police Service are looking to create will become much more difficult to implement. Within the school setting, I have seen more female and visible minority students actively seeking information and advice from SROs to pursue future careers in law enforcement. I cannot imagine a situation where a student could flag down a patrol car to ask a police officer about his day-to-day -day experiences on the job or her educational background that led her to policing. However, this regularly happens in my class or on the bench during hockey or football practice and regularly in our school hallways. At the start of every semester, I watch my students go from being unsure and perhaps intimidated by the police officer who walks into my classroom during the first week to say hello, to observing my students joking around with them in the hallways and recounting the results on the last test or performance at a tournament. Throughout the year, when they are in the building walking by my room, my open door policy provides opportunities for SROs to visit and freely enter my classroom, and on many occasions, without guns, without badges, or uniforms. Within months, my students are able to look past the uniform and see the officers for what they are, another caring adult in the building. Further, this is a place where law enforcement can learn about our children, 30, 30 personal, seconds. Struggles, personal struggles, and the learning challenges that they face daily in our schools. For teachers, our school day is a microcosm of the greater community we live in, and so much of our success is dependent on the learning, um, learning incredible patience and empathy to better serve. I'm going to say screw this to the rest of the speech that I prepared, just to say. I've been doing this for a long time as a teacher, and I, as a black woman, can tell you, I may have some hesitations about my interactions that I've had in the past with police. But I can tell you, as an educator, I have seen students who, again, are part of that marginalized community that so many people in this room are talking about, have a, chain, have a chance to learn from the police officers and those officers to learn about students in that community. You can whom all you want, but those students have actually had an opportunity to learn about policing. They've learned about the police. And on the other side of that, I've watched police officers who perhaps may have come into a room and judge those students upon their first, upon looking at them the first. And after having a, ch a chance to sit and speak to them and learn about their background and their struggles and the challenges they face on a daily, it's a learning opportunity for both sides of this. And that's what I would like to see. Thank you very much. And thank you for your, uh, Councillor Carroll. Uh, Mirel, there, Mirel, there's a question from one of it, our it just, it, it, Murray, it's, it's is actually Murray. Yeah. I'm sorry, Murray. Murray, is it a, am I putting you on the, there's a lot of mics on. Sorry. Uh, am I putting you on the spot to ask what school you teach at? No, I teach at Etobicoke Collegiate, and so we see both sides of, of um, you can say the socioeconomic uh, um, yeah. uh, at that school. We see both sides, and I do, and it's not the only school that I've taught at my whole career. As I said, I've taught at a number of schools where I've seen SROs. So for the last nine years, I think I've been in a school that's always had one. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ken, sorry, Ken, Ken, you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry, wow. <laughs> with the, um, since you've had that experience as you've shared with us, um, mm -hmm. how do you see the primary role of the, of the SRO in the schools that, that you have experienced? Um, okay, well, I'm going to speak from my perspective as a mother um, and as an educator in the back of my head here. Um, I, I, I am not under any sort of illusion that the police have it right. I don't. 
I, I know that there's work to be done in our communities in order to educate both the police on what they are, the people that they are dealing with in their community and vice versa. But I'm hoping that by, there isn't really any other place where we can have an, a, a place of education where people and police can sit down on a regular basis. And in the schools that I've been at, this is it. We have over, I think, 900 students at our school and each of them recognize the SROs that walk in. Sometimes they're in uniform, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're at the local Tim Hortons. There's an opportunity for learning and the engagement that happens in and outside of the classroom is amazing. So I'm sorry, but some of the comments you made earlier just, they blew my mind about it. And I thought, well, yes, not every school um, has an SRO. And so the ones that do, I see administrators, I see teachers benefiting from it. I've seen incidents where you know what, the public doesn't always want to call 911 or call a police officer because they feel that there's something that's happened, but they would like the advice of the police officers. And I know the staff members at my school have, you know, kind of walked down and said, listen, this is what I understand happened. And for the police officer that they know and they're familiar with, they feel comfortable, they don't feel dumb, they don't feel stupid approaching them. And their concerns have been addressed. And it's a nice feeling when you have someone who can say, you know what, it's not a big deal. What you're, what you're asking me right now actually is important. Here, let's go take these steps to see if we can, can, and can deal with it appropriately. So I see value in it because it's an opportunity for our students to learn about policing because I can tell you when they walk in the building, their first instinct is, I don't want anything to do with them. They're bad, they're this, they're that. Give them a chance to learn the human behind the uniform. I think we have an opportunity to grow here as as a city, let's open the dialogue. Let's give kids an opportunity to meet the people who have walk around with badges and guns and uniforms. Let them learn about the community. How often is a police officer honestly going to get out of their car and say, hey, hi, how are you? It's not gonna happen. It happens in my schools and it happens in my classroom. Why? My door is open, they come in, they walk in, they sit down, they listen to my lesson, they leave. The kids get to engage with them that way, informally and informally. Mayor Tory? I think it's worthwhile. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you've made very positive comments, obviously, about this. Do you think that a review, though it's been a few years since there's been one, might be useful in the context of finding ways to address some issues that do exist about the program, or do you think it's uh, sort of, you know, got a sweet spot uh, about it that is uh, not in need of a review? No, I think there absolutely is always an, a, a, an opportunity to improve on something. Let's do it. And if there are problems, let's look at them, address them, and then fix them. I'm all in favor of us having a dialogue about the concerns that we heard at the last meeting when I was reading the Toronto Star. As a parent, if that were my child, I'd be absolutely floored and upset about it. But it's not my experience, and I'm not going to dishonor that it may be the experience of somebody else. So let's review it. Let's look at it. Do I want them out of the schools right now? Personally, I see on a daily basis the value of having them in the building. I do. I, I, I see it on a daily basis from our administrators, as I said, when an incident happens. It's nice, to, for, I know, for them to pick up the phone and say, listen, this is what's happening right now with a couple of students. Can you come and help me out? I've seen officers pick up students who are skipping first period, whatever. Excuse me? As a long time, thank you very much. I don't know about that, thank you. And I'm not going to speak to it. I'm only here to speak about what I know. Thank you very much. Just as much as I wouldn't expect anybody who's standing out there to speak about what I know. I'm only here to speak about what I know. And so, and so I, would like to, I, would just, I would like to say that let's look at it. Let's look at all sides of this issue. And um, where there's a problem, absolutely. Let's get rid of it. Where, that, where it's working, Let's do that. And I would like to see more educators involved in the process. If you're going to have police officers in the school, I think educators, teachers, frontline workers, and students need to be a part of that discussion. Thank you very much for your input. <laughs> Sandro uh, Mancino. Sandro, um, sorry, uh, you've got three minutes, and uh, I will uh, give you a one-minute warning, if that's okay. Yes, I do have a student that's also on the list of deputations. Is it okay that she join me now? Yes, okay. totally. There are two of them, actually, they're here that are on the list of deputations. Still three minutes. <laughs> okay, then I'll let them speak to okay. so something quickly. A lot has been said. So my name is Sandra Mancino. I've been in education for 30 years in high school level. I started my career in the Malvern area of Scarborough. I now teach in South Scarborough. 
So uh, two, two parts of the city that are often unfairly viewed by many people and, and have stigmas that go along with it. I can only share my experiences. What I, what I know of all of this is, and I've been asked to say a few words, is that once upon a time, my experience with police in the, in the community in Malvern was the youth crime unit. It was usually negative. My students did not have a very good view and for very legitimate reasons. Many of them had very negative contact in those communities with police officers. I remember the only contact as staff that we had was uh, those officers bringing a cache of weapons to show us, which only you know, served to fuel the, the uh, colleagues among me already had their prejudices. When asked where they came from, and I posed that question, they were handed to teachers. And I, and I knew that because I was one of the people that had a gun handed to me. So the question was, why would a young person in my school hand me a gun and not an officer? Because I had a relationship with that student and officers did not. Um, I am here because I believe that there's value in what is now going on. I was there at, at Cardinal Newman where Alfonso Carter is when this program came in and I had my hesitations and I still do. Many of the voices in this room uh, have legitimate concerns that I don't mean to devalue. They need to be a part of the discussion. This, this certainly needs to be reviewed. But the question is not about review today. I wasn't uh, asked to come to speak to that. The question is, will this be removed? And I don't believe it should be. Uh, the problem in our world today, and, and I'm sad to see uh, on both sides it's been here today, is this idea where we just argue and yell at each other and don't move forward in a collegial and cooperative way. In education, working with all different diverse educators in my career, that's how we've built unique programs, as some of the people said here, and alternative programs to reach out to our youth. I would like to see the police be part of that, but I'd like to see people in this room who have a strong voice also be a part of that. And so I won't speak to how great those officers are. I was very reticent to have one in my office. He's been there for three years, and I've just had, you know, I've learned, I've seen past the uniform as well. I will let my students then speak to how good a man this, this man is. So you've got about a minute and a half to, okay. to give Okay, I just really wanted to talk off. quickly about the officer that we have at our school. Um, what can I say about him other than the fact that he helps to make Newman Newman, our school? Um, he's more than just our police officer. He's our family. He's someone we can all look up to or the person that you can go to about anything. I talk to Officer Carter about everything. He makes... He makes me and all the other students at Newman feel safe and accepted. Once everyone is comfortable... Um, Everyone is comfortable with Officer Carter, especially when he walks around and hands out treats to most of the students. Um, he has never, ever been someone to be afraid of or ever been a person that we are intimidated by. Newman's a community, we are family, and Officer Carter is a huge part of our family. In my four years of being at Newman, I can honestly say that Officer Carter cares more about our students and their well-being, how their day is going. He's a genuine person. He wants to know if you had lunch yet. Like... And I know that Officer Carter is not the only officer out there like that. I know that all the officers here in this room do not look intimidating. They do not look rude or anything. All the views that people see about other officers around the world, you can only speak to so many people, you know? There's other good people out there. Everybody's different, just like races. Everybody's different. You can't just judge one race on how some people act. You can't just judge all police officers on how certain police officers, police officers act. He is not the only police officer that goes above and beyond for us. And I think that taking away Officer Carter would ruin our school. We all love him dearly. And I know that after I graduate this year, I will continue to be in contact with him because he's an amazing person inside and out of his uniform. Thank you. Thank you. So, have you got uh, something to say? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we get your, your names, just your first names, if I'm just so we can identify uh, the speakers? Okay, thank you all very much. We really appreciate you coming. Um, uh, Ugo Rossi. Ugo, thank you very much for coming, and uh, you've got three minutes, and I'll kind of give you a one-minute warning, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak here, and I hope that I'm not too sopophoric. My name is Hugo Rossi, and I'm a principal of the Toronto Catholic District School Board. I'm here to speak in support of the SRO program. Over the past 13 years, I've had the distinct pleasure of working in the capacity of vice principal and principal. Over the years, I've had the humble 
I have humbly served communities throughout the city and have had the honor and pleasure of benefiting from the SRO program. When I was a newly appointed principal in 2008 to 2009 at Don Bosco Catholic Secondary, and I think many of you know that school, <laughs> I met with Superintendent Ron Tavner from 23 Division. Ron Tavner is the longest serving police officer in the city right now. Superintendent Tavner had taken the time to visit the school to discuss the SRO program and how his officers would be utilized in my school. What left an indelible mark was his commitment to school safety and his explicit articulation that his officers were not there for enforcement purposes only, but to build community, enhance relationships, and serve unconditionally. As a novice principal, I was grateful for the communication and dialogue with the superintendent that we shared a common goal, to ensure a safe and welcoming school environment for all. To suggest that some students and parents didn't question the presence of police in the school would be disingenuous of me. However, it was our opportunity for the school, the police, and the community with the school resource officers to speak and dialogue at one of our parent council meetings. Furthermore, I believe that the success of this program is cogent on open dialogue, courageous conversations, and a commitment that respect flows in all directions. I can only attest to my experience with the SRO program and the numerous roles they've taken on. They serve as youth advocates, mentors, role models, community liaison, conflict mediators, compassionate problem solvers, and more importantly, they become harbingers of hope. On a regular basis, students walk into my office and ask if our current SRO from 31 Division, Officer Sonny, is in today. Well, you know that the program is successful when the officers are as popular as the tremendous teachers that we have. What one minute. I have witnessed firsthand how these officers have built relationships with students and helped them make good choices and better choices while providing the guidance needed. Students concerned with bullying, problems at home and social media and a multitude of other situations are often brought to the office at officer's attention and are dealt with in an expeditious and respectful manner. There are times, however, that our officers have to get involved in police matters. And one example that I want to share with you is a frightening situation that my community and I faced in November of 2015. A specific, a specific uh, sorry, a suspicious package was delivered to the school, which led to a school evacuation. What stands out for me was how professional our SRO and the responding officers were. 1,300 students were evacuated within minutes, and TTC buses were brought in to help transport students to our alternative evacuation site. This was all coordinated by our SRO. Here we go. The one. Let's wrap it up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Ken, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, from, your, from your experience as a, as a principal, um, do you think that the perspective of students that race plays a role in this? And if so, is it unreasonable in, from your experience? So let me just give you, a, let me contextualize the schools that I've worked at. Started my career at Regina Patches in the Jane Finch Corridor. I grew up in the Jane Finch Corridor. I'm a proud Finch person. Really loved, and my parents still live in the community. Uh, I began my teaching career there at Regina Patches. Then I moved to Percy Johnson in Rexdale. Became an administrator and moved over to Pope John Paul. Then went back to Percy Johnson. Then became principal at... at uh, I, I thank you. I thank you for your input, but it's the floor is mine right now. Thank you. So, do I believe that some of our students face racism, or are? I, I asked you. Um, do you think, do, from your experience, uh, do you believe that race is a factor on the perspective of how students view the police, and if if so, why? I've had students who've approached me, like I articulated in my, in my statement, that they were concerned with police in the school. And it was my opportunity as a learning experience for the student and myself to understand what has created this, this chasm between themselves and the police, allow them to sit together and dialogue and find common ground. I'm talking about race, you know, okay. Yeah, you answer my question. Is there? Hugo, thank you very, thank you very much. much. Yep. Uh, uh, John McCabe, uh, Chris Steedham, Odie Armstrong, and Lisa Townsend, four students from St. Patrick's Secondary School. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for coming. If you could please just identify yourself, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is John McCabe. I'm the vice principal at St. Patrick's Secondary. Thank you, John. Uh, this is Lisa Townsend. She's a youth worker. Okay. This is Jamelia. She's a grade 11 student. This is Josh. She's another grade 11 student. And Kathy, who is in grade 12. Uh, this is O'Day Armstrong. She's our social worker. Okay. And Chris Stidham is a guidance counselor at the school. Thank you for coming. So, uh, yeah, we're happy to be here uh, today. It's, um, it's three minutes. I'm three sorry. Minutes, and, uh, I'll give possible. you a one minute warning. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think everything that we do, we know it's about um, relationship building. That's what we do as educators, social worker, uh, even our students. And we instill that in the students. And uh, it, it's paramount to what we do within our community as well. And that goes with our, our community police officer. We don't have, I guess, technically an SRO, but we have a community liaison officer who comes into our school and quite a few in the neighborhood. Um, his name is uh, Curtis Celestine. He's a great guy. He's at the back there, he's probably the tallest man in the room. Um, he comes into the school, he'll go into classes, he'll meet new uh, people to Canada, new students that are, have arrived in Canada. He will come in, in the morning and uh, help with basketball coaching at 7 a.m. This is February, it's cold out, he's there. Um, most importantly, um, he meets, I think, with marginalized students from communities like St. Jamestown, Regent Park, uh, 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 even Thorncliffe Park, we draw from a wide area, and he's very good with those kids. Instead of us maybe, having to expel a student for, for something that's gone on that's come from, his, from a, the community that he's in, that's part of our school, Curtis is able to meet with him. He'll come in at 7 in the morning and, and play basketball with the guy. He'll have a coffee with him um, and get to know him. And I'm going to let everybody speak. It's not just me. So, no, O'Day is our social worker. That, that mic's on as well. Well, I think it's all about the relationships. And what I've witnessed, I can only speak to my experience at this school. And again, it's not an SRO, it's a school liaison officer. And just to see what the students say about Curtis and how they feel and how views have changed, um, it's, it's quite amazing to see the impact that he's had on our community. Um, and I think working on the relationship, and he is part of our community, and kind of trying to get over this impasse because like, where are we going to go? We need to move forward in a positive way. We need to have uh, these dialogues and this conversation and, and hear each other. Um, and the two sides need to somehow move forward like we seriously do to make any positive changes. I, th I think sometimes it's subtle when things happen. I remember a student who had been at basketball practice with Curtis minute, a couple John. times, and he didn't realize Curtis was a police officer, and he saw him in our school in uniform, and he was like, you're police? Like, and I think that's the start, because he sees him, Curtis, as, he, as who he is, as a human being. So if anybody else wants to jump in here? I think we've, we've uh, said our bit, so. Just, just one quick question. question so, so you're in favor, but you're also uh, using a slightly different model. Uh, are you supportive of the study going forward, and that we look at the school liaison model as well while we're while we're doing the the Ryerson study? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank okay. Thanks. Um, one question. Oh, yeah. One quick question for the student. The, um, I'm assuming that there are some students who object, probably, right? Um, yeah, there probably everybody is. Yeah. Loves, yeah. Yeah. Everybody loves it, or, or, or there's some who don't? From what I see, and we haven't done uh, any, we don't have any data no, okay. to prove it, but yeah. yeah. There could be some, yeah. Can you just give a, a quick um, description as to what reasons they give, the, the, you know, for, for the, the objection to, to, to it? We're just assuming that they're out there, but I have nev I've never had a student yeah. speak to us negatively about this. Okay, Chris. all right. But Nobody disagreed, okay. Lisa has, and she can speak yeah. to that. It's, it's not a large story. It's just a simple fact that a student that I work with closely wanted nothing to do with a police officer, didn't want to speak to him. He had questions surrounding an issue that I thought this uh, officer could possibly help with. Didn't want anything to do with it. So I said, okay, well, you know, do you, can you can tell me why? He said, I don't want to talk to any cops ever, never. So, I mean, I'm not going to tell his story exactly why, but he never did come to that place, but he understood um, from a discussion we had that there can be a positive relation, that he's a person. And then that was at his initial um, interaction and our conversation around the officer, but eventually he came to understand through some of his peers 
that the officer in question at our school is not it wasn't a negative influence so he slowly slowly yeah it's not he's not going to sit with them right now either but he's lightened that opinion slightly and my hope is to just eventually build on that and maybe he can see our officer as that as a person and not just that cop so it's only one thank you yeah, the, uh, the, that stood up thank and you very yeah, much some of the stories that i have heard it's experiences in the communities but not in our schools thank you very much all of you for coming we appreciate it uh, Julian Vivona. Julian, you have uh, th three minutes, and I'll give you kind of a one-minute warning if that's helpful. It's Julian, there's a misspell there. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julian Vivona. As president of the Toronto Catholic Teachers Unit of Awecta. I recently sent a request to my teachers for input on the SRO program. Every single reply was positive, and decidedly so. The best statements come from the people in the schools who witness the everyday impact of this program on their students. I will let them speak, and here are some of their statements. From, Bar from Bishop Morocco Thomas Merton, a central downtown school. In the hallways, Officer Candy has developed positive relationships with many of our students. Officer Eric spoke to my classes about careers and life choices, and my students were very engaged when he spoke. Overall, I think the program to be very positive, and I hope it continues at the same school. Police Officer Laura was and still is instrumental in our intergenerational program as well as the food bank at the School for the Students. She takes students up to Teen Ranch so that our high-risk students have a chance to go horseback riding. The officers even helped get our ice hockey team going and have conversations and build trust and relationships. They are an excellent resource and we wish we had one here every day. At Madonna, a central all-girls school, I worked with officers for the past four years. The positive impact they can have on a school community is immeasurable. They provide a trusted adult for students in schools and create healthy relationships between students and police services. At St. Patrick Southeast End School, I had two officers come to my ESL civics class to speak to them about their role in the community. They were amazing. They very quickly established a rapport with these students despite the language barriers. Students went away very comfortable about approaching police here in the city if they had to. Our last SRO was even involved in coaching soccer here at the school. I can't say enough about them. At Pope John Paul II, a large East End school, over the years, I've seen the officer almost on a daily basis. I have seen students in distress speak to the officer because they've been victimized or bullied in the school. Some confide in the officer about abuse by a boyfriend or to report a crime. I've known our SROs to move heaven and earth to get our students part-time or summer jobs, to get them involved in extracurricular activities like our guitar club, which a past SRO started in our school. Our current officer is a founding member of the Pink Panthers, a group for female students formed to show our girls that they deserve respect in their relationships, that they have potential for a positive future, and that stereotypes and neighborhoods should not define them. Our SROs attend school trips and major events because our students invite them. If we lost our, RSO, our SRO, we would be losing more than a police One officer minute. in a school building. We'd be losing a member of our school community. From Monsignor Percy Johnson, uh, the entire guidance department sends this letter. It's a West End school. Officers are supportive and responsive. Uh, they provide workshops such as drug awareness, dangers of social media, self-esteem, self-esteem, self-awareness of the environment, predators, and self-defense techniques, workshops on bullying and prevention. Of bullying. They are positively engaged with the daily lives of our, all our students. There are times when our students independently seek out our SRO's advice and counseling. They are caring, compassionate, empathetic, and supportive individuals, positive role models, not only for our female students, but also for our male students. They are a vital, significant part of a community. It would be a tragedy to lose these two wonderful women. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> uh, colleagues, questions? Thank you very much for your time.
Yes, could, if you could provide your written presentation, that would get into it got, our... It got really chopped up when I heard it went from five to three, so can well, I send you a cleaner copy? Okay, that would be great. Thank you and very I'll much. Send you the full statements from the teachers as well? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, 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 Vince uh, Rosotta? Vince, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Vince Brazotta, Superintendent of Safe Schools, Toronto Catholic District School Board. Lovely. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, at Toronto Catholic, we believe in safe, caring, and learning in accepting environments. We also believe that that responsibility does not fall on just one individual. It does not fall on an administrator. It does not fall on a teacher. It does not fall on a parent. It does not fall on an SRO. But together that community is much stronger. Our experience with the SRO program at Toronto Catholic has been nothing but positive. There may be some outlying issues out there, but those are opportunities, not reasons to dismiss the program. We've always believed in positive school relationships. Uh, our youth deserve an opportunity to establish caring adult relationships with adults. The more opportunities you provide those students, the much better adjusted they are and better learning can occur. In a recent conversation with our principals, we, had a we discussed the SRO program because we knew it was an issue. And I can tell you unequivocally that not one of those principals said that they saw the police officer as a patrolling person who patrolled the halls and looked for crime. That is not their role. They come into our program, they come into our schools, our schools, and become part of the community. You have heard of some of our administrators today speak to the many, the many activities they partake in. You've heard of some of our students. I'm saddened, actually, that a whole bunch of students had to leave because they had other responsibilities. They have younger siblings, and they have to look after them. I hope I'll be given the opportunity to provide their depositions as well, because they are powerful. The other thing I would like to add to you, like to add, is that uh, I know you have a letter from our chair of the board and uh, about the support of the program. I think context is very important with that letter. You need to remember that that was a result of the Safe Schools inquiry of a very tragic event that occurred in 2014 when two of our students lost their lives. Our board took it upon themselves to have an independent inquiry. It lasted over three months. 33 recommendations were, were, um, were recommended and were put forward. The one that you have was recommendation number 28. Again, showing you that everyone has a responsibility to ensure safe, caring, accepting schools. Thank you very much. The other thing that I would like to add to you is you do, all of you have an opportunity here to really change the perceptions. When I was a student in high school, I used to see the yellow police cars, yes, yellow police cars, okay? And it said to serve and protect. I never really understood what the serve part was. In fact, I often talk to my, my, my colleagues and says, what does serve mean? I know the protect part. There are students here today who have gone, are going to be home, going home and will be parents one day. And when that conversation sits at the dinner table and says, do you know what serve and protect is? Yes, I do. So you have an opportunity here today, folks, to really look at changing perceptions of service. And if there's opportunities to, that need to be addressed, let's address them. Are there issues? Certainly. But does that mean that we have to dismiss the program un unequivocally? I beg to differ. Thank you very thank, much for thank listening. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Uh, Dr. Noria? I just have a quick question. Uh, Vince, you mentioned that you had a meeting with a group of uh, principals. Could you just elaborate how many principals and, uh, and, this, and the number of schools? Absolutely. We have 30 high school principals in our board. And uh, oh, was it a consensus opinion, or was there much debate in your discussions? Very little debate. In fact, if I may add, uh, I often get, as a superintendent, I'm often asked, when can my school be partaking in the SRO program? Because it's not in every school. And if I may be allowed to, uh, to espouse further, I want to make it clear to everyone at this board that we do not choose schools. We do not impose the SRO program on anyone. There is consultation, and uh, it is done at the local level. And if they want to partake, then we have that conversation. And if I may add, because we, there's been a lot of talk about um, data, we took it upon ourselves because we felt so strongly about the SRO program. And if you believe in the fact that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, we did our own research. And over the last two years, we, uh, we've, we've asked nine questions in our safe school survey. And if I may, 58% uh, felt safer with SROs in their schools. Also, 
84% of students okay, felt very comfortable talking to an SRO about crime or any other issue in our school systems. So if I may again summarize my, my, my findings, or our findings rather, is that we view police officers or SRO officers as members of our communities, equal partners, and not necessarily from a law enforcement perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lee? Is it possible to uh, provide that uh, survey to us, the results of that survey? Absolutely, I Thank will you. do that. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you for the time. Uh, Ricky Goldenberg and uh, three students. Uh, okay. Okay, great. Great, thank you very much. So I'll give you uh, a couple of minutes. In fact, I'll give you a little bit longer than the three minutes, obviously, because all three of you are speaking. But I'll go give you a warning of a minute before, OK? Thanks. Uh, OK, cool. Um, so good, after, good evening, guys. So we are three students from Mark Arnold Collegiate Institute. So we go to a school with roughly about 1,700 students. So obviously, there's a lot of students of different ethnic origins, religions, and et cetera. So we would like to share today our positive experiences with the school resource officers. Um, so today we are here in the best interest of our school and in no way do we represent the TDSB. So just to give a bit of context, back in 08, the Toronto District School Board and the Catholic District School Board came together to form this SRR program. Essentially the goal of this uh, program was to allow uh, student resource officers in schools and it was to prevent um, crime as well as provide security for students. However, today I can say that beyond the student resource officers do just beyond that. So just a couple of things before I move on, to pass it on to my colleague. Um, they help youth get involved in the community, so I always constantly see this. I was on the baseball senior team, um, and officers are always constantly coming to practices, helping students out, uh, connecting with students on the field with whatever extracurricular there is. Uh, furthermore, they're also building a relationship between the youth and the law, and I always constantly see this when students are talking um, in the hallway with officers, these resource officers. And it's obviously a positive experience because students get to learn about the law while they're building relationships with their officer. So I'll just pass on to Miriam. Hi, my name is Miriam Amir, um, and I'm also a grade 12 student who is strongly involved with Toronto Police, especially with, uh, through the Yippie program and also helping out with the 54 Division. Uh, a statement in the Toronto Star uh, reporter stated how uh, new immigrants are intimidated by the police officers, but uh, the Toronto Police not only welcomes new immigrants with an open heart, but also, diver uh, also does various activities. And I would like to take upon saying that 53 Division does cops and kids basketball at schools to get the youth and community involved, which our SRO does uh, take involvement in. 54 Division does Pro Action Hockey League, a free hockey uh, season for the Flemington and Thorncliffe area to make them feel welcome and enjoy the most favorable Canadian sport. They get free equipment and they have banquets and better yet, they have an actual police involvement where they do see, uh, they do see police officers interacting with kids that are not in uniforms. Uh, and I would like to introduce Mazin, also a grade 12 student who recently came from Syria to Canada. He would like to share his experience with his school, uh, with, with the school SROs. Good morning, good afternoon, sorry. Uh, my name is Mazin. I'm from Syria. I just came to Canada recently a year and a half ago. And uh, I would like to start my speech by saying uh, it's my honor, I'm a pleasure to have such a beautiful, and a kind uh, Mr. like Mr. Young, a police officer in our school. Officer Young, someone who inspired me at the school. When I started school at Margarno and I met him for the first time, he was very kind and a nice person. Officer Young gave me direction on how to apply to the military. He brought me information that I need to know about it. When I would when I go, when I would go to the wait room at school, often Officer Young would be there speaking to students and advising them. 
He would bring snacks and water bottles for all the students in the weight room who goes there. Officer Young, he has done a lot of good things for me and other students at Margarno. I do not see him as only a police officer, but as well as a friend, as a teacher, a manager, and a hero who keeps the students safe from any bad situation that can happen at school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, Ken? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in view of what you're saying, it sounds like things are very good as far as you see, right? Our, our experience. How would you um, advise the black student who says to you that about carding and feel very angry? And, and because part of what, that's part of the reality that has happened. So do you think that some of this is unreasonable? So how would you advise them in a situation like that, those who have this view of the police as carding um, you know, black youth in particular and yeah. so on. How, how would you do that? So for me, I have a lot of friends at my school and I'm one of the famous people in my school and I have a lot of friends and I know all their feelings about what they do, about like how they feel. And I almost suck everything that from them about what they, what they like about the police or dislike. And I found out that the majority in my school, like 90% of them, they, they like the police as, as helping them, like as a friend. They don't scare of him or anything. Uh, he's really a nice guy. He's really effective with no, the others. It goes through. I was asking about the black students who, who feel that way, a lot of them, because that's where a lot of the... the protests come from. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. As a student. Uh, so just to answer your question, we do have a lot of black people uh, participating in basketball. And Officer Young, as a sport, OK. Uh, but then all of them do participate in lots of sports at Mark Garneau. And precisely, they do a lot of interactions with Officer Young, and they, they have like handshakes and like greeting him as a friend and not seeing him as like an officer. They, have, they see him as a friend. They can see him, as he mentioned, as a mentor, a guidance, and they like to talk to him and just about how things are going around. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all three of you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, Denise de Paula, Paula, is that correct? Carlene, is there is Denise outside, or do we know? Okay, uh, if she shows up, we'll go on. Was, uh, I've got a representative from Pro Action here. Is that who's that? Uh, you. Okay, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. I'd figure that out eventually, so. I, I'll give you three minutes and a, a kind of one minute warning. Thank you. There's three of us here today from Pro Action, and I'll give you uh, an edited version of what we were gonna talk about here today, because I'm sure everybody's scrambling, but. Uh, obviously, the themes that you're hearing from uh, a lot of the youth that here are going to be a lot of the things that we'll touch on here as well. I'm not going to repeat them because they're, they're pretty self-evident, but to my left is uh, Tom Bidoff, who's um, um, a board member. I'm a long-serving board member of Cops and Kids, and uh, we have Nella first staff here and um, uh, Janine Milligan, who is the um, uh, executive director of the charity. So those are our roles. The charity itself is a uh, privately, uh, it's a volunteer board, privately uh, run charity, and basically what it does is it, it raises funds for the police officers at TPS and three other chapters that we have in Durham, um, Hamilton, and Niagara. And the purpose of the charity is to uh, encourage the connection between police officers and the community, uh, kids. 
and a lot of times, a lot of the kids that we've been discussing here today. So uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of the themes that have already been uh, talked about. There's obviously a lot of great stories, and over the course of the last two decades, uh, Tom's dad and uh, Chief McCormick, um, who uh, was then the chief uh, going back 25 years, it's a vintage I relate to, and I remember the cars were yellow at that time and maybe another color. But uh, the model in policing changed in the 90s from what it was in the 70s and 80s, and the police officers became more scarce in the community and started getting into the vehicles. The, one of the reasons, or the main reason, was that the founders thought getting officers together with uh, youth was a good thing, because all the themes that have been talked about here today in terms of understanding, learning from each other, interactions, and finding social activities where you can build that relationship are fundamental to a successful and safe community. And the charity and the new, uh, well, policing's always had that goal. Safe communities is something that we share. So I'm going to move directly to a couple of points here. And the um, currently we've got about a thousand got, officers. Uh, one minute to thousand. Sorry. Thank you, thousand officers that do this on their own time. Forty percent of the programming that we actually uh, provide funding for, which is touches about six to eight thousand kids a year, is through the SRO uh, uh, program. Incredibly successful. I will read you some of the results because that's the, the important thing here. So we do surveys and they're available. And uh, we know that this works as, as a tactic and as a strategy. The feedback from the kids that we uh, get are based on these themes. The, th these are these kind of comments that they make. Their community is a safer place because of police. They trust police. They like police. Police are fair. Police officers try to help all people. They welcome police in the neighborhood. They feel like they're part of the community. So these are a sample of the kind of comments and themes that come back in the surveys that, that, that we do. And a, a couple of points were made here, which I'll just reinforce. When people see each other as people and get past the uniform and vice versa, it's a culture changing move for the officers. These officers take, take on senior roles and I think that understanding grows with those officers. It's a key consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, questions? Okay. Thank you all. Um, uh, Nirupan, and I apologize for it, uh, uh, Sivakumarana. I apologize for uh, butchering the name. You've got three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nirpan Sivakumar. I am 22 years old, entering my fourth year at the University of Toronto, Trinity College. I was in high school from September 2009 to June 2013, and I went to two high schools, Lamoureux Collegiate Institute in Scarborough Agent Court and Albert Campbell Collegiate Institute in Scarborough Rouge River. I'd like to briefly talk to you about my experiences with the SRO program, and I'd like to be as specific as I can. My initial experiences with the SRO program are usually listening to presentations and lectures, and occasionally assisting with activities when it crossed over with other activities. It wasn't until I transferred to Albert Campbell that I really got involved with the SRO program. I was approached by Officer TT, who also happened to go to my previous high school. She's right there in the front row with the sporty red jacket. Um, Officer TT stands for Tomlinson Thompson, but that's the nickname that we use. Um, she approached me to ask if we could help with anti-bullying initiatives at the school. We established a club, and our main event that we did was an anti-bullying week, and we did with activities like Day of Pink. Um, for example, we staged a fight to see if anyone would intervene and use their civic responsibility. Unfortunately, no one intervened. I actually have a quote from back then where it said, do not stand by 
and not do anything. It is your civic duty to do something when you see a crime happening. And that was Officer TT probably like four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, another example of an interaction we had with an SRO is when we have now retired um, Inspector David Saunders from 42 Division who came to a law class and he actually had a debate with us about the G20 protests and we could ask him questions like, you know, what is the legal opinion on this and that and it provides a lot of clarity. Um, these exercises were insightful and I think a positive experience for my classmates as well. It made it much more interesting, in my opinion, to debate a police officer directly and get their legal opinion on different issues. Um, for the activities we organized for anti-bullying, I was very honored to receive Crime Stopper Student of the Year in 2013. I was also asked to join the Community Police Liaison Committee for 42 Division. Uh, specifically, I think it was a great opportunity because they asked me to help communicate information not only back to youth, but also back to the Tamil community. Um, I know different communities have different experiences with the police, and I know this was touched upon earlier, but it's typical, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of any community necessarily, but I know culturally you kind of want to stay from away from the police, not because of Canada, but because of things back home. So I think this kind of normalizes a lot of relationships. Um, personally, one minute. Thank you. Personally, I had an overall great experience and impression of the program. I can't speak to any alternatives or potential shortcomings, but I think in the future, the kind of experiences I mentioned, I hope you guys can keep those in schools. I think they're very beneficial. And um, if there's anything I would like to add about the future of these kind of programs, I think that more students should be involved with things like CPLC because they provide a really direct connection between the police, the public, and other youth communities. And that continues now when you're a young adult or an adult. And in conclusion, I personally feel the SR program my high school experience was positive, beneficial, and introduced ideas and topics that we would not have otherwise discussed or debated. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nirvana. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Michael Wetzel from uh, John Paul II. Arlene, do we know? Okay. Um, uh, Colin Bailey, there's a, a, a deposition uh, as well, Colin. Thank you very much. You, you should know the drill now. Three minutes, I'll give you a one-minute warning. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'll do my best, too. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> my name is Colin Bailey. Back in 2008, 2009, I was a part of the SRO program. And I'm here today to talk about my experience alone with that program. When I heard the program may be cancelled, I thought that my story may be helpful in swaying your decision. Uh, I can't stand here today, sorry, sit here today in front of you and say that, uh, you know, the program kept me off the streets or out of jail, changed my life 180. Simply, that was not my childhood. Uh, when I was in high school, I was fortunate enough to have an auto body repair program. Even more so, I knew that auto body repair was the career path I was going to follow. I was lucky to have already known what I wanted to do uh, when I finished school, unlike very many. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago now that I think about it, but being enrolled in that auto body repair class was one of the few reasons that I enjoyed my high school experience. This class helped me to build my future and shape me into a professional in my respective trade. Our project for the SRO program was to overhaul a 70s Chevy, Chevy Laguna uh, and then sell it for auction, a full restoration job from the tires to the top a Smokey and the Bandit theme, if I remember correctly. I remember being asked if I wanted to participate in the Cops and Kids program. At the time, I thought, all I thought was yes, it's a chance to help restore a classic muscle car, a chance to do more hands-on work, a chance to better my knowledge and skills. To be honest, I didn't even think much about the officers being involved, let alone being hands-on in the repair process. Since I'm being honest, well, I didn't really care much for the police force. There's definitely a stigma or a perceived perception uh, between the youth and the men and women who dedicate their lives to the police force. As the weeks went on and the project car was slowly broken down, part by part, a common denominator was built between the students bit by bit. Uh, it became apparent to me that this is not just a cop with a badge, this is an officer. He's a gearhead, just like me. He was just like anyone else off the street. We had shared an interest for the auto trade and classic cars. I remember staying back after the bell rang many times to help work on the rebuild 
And every time the officers were there, they would ask how things were going, if we needed anything. And I must say, seeing a guy wearing a bulletproof vest, roll up his sleeves, pick up some tools, really eye-opening for me. Uh, unfortunately, I had graduated before the overhaul project was completed, and I never got to see the finished Laguna. However, I took away much more than I thought I was One going minute. to. Thank you. The Cops and Kids Project definitely changed my personal opinion of the men and women on the force, and it also helped uh, me to get more involved in the trade. I have competed in Skills Ontario and Skills Canada Trades and Technology Competition, an Olympic style and event, uh, showcasing over 40 different trades and technology sectors. I have competed four times provincially and won three times nationally, and I am proud to say that I'm this year's gold medalist for the Skills Canada National Competition. My success has enlightened me and motivated me to start giving back. I accredit my passion for what I do to the time I spent in the shop all those years ago, simply doing what I enjoyed. I fully believe that my time spent helping on the restoration project was both directly and indirectly a part of what influenced my choices in life. So whether this program was targeted to me or not, I still have a, it still had a positive outcome for me. So in closing, I'd like to say that I strongly feel that it would be in the best interest for the youth of today, tomorrow, the communities, the image of the police force, and the governing bodies to keep programs like this all, uh, active. Thank I hope you that the much. Cops and Kids program will be an ongoing endeavor. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it. The colleagues' questions for Colin? Thank you very much, and thank you for thank providing you. a written, uh, written deputation, too. Uh, John Freeman. Good afternoon, my name is John Freeman and I've been a police officer for almost nine years. I've been stationed at 12th Division for the entirety of my career and I've been an SRO for the last two. As an SRO, I am also an educator, an informal counselor, a mentor, a role model, and a friend. As an SRO, I get to see 1,500 members of my community every single day and more importantly, not just on the bad days. Yes, I'm there if they stumble, but I'm also there when they soar and every other day in between. That is something that cannot be measured or counted. That breeds familiarity, which leads to building of relationships and trust. It strengthens the moral authority that we require instead of relying solely on our legal authority. One of Sir Robert Peel's founding principles of modern policing is the community are the police and the police are the community. My presence in the school has only contributed to these school environments and added value to the role the police play in the community. When I am told by a 15-year-old female student who has just reported to me that a sexual assault she suffered at the hands of a family member or peer, that she felt comfortable coming forward because she knew me and she trusted me and because I was the positive presence in her life, I can't fathom the rationale that seeks to destroy this progress and halt this important program. The American Civil Liberties Union and Citizens for Juvenile Justice have stated that the kind of relationships police forge with teachers and students rather than the number of arrests they make promotes school safety. The SRO program has been accused of continuing the systemic school to jail pipeline and some of our disadvantaged and racialized youth are seen that some of them are seen to be on. I challenge that perspective. I see myself as an interruption to that pipeline, a positive presence in the school that is there to educate students on their rights provide them with a different relationship with a police officer and offer struggling students a way forward outside of the criminal justice system by utilizing restorative justice circles and methods of conflict resolution and re reconciliation. And here's a statistic for you. I haven't arrested a student in two years as an SRO. Did your I agree, my friends aren't SROs. I agree with the closing remark of an article published on April 21st, One 2015 minute. for the Toronto Life magazine. It concludes with, maybe if they got to know us, they'd treat us differently. That is the foundation of the SRO program, giving students the opportunity to know us and us to know them. In defining the role of police in the community, an article which was published in the New York Times, it is stated, it's a lot harder to overreact when you know someone's name. The school is my community. I need my community as much as they need me. My fear is that removing the SRO program from schools will not only reduce that much needed outreach in the schools, but weaken the bonds that hold us together. Budget is always an issue, so let's reinvest where it counts and keep the SRO program. Let's invest in our youth by remaining dedicated to delivering police services in partnerships with our communities to keep Toronto the best and safest place to be. Thank you. John, thank you. Um, questions, uh, colleagues, of, of John? Okay, thank you again, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Nancy Mancini, Chris Speed, uh, Maria Arajo.
Yep, please. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, Nancy, are you, uh, the, the, is it two groups presenting? Yes. Okay, no, so, speak. yeah. Okay. All right, Nancy Mancini, Principal of Blessed Archbishop Romero Catholic Secondary School. And um, kids can't learn if they don't feel safe. Teachers can't teach. Um, when our SRO is in the midst, there's a collective sort of sigh of relief. And, and it, it really um, was a student that said that to me, that when he walks to school and approaches the school and sees the cruiser, he just goes, <sighs> okay. Um, Officer De Quintal does a lot. He, he, you know, we know, builds relationships. He does a number of things that the kids are gonna talk about. He, um, he's a friend to all of us, and to lose him would be a big blow for us, a big blow. Thank you. I have known Officer Peter DeQuintel through the Bike Rodeo program and through helping to spread the word about the Freshman 40 program. Officer Peter is not only an officer, but a friend. Through the Bike Rodeo safe pro Safety program, Officer Peter is not only able to teach young uh, elementary school uh, students how to operate bikes safely, but is able to establish a relationship between high school and elementary school students. This program has received many achievement awards because it has helped to build trust and care within the community. Personally, through these programs, I have started to see myself as more than just a student, but as a young person able to make a difference. It is not just the pizza parties and free helmets, it's the person that makes the difference and leads others to make a difference as well. I'd like to thank Officer Peter for bringing me and other students to the blood clinic to save lives and help build the Freshman 40 program our grade, that our grade 9 students have now. To me, you are an important role model. Without you, the school will never be the same. Hello, my name is Princess. I'm here today to address how safe our school resource officer makes me feel at school. Our school is situated in quite a residential area. There are apartment buildings right next door. This means for us that we get many strangers around the premises. Since this is also their neighborhood, they also sometimes loiter outside the buildings and around local businesses. This makes it really easy for us to cross paths with these people during lunch. Sometimes students get approached by these strangers or have to make extra efforts to navigate around them. They may even also try to engage in conversation with them, which I myself have experienced. However, I have found that ever since we had the SRO situated within our school, these instances have decreased greatly. I personally feel assured that with their presence, there is a decreased risk of danger and I feel much safer. Especially when the cruiser is parked in front of our school, for example, these situations are less likely to present themselves. In conclusion, I believe that having an SRO officer located within our school has not only made our school safer, but more importantly, has made students feel safer. I hope you take this opportunity to see how much we value the presence of the SROs in our schools and how much we feel we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Father, Just you have, uh, one yep. minute. Uh, I am Father Ricardo. I, I usually go frequently to Bishop Romero. I just strongly recommend the presence of police at Bishop Romero. The, uh, first of all, to be able to force positive, positive connection with local police officers, they learn to trust through regular interaction. It's very important, the visual presence. And also, it facilitates preventive measures to stop or avoid criminal activity, not necessarily in the school, but nearby the school. And also, it's uh, for safety in any emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. All these questions? Oh, okay, thank you so much. Now, the what's the... Uh, is the representative Mary around? Is the oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Patty Greenwood, and I'm the president and CEO of Mary Go Round Children's Foundation. And uh, I am joined today by two of my board members. 
those who are here to uh, support support me. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you today. We are here today to support police officer involvement in the schools and speak about our, pro our positive experiences in working with students, educators, and police officers in delivering our program. Merry-Go-Round Children's Foundation raises funds for and delivers the Kids Cops and Computers program and has been working to bridge the digital divide for low-income students in Toronto for 19 years. We work in partnership with both Toronto School Boards and the Toronto Police Service to deliver the program that provides new laptop computers and five monthly Leave and Learn sessions which are held in the schools to assist students in increasing their digital literacy. This year we are working with more than 600 students in 38 schools across Toronto. Since inception, we have assisted more than 4,000 students and work with 90 schools across the city. Through Kids, Cops, and Computers, police officers work together with teachers to create a safe space for students to learn, receive support, and build closer rapport. Our experience with having officers involved in programming with students in schools has been extremely positive and beneficial. It is a pleasure to see the relationships that grow in this program, relationships that last throughout the students' career and even beyond. Our experiences have also shown was evident all around us, with officers joining in to play games with our students and even dancing together on stage. One minute left. Students and officer and police officers both benefit from the regular interactions through Kids, Cops and Computers. Students start to see police officers as individuals, people they can trust and look to for support and assistance. Likewise, our police officers benefit from developing strong relationships with students. The involvement of the Toronto Police Service in the schools through our program is a fundamental aspect of Kids, Cops and Computers and integral to its success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, any questions? Okay. Thank you and thank all three of you for coming. Um, Jenna Park. Carlene, Jenna Park. No? Okay. They're all in here? Okay. Uh, Curtis Celestine. Uh, Curtis? <laughs> Thank you for coming. You've got three minutes, and I'll give you the, kind of the one-minute warning, Curtis. Try to keep it quick. I just have, I'll just read from my notes. Uh, name is Curtis Lestine, uh, SRO 55 Division. Uh, first of all, before, I'm a, before I can say I'm an SRO police officer, I'm a proud black male. I'm entrenched in my community. I'm a father, and I'm a, uh, and I'm a husband. Okay? Uh, so this is a very important topic to me. Uh, but I'll start off with the um, African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Raising a child is not just a sole responsibility of the parent. It's about every one of us who are fortunate enough to meet these young people, making a positive, lasting impact on their journey. Yes, as an SRO, I'm proud to be a part of their journey. I'm proud when many ask me how I got involved in policing and what paths they need to, to walk because they're now curious about the career choice. I'm proud that they actually want to hear my story. Yes, 
I am proud to be part of their village, where I'm, where I'm able to see their many success stories unfold. Secondly, this SRO position is not about me. It's about the students. Well, unfortunately, many of them had to leave. Um, but it's about helping the, to bridge the gap that does still exist between police officers and young people. It's about giving them the opportunity to realize that officers put their pants on the same way as they do, one leg at a time. It's about them realizing that once upon a time, a lot of us officers lived in the very same neighborhoods as they currently reside and faced the very same issues. It's about them recognize, recognizing that we are no different than some of their other mentors, such as their parents, their uncles, their teachers, their guidance counselors, their pastors, and coaches, just to name a few. This position is about affecting change. Third, the biggest problem that I can identify with this position is that what we accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis, the positive changes we affect are not measurable. The high fives and greetings that I personally receive as I enter schools, the requests made from teachers advising that their students want me to return for a second question and answer period about policing and about life itself. The thanks I receive from the various basketball teams following our early morning practices. To be honest, that is probably the only time I can truly say that these students hate me because sometimes my practices can be really grueling. A thank you letter I may receive from a parent for treating their child fairly the times when I'm out with my own family and a student goes out of their way to come over to, to say hello, and they're with their friends. I'll just finish in one second. Those times cannot be measured in a statistical category. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, the questions? Thank you for okay. having me. Thank you. Um, uh, Taja Lawrence Scott. Thank you very much. I'll give you three minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning. Hi, my name is Taja Lawrence Scott. And um, I had a lady come to me by the name of Sylvia, Argentina, trying to switch sides, trying to make me switch sides, but that's not happening. And I am a former student of York Memo, and my SRO is John Freeman, and he changed my life. There are so many times where I was about to get in trouble, and he was always there, you know? Him and Greenway, they make a perfect team, so I'll say that 100%. Like, even though there's Situations that are happening over here doesn't mean it's happening everywhere else. And yes, this whole Black Lives Matter, of course they do, but everybody else's lives matter also. So I personally think that the only reason why certain Black kids don't get along with the police is because of the gang-related situations that are going on. So they want to fit in with the gang here and fit in with the gang there. So that's the only reason why they don't like boy them, police. And even if you want to add anything else. My name is Nathan President. I go to York Memorial as well. Um, the SRO program has been very beneficial to my school. A lot of students, be, I mean, a lot of students, be, for lunchtime, they choose to do drugs, get drunk, and come back to school in the afternoon for their periods, high, drunk. The SRO program provided options for them to go to the gym maybe the weight room, the library, even the pool. With them having their minds occupied on that, they go to class in the afternoon sober now. I see it myself. The, it's been more than supporting in my um, fitness lifestyle. I mean, Teresa herself endorsed some equipment onto me. Um, John has been more than supportive helped me out through a lot of things, especially when I was going through them. That's all I have to say. What I'd also like to add is that John Freeman actually shows how much he really loves 
and truly cares about all these kids. There's a time where we're all in the assembly and he took the mic and he started breaking down because there's a big fight that happened. You know, you can easily get killed by that. Like the way that there's, there's too many kids on that field, you can't tell me no one was gonna get hurt or die. He came in there breaking down crying just showing us that he wants us to be on the right path and that's it. Just because he's a police officer and he has on a uniform does not mean anything. He's still a human. And that's what it is. So what, we're all white and we're all black, like, you know? What's the real meaning? That does not mean anything. And I swear to God in my life, John is the best SRO ever. And I thank God that I actually got the chance to be there at Memo because like, it's overwhelming. Like, all I have to say is thank God because if it wasn't for him, I don't know where I'd be right now. He stopped me from getting into so many problems. There's a bunch of girls that came to school one day to try to fight me, and he was there. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Colleagues, questions? Shelley? Uh, yeah, just a, a quick question. So, Tasha, you, you started your deputation by saying somebody talked to you today to try to convert you. Yes. Um, do those conversations go on at the school? Is there sort of a a bit of a, a struggle between students, uh, some, some, uh, some who are, are uh, um, in a good working relationship with John and others who are not. Do, is there a back and forth about that or, or do people sort of just align themselves and leave each other alone about it? What do you mean, like about like, not do, is, there, John is there a debate that goes on about whether or not uh, we like having John in York Memorial? No, or everybody or, likes him. I think that he's, he's most talked about positively because Teresa was good, so was Todd, but John, he just has a different light on him. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, both of you. I appreciate it. Uh, Suzanne Greenaway. <laughs> oh, Suzanne? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute uh, warning. And if I kind of miss it, it'll be a 30-second warning. But <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susanna Greenaway, and I am the proud principal of York Memorial Collegiate, located in the west end of the city at Keele and Eglinton. As an educator for 28 years, an administrator for 20 of those, at the high school level, I would like to share my positive experiences and perspective and comments about our school resource officer program, which was implemented in our school from the onset. It has been a pleasure for me working with our SRO officers in partnership with students, staff, parents, and community on a wide number of initiatives. I have always been a strong believer of working collaboratively and cohesively with various stakeholders by taking a proactive and preventative approach with our safe schools and wellness initiatives so that students and staff feel welcome, safe, and supported in an enriching school environment in order for them to reach their fullest potential. I would like to highlight some of the outstanding initiatives and in partnerships with our school resource officer at our school. Grade 9 orientation and frosh week, supporting the transition into high school. Welcome back assemblies, safe schools assemblies, smile camps, music camps, we day, Terry Fox runs and celebrations, cancer fundraisers, basketball tournament hoop dome, the IPI program, remembrance day assemblies, parent workshops for parents, parenting your teen, cyberbullying and internet safety, and keeping our children safe. School dances and special events, Peace Builders International Initiatives, Restorative Justice Circles, the Unity Conference Gender-Based Violence Prevention Program, our International Pink Day Celebrations, which are annual events in partnership with our Toronto Police Partners, EGAL and PFLAG, our White Ribbon Campaign, Violence Against Women Awareness, our video gaming during lunch hours, our art competitions, Raising Awareness, Violence Against Women, and even our art focus this year has expanded to now include a miniature painting club solely run by our school resource officer. One minute. Our, school, our school resource officer also runs our Dungeons and Drags and carries on through the summer. Each, year, each SRO brings his or her strengths, interests, and abilities to support our school and community it serves. I've per personally witnessed this each year for 10 months of the year, six hours a day, five days a week. 
SROs have worked hard to, to break down stigma and barriers, building trust and forming relationships. Students and staff feel very comfortable in speaking with the SRO. On few occasions, students have come into situations and turned directly to the SRO because of the relationships and trusts that have formed, and the situations have been dealt with in a manner respectfully and keeping dignity intact. We have worked hard with our police partners to make this work so that students thrive academically, socially, and emotionally. The first and foremost responsibility we have as educators is to ensure that our schools are welcoming, inclusive, and safe for our children. It is an expectation and a right that students learn in a positive, safe, and enriching environment, and this is a shared responsibility. Yes, I'm sorry, it is time. Thank you. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, colleagues, questions? Uh, just a quick question. I, I, I spoke to uh, uh, one of the executive of your administrators association um, yesterday. Uh, you have a very favorable experience, but you, you mentioned some of the things that the SRO is involved in are uh, things like uh, um, uh, events that are, are in partnership with the GAL and, and organizations like that. There was actually someone here earlier today who does extensive work with a GAL and yet was here saying she would rather police officers were not in schools. Are, are you in favor of, there seems to be inconsistency even within organizations. So. Do you support us proceeding with the study? You're, um, you're supported I, the program now, but should right. we study it? I think we certainly need to look at um, the value of relationships and the what is a community. Because if, uh, if we're listening to students and we're listening to parents and educators, um, every community is uh, unique in its own way. And at, in a school, uh, we value the students that come walking through our doors. And we can see the changes uh, over demographics over the years. We have a wide range of students at the school. I grew up in the community. And so, um, but that's changed 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even today. So if we take the time um, that we get to know our students, the students get to know us, and we're working with various community partners, including our SRO program um, and the other supports we have in the school, we work together with our parents, with our communities. It's amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Melanie Wilson. Uh, Melanie, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute uh, signal. Um, I'm actually at your Marin, and I'll be taking or switching spaces with Mel. Um, I have an infant to pick up at uh, 6 o'clock. Okay, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute signal. Um, first of all, again, my name is Akia Maroon. I'm a human rights advocate here in Toronto. Um, I sit on the Provincial Roundtable on Violence Against Women. Um, I am the chair of the board of uh, Pride Toronto. I'm, I'm the chair of the board of Maggie's Toronto Sex Workers Action Project. I sit on the board of Pride Toronto, um, and I am the director of the Toronto Child Care Collective. I'm number 57 on the list. Thank you. Um, I'm here with my daughter. She's nine years old, and when she heard this morning that I was coming here to address you, uh, she insisted that she come and she wrote a little speech while we sat there. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why I'm here to talk is I'm, I'm a parent. I'm a parent of two kids, two black kids, and one of the things I've heard people talk about are their own opinions, but not of the kids. Um, so nobody here is talking about the kids, and this is what um, is directly, um, they have a direct representation and de definite stake in this matter. Um, first to commence with, my opinion is that we need to remove the SRO program completely, not review it. Um, the people who are... You know, I've been witness, I've seen, I've heard of the people who were bused here by the Toronto Police Services to take up space when parents and children were, uh, were waiting outside. That is not okay, first of all. Um, and I definitely want to talk about the fact that um, our kids don't feel safe. And as a parent, I, have, I talk to my kids about consent. I talk to the pro, provin, on a provincial level about consent, and I'm not consenting to the police to be in the schools with my kids. I don't feel safe, and they don't feel safe. If you want to change the relationship between police and kids, 
Do it on your own terms. Don't put them in our schools and force our kids to have to witness that and force our kids into a situation where there's an armed police officer in our school. And yes, it can be intimidating. Um, someone here was talking about Egale and stuff. I sit on a constant level with these people. I know where the position of some of these organizations are. And let me tell you. One minute. Police for the black and brown community, in my opinion, you need to overhaul it. And this is not where it starts. It's not with our kids. Start with the parents, start with the adults, start with the relationship that you build and that you are responsible for within our community. Start building accountability and trust. Leave our kids alone. Good evening, my name is Emily Royal, and I am a nine-year-old grade four francophone student. I'm here to talk about why police officers should not be in schools. I believe that unless it's an emergency, police officers should not be in schools because it doesn't feel safe. Many kids don't feel safe with police officers with his gun and taser and handcuffs. Well, I don't. In my school, when kids misbehave, they get a fiche de réflexion. This is a way to learn from their mistakes and to do better next time. There are better ways to, better ways, safer ways, and other ways that don't include police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Colleagues, questions, Mayor Tory. I just want to ask you, you've heard some of the other opinions from a wide range of people today that are, diff that are different than yours. And do you not feel that a review of the program, rather than just saying well, we should cancel it, is a fair way to sort of take into account your opinion, but also the opinion of a lot of these other people we've heard from? As you know, the Mayor of Toronto, I bring it back to consent. There was no consent from the community at large to have officers in, in our schools. And that's a very, very basic understanding of consent. We did not say it was okay to have officers in our schools with our children. We're telling you that our children don't feel safe. Um, I'm telling you that most and majority of the people who I see up here are not the type of people who would be um, carded, racially profiled, or have any kind of interaction with the police officers. You and I both know that. Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Uh, when you say they don't feel safe, what, yes. what, what do you mean? What, what's the why don't they feel safe? Let me ask my nine-year-old. Do you want to answer that question? Why don't kids feel safe in schools? Well, because of the history of violence that yes, happened. She's not reading that, by the way, just so that you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, in the history of violence that happened over the years, not just in America, in Canada, a six-year-old got arrested or misbehaving to her teacher, just not listening. And that shouldn't, and there's other ways to handle that. She insisted that she come here. She was told that the mayor is gonna be here, the chief of police is gonna be here, and this table is gonna be here. Yeah, there's a follow-up question. Um, yes. When you were mentioning, I'm sorry, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Right? Emily. Emily, um, when you were mentioning about the six-year-old, how did that make you feel? Are you talking about the six-year-old who was handcuffed yeah. in the school? What were some of your friends saying about that? Um, he was, she was, they were handcuffed at school for misbehaving to their teacher or not listening to their teacher. What did the kids in your school and like your age, what did you think about that? Well, it was sad. It was sad. Six-year-olds shouldn't be arrested. Councillor Carroll, did you have a question? This is your opportunity, Board. Just, uh, just very quickly, I, I've been reluctant to put people on the spot all day, but, but uh, one of the, the most compelling things for me last month um, was conversation about uh, uh, um, the presence of officers in the school on a regular basis was leading to an over, uh, over inquiry and over reporting of undocumented. Absolutely. And I'm wondering if you, uh, if you, if you anecdotally. 
Absolutely. No I can speak on um, studies that have been done um, with um, sex workers. I can do, I can talk about studies that have been done with kids um, in the schools. And I can let you know that right now, the police officers um, purview um, in the um, provincial legislation or the provincial document that you have to work with actually says that an officer may report an immigration status. And Toronto police actually, as a Currently, um, they report instances of um, immigration um, or non undocumented people to um, the higher ups, right? To immigration, absolutely. Um, we have had situations um, in Toronto where I believe three kids were held until their parents came to get them, and then their parents were um, deported. Guys, come on now. That's not okay. And kids are not going to want to go to school if this is if this continuously happens, right? Questions, colleagues? Thank you very much, both of you, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Stephen Bain. Uh, Stephen, uh, three minutes, and I'll give you a, a one-minute warning. Works? It is. It works. Should have went to the bathroom first. Um, I've been an educator for 27 years. I've been in the Scarborough Board. I guess it's now the Toronto District School Board. Um, I've been at different schools. I've been the Carry and Save School Administrator for the whole Southeast region. I've been at schools where kids have been marginalized and been racialized, and they have been treated fairly by probably a lot of adults that they work with, probably including the police. The incident that I wanted to bring up to your attention to make you think about this was, um, and I know you've heard positive stories and um, negative stories about officers being in schools. My story has to do with a school that I went to where there was a bad, um, relationship with 41 Division in my school, and uh, black students in the school did not trust police at all. There was um, something that happened in the community where a lot of arrests were made, and it was a very sort of violent arrest, and, and things that the officers had to do to sort of contain that situation. So there was a lot of mistrust. We had an SRO come to our school who was um, a black officer. Um, within, I would say, a week, I had six um, black students come into my office and tell me the officer was racist and he had um, a negative view of them as black youth. I spoke with the officer to ask him why that the kids would have that perspective. He told me that he believed that um, those youth were representing his community um, improperly. And so that's what he felt was the issue with it. So a lot of work to be done. Um, Fast forwarding, because I know I don't have a lot of time. The end of it was that the officer's perception of those students and their perception of that officer did change, so there was a positive relationship. They worked together to build a fence. I know this doesn't sound like much or very something significant, but they worked together to build a fence that bordered onto our school property that had been damaged over the years, vandalized. And it's kind of funny, like with all those fences in the area with the graffiti on it and the tagging and whatnot, that fence is still pristine today. And it was, uh, it was something that was built together with the officer and with those students at my school. So should the program continue? I would say yes. Does it need to be reviewed? I would say yes. Um, one thing that I would like this group to think about um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. So a quick one. One of my jobs was doing violent threat risk assessments. And I don't want to be a fear monger here, but um, I really, really want you to take into consideration, and I, and I don't like bringing this up, but I don't want ever to see a Columbine happen in one of my schools. And I don't ever want to think that we removed an armed officer from the school and then that happened. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that to, to um, be a fear monger, but having done violent threat risk assessments in our board, the number of kids that are troubled, that are moving on that path, says to me that it, it will happen one day. And God, God help me for saying that. Thank you. 
Colleagues, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lisa McGigan, uh, John uh, uh, Donofiro, and Francis Lieberman. And that is, uh, oh, sorry, Francis Lieberman Catholic High School. Are they still here? Okay. Uh, Carl Gardner. Carl, three with a one minute warning. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me again. My name is still Carl. I'm still with Known as Legal Toronto. Um, at Known as Legal Toronto, we work with many students and parents with precarious or no immigration status. Of the estimated 500,000 non-status migrants currently living, working, and going to school in Canada, it's believed that at least 200,000 actually live in the GTA. And so, as, an organ as representing an organization that works closely with non-status migrants and youth, known as Legal Toronto calls for the immediate suspension of the school resource officer. We need schools, we need police out of our schools. There have already been two reviews of this program done by the TPS, right? We've already done the research, and there are still, there are still fundamental issues with this program, so they have no place in our schools. Placing police, police officers in schools does not make non-status non -status students safer. It does not protect them and it does not serve them. It was just over 10 years ago in 2007 that the TDSB passed a don't ask, don't tell policy to protect non-status students from fearing discovery, immigration detention, and deportation while in school. This policy was in response to an unprecedented attack on undocumented youth in our city. In 2006, Gerald and Kimberly Lasana Souza, brother and sister from Costa Rica, were dragged out of the school by CBSA officers, held as bait for the rest of their family, and soon deported. The CBSA, after, after you know, youth and community members uh, and teachers and parents all organized to get the TDSB to pass this policy, the CBSA also agreed not to enter schools instead of in, only in ext uh, extenuating circumstances. However, due to the collaboration between the Toronto Police and the Canada Border Services Agency, the SRO program violates the TDSB's policy and betrays the countless non-status students who are attending Toronto schools. As a, a report that I co-authored in 2015, which you guys have all seen, de provides empirical proof of this relationship between the police and the CBSA. Recently, we found that the Toronto Police have called the CBSA 7,500 7, times in the last two years. Additionally, a report given to the board by Chief Saunders in February actually outlines the collaboration between the uh, Toronto Police and CBSA when it states, quote, the service consulted with CBSA and has been informed that they rely on the ongoing support of police agencies to assist in achieving their mandate, end quote. So SROs are uniquely positioned to gather this sensitive data under the guise of building relationships. They are placed in schools almost exclusively with high numbers of poor racialized immigrants in them, and the information gathered by SROs is liable to be shared by this, to the CBSA, putting non-staff students at risk. In an end-of-year 2011 report, the Toronto Police actually state that, quote, a weekly tactical intelligence strategy meeting brings together frontline enforcement, intelligence, GTA enforcement partners, and other stakeholders, including the CBSA, to share information. The school resource officer is now a permanent member of the weekly tactical intelligence strategy meeting, end quote. So for almost 10, so for as, almost as long as the SRO program has existed, there have been regular con they've been re in regular contact with the CBSA. It is therefore impossible to gauge about how many students have actually been affected by putting police in our schools. And so, just to conclude, because it has been proven that the Toronto Police continue to profile and check the immigration status of racialized migrants, because the TPS has admitted that discussions occur weekly between SROs and the CBSA, and because there is no empirical evidence that placing police in schools will keep non-status students or any students safer, known as Illegal Toronto echoes the many other groups and individuals to here today in calling for the immediate removal of the SRO program. Thank you. Um, Carl, thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions for Carl? Okay. Thank you. Um, Justin Rogers. Justin Rogers, Janine Chung. Uh, quiet, please. Could we just uh, concentrate on the deputants? Um, 
Thank you for coming. How many speakers uh, do we have here? Just one, two? Okay. Um, we'll give you a little bit more, than, uh, but I'll, I'll give you a, kind of four minutes, so. Thank you. Um, my name is Justin Rogers. I have the privilege to be a teacher. Uh, specifically, I teach student leadership. Um, it's, it's different in that it gets us out of the room, uh, out of the building and out of the hallways and provides a lot of experiential learning. Our school resource officers, uh, Craig Davies and Christy Klukas, have been a big part of these programs and, and they're wonderful. I have a script here that I was gonna read about all the different programs, but I do believe that uh, um, Ms. Greenaway from York Memorial emphasized how much can happen in a building, so I'll just leave that alone and not read it. I think the wonderful thing about this room right now is that there's one thing that we do share, and everybody is here for youth, and, and I, I think it's um, youth at a, a critical age and a critical stage. Um, and, and I think that's wonderful. Our, our school motto is uh, to love and to serve. And, and it is different than protect and serve. But I think that's where maybe the teenagers come in. Um, again, I think that that service part is why we're here on behalf of the SROs. Uh, Constable Davies and Klukas gave countless hours and time, uh, volunteer time, for, and, and they started programs. They didn't just contribute to them. I think um, the best voices in here are not the adults, but rather the students. And I'm, I'm going to ask that they have an opportunity to speak. So this, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, um, but this is Stella and behind me, um, Aaron and Jordan, Mary, Jason, and, and our principal, Nadia Young. And, and they're here because they participated in the programs. Uh, that the SROs were a big part of. And, and I will say that the programs can still continue, but they will not be as good without the SROs because of their involvement. Thank you. Good day. Um, I just want to share my experience with the SROs. Honestly, like I understand where the other sides are coming from, but at the same time, if you think about it, the youths and the children are the future. We need to have a strong base right now so we can have a better future. If we connect really well with the police officers, we'll definitely have a better future with them later on. I have had amazing experience with them. I did so many programs with them and I have learned a lot from them. I, I came from Nigeria and when I came from Nigeria, I didn't know how to ride a bike or do a lot of sports. But I joined a program called um, Joy Ride with them and I learned how to ride a bike literally in like three weeks, or no, four weeks, but like a day in a week, and I got a bike out from that. Like, if they take that away from us or take that away from our community or our schools, like, there's so many other kids that are coming behind me that might not get to have that experience. Like, it would really, really hurt me and really, really hurt other kids if they could take this away from us. I personally love our SROs, and I have had such strong connection with them, and I have gained, like, I have, I can't even explain how, how much they've really influenced me or, like, partake in my life like it's honestly unbelievable like I just can't keep going like you guys might just see them as that police officer in the you know in the uniform with the badge on his chest or something but I see way beyond that and that's what we all need to see we all need to see that they're not just that guy or that man in that police uniform they're a person just like us and they are willing to help if you come close to them but if you don't I mean like the saying goes if you take, you can force a horse to a river, but you can't force it to drink. Like if you just try your best to come close to them and understand them, you'll know they're not just that guy in the uniform or that man that is willing to hurt you because of your color or your whatever it is people think they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Shelley? Uh, just a quick question, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but the, the, the most recent deputy was talking about uh, uh, reporting from inside schools about undocumented. And I, and I asked, because when we were talking about this issue at City Hall, Mother Teresa is out Eppingham Way, and there were people who came to make deputations about Sanctuary City from that neighborhood. 
So are you aware of any over-reporting or over-status checking through your school? I am not aware. This is my first time hearing this. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. I'm Any other questions, answer. colleagues? I can, I can say the same thing as an administrator. First time that I, I heard about that. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. We really appreciate it. Yes? Yeah, um, yeah, no, we, it's... If, if, if it's okay, I, I, respect, um, I respect all, all parties here. And the, the only thing I can say is that for four years, we've had an SRO, and prior to that, we have not. And, and we can talk about lots of statistics and, and these, these great quantities of numbers, but um, if I could just mention maybe two things that happened prior to the SROs that did not happen after them being in our building. And one was uh, the impact of what it means to teach a student that's been murdered, um, and, and, and that's tough. And the second one is to be teaching while there's loaded weapons in the, in the building. And, and, but the only thing I, I want to stress is that it hasn't happened since they've been here. And, and it, it's, it's, it's not the presence that I want to stress. It's the programming. It's them being involved and going above and beyond. And if I could just emphasize the importance of who you, who you hire as these SROs, and, and, and I'm sure there's fantastic candidates, but the, these things make a big difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, and thank all of you for coming. We appreciate it. Um, Ed Molino, uh, Gabrielle Klug, and uh, Lashane uh, Mangahas. Sorry, I'm screwing that up. Is that group here? Okay. Uh, Zainab Goodwin, Godwin. Uh, Mohammed uh, Shak, Nathan President, okay, uh, Jimmy Henry, Margarita Minovich, Sorry. Hi, you, um, you are Margarita Minovich. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Hi, um, I am a social worker with the Toronto District School Board. I've been a social worker for 26 years. I've been with the TDSB 10. I am an immigrant. I'm also part of various marginalized communities that is not apparent looking at me. Um, and I very much respect everybody in this room and I've seen many, many things in my career. But to speak specifically about the SROs, um, I work at Northview Heights Secondary School, which is on the corner of Finch and Bathurst. It's an extremely diverse school. We have 1,700 kids in the school. Um, and I'll just give you, I'm not gonna give you statistics. I'm not gonna give you sort of generalized things. I'm just gonna give you very specific situations that I've encountered as a social worker in the school. This is what um, our SROs, and we've had several over the last um, 10 years, this is what they've assisted with. Um, we have kids who have um, very abusive households that they come from that they need to leave. Kids need to go home to get their belongings before they move out to a shelter. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, it's my daughter calling, sorry. Um, so kids need to go back home to be able to get their belongings. Because everything that's been said here, I'm not going to repeat, everything is about relationship building. And SRO, we have an amazing one right now. She's been there for three years, Cindy Pepper. So Cindy establishes relationships with the kids. They adore her. Um, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of gender identity, regardless of any of those things, she's able to build rapport. 
So kids are able to come to her and say, I need you to come with me when I get my belongings so you can keep the peace and my mother doesn't yell at me and my father doesn't throw things at me. And she does. She'll do that after hours. She'll do that on her own time. She'll go and keep the peace so kids can get their belongings in order to go to the shelter. Uh, nothing, yes, one, one minute. minute. Nothing ha much has been mentioned about sexual assault. I cannot tell you how many, I would say 70% of the cases that I deal with as a, as a social worker are cases of sexual abuse and sexual assault of females, of female students. I cannot tell you how many times having a police officer who loves, truly loves the kids and who the kids trust that I can go to her with a girl and we can sit there and Cindy can just explain to her everything that there is to know about reporting or not reporting, everything that she will face if she does go to court and all of those things. And nothing is, sure, nothing is sugar-coated. The truth is spoken and the girl can make informed decision about how to proceed. I cannot tell you how many times I've come to her about um, cases of... I'm sorry, I'm just... It's my daughter. <laughs> Um, about, um, she works with the most vulnerable of students. Um, she is an amazing source of information. Domestic violence, I cannot tell you how many times I sit with a kid with her. And depending on how, however old the kid is, we talk about CAS, no CAS, police involvement, no police involvement. And she'll just tell the truth. And the kid is left feeling reassured and calm. And we can make decision how to move forward. And it's all because of relationship building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colleagues, questions? Any questions, colleagues? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Caden Panetta. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, you the three minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for taking the time here to hear my deputation. Uh, my name is Caden Panetta, and I stand here today to speak passionately about the SRO program and the impact it has on students. I'd like to tell you a story about a girl named Stephanie. Stephanie was, about all accounts, a very fortunate teenager girl in South Otoko. She had beautiful, long brown hair who loved to dance and play soccer. She was raised in a traditional family setting in the strong religious views. She was uh, the typical upper middle class daughter with, with an iPhone, Tiffany jewelry, expensive makeup, and designer clothing. She was very lucky to have such loving parents, um, soon into a new relationship with another girl. She found herself stuck living with her parents who did not approve of the relationship, to say the least. Her bloggings were locked up, bank account frozen, and soon had lost her phone, which is very, which is every teenager's worst nightmare because of Stephanie's family's religious views. She found herself kicked out of her parents' house and couch surfing because her family completely shut the door on her and didn't want any contact with her. Um, that is when Stephanie met her SRO, not because she was guilty of any criminal, anything criminal, not because she was a gang member or even a B student, but because she was in need of some serious help. Stephanie was living in the same few pieces of clothing only that she found in her backpack. She didn't have her proper winter coat, snow boots, or even a toque. This SRO took it upon himself to go above and beyond to make sure Stephanie didn't follow through with her strong thoughts of suicide. She was suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicidal thoughts. Stephanie's world had crumbled completely around her. She was only 17 years old when, and had only little life experience. She was unable to understand how much pro trouble she was in, not knowing what resources were out there. Who had, she had to, how to find a job, how to get a place to live, and in reality, working on the streets was what was gonna happen. Stephanie and the officer worked together to find a job at the local restaurant. The officer took Stephanie down to Ontario Works and set her up with a caseworker to help with assistance. But Stephanie found herself in a tough spot. She had run out of clo uh, couches to crash on. She had no money and no money to even rent a hotel or even a small apartment. So the officer offered her um, to help even further. He one had minute, a spare room. He had a spare room in the basement of his own house and the house where he and his wife and his newborn lived. He took it upon himself to help Stephanie when she needed it the most, gave her a warm place to sleep and surrounded her with a family that she most desperately needed. He was my support system the entire time and if he wasn't for him, I don't think I'd be standing here today making this deputation. That's right, I was born Stephanie. I was, um, I can't imagine where I could be without this officer. I may have, uh, or what I may have done if it wasn't for him that, to help me. 
if he too could have judged me like my parents or shunned me with my family, but he welcomed me into his house, into his life, and made sure that a child on the break point of her life was able to blossom into his life. And I, started, I stand here proudly to say thank you to him, to the police officer service, and to the school resource officer program. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Sam Iskander, uh, the principal of Silverthorne Collegiate. Sam, thank you for coming. Three minutes, one minute warning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my colleague Susanna Greenaway went through everything that the officers do at the school, so I'll just give you a couple of examples of other things that happen at our school. When the officers build the relationship, we've been a school that has had an SRO right from the beginning. One of the students who was involved in gangs and wanted to know what it would be like to get out, obviously did not want things to people to know, so he approached me and says, can the officer talk to me if there is something that we can do? We, I called him down, he came into my office, the officer non-threatening in any way, showed him a video that was brought in from uh, the gang's force, gang's task force, just to show him, let the young man speak. Whether the young man got out of gangs or not, I don't know, but the path was there and the opportunity was there for this young man to at least fulfill what he wanted to know, the information he wanted. One of the other things that happens is Parents that now know the officers, because they've been a big part of the school, they come to school council, they come to parents' night, so they know that they're there. When they first start, it's like, why do you have a police officer in the school? And then we talk about it. Some of the things that they have done on more than one occasion is a parent wants, their, wants the officer to speak to their kids if they continue on a certain path. And so you'll hear from the officer, well, if you continue in this way, here's what court costs would, would be to your family, here's where it ends up, here's the record that would happen. And kids get a good sense of what's going on. Nothing threatening, just that relationship to just have that conversation one-on-one -on -one with that officer. That same officer comes up to our camp that we do once every year for a week in Perry Sound with our great tens and gets involved in that leadership camp that goes on. So he is aware of all the kids and the kids are aware of him. Gets into the classrooms, as you've, as you've heard, regularly in the grade nine classroom, uh, talk about cyberbullying, alcohol and drug prevention, uh, to our law classes about the Charter of Rights. One about, minute. About what goes on uh, in, in policing. So, it, all in all, it has been an extremely positive influence in, in my time that I've been a vice principal and principal at Etobicoke Collegiate and at Silverthorn uh, out in the West End. The police officers have always been there and they've built the community relationships where we even got them to involve other police officers to go out in the community and cook with families and, and in buildings. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, colleagues? Thank you so much. Uh, Tony Aguello, uh, Nadia uh, Pasquini. Thank you very much for coming. And um, uh, three minutes, as you've heard, and I'll give you a one minute warning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tony Ogello, and I am a secondary school principal with the Toronto Catholic District School Board. First of all, before I start, I'd like to say that I respect everybody's opinion here. I'll be speaking from my experience with the SRO program. This is my colleague, uh, Nadia Pasquini, who is a teacher on staff at the school and works in close conjunction with our school SRO officer. We both thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the SRO program and to share the positive collective reality we both have experienced. I have been a secondary school administrator with the Toronto Catholic District School Board for the last 16 years. Nine of those years, I have been fortunate to have an SRO assigned to my school community. 
I found the program to excel in fostering positive relationships. I found it to be a valuable educational source in the school. And I've also found it to provide an engaging mentor for students to build community with. A bit of our current reality. A school resource officer with us is at Chaminade College is a vital member of our school community. In the past years, our SRO has contributed to the positive, safe, and cohesive learning community and environment at Chaminade College. He has made a significant impact in our community and in particular with our students. Our SRO, Peter De Quintal, has played a critical role in the various leadership activities at our school, such as the Working Against Violence Every Day, the WAVE program, and numerous educational partnerships with our feeder elementary schools, such as giving workshops on cyber bullying awareness and cycling safety, just to name a few. His presence in the school is welcoming and an incredible example of grassroots building of public trust and relationship building. He is an exemplary role model for the students at the school and he offers numerous opportunities directly to the students such as securing a guest speaker, such as Sarah Wells, who's an Olympic medalist, to present the I Believe in Myself program at the school this last spring. One minute. In, in particular, he's well known for Star Wars breakfast, where he engages students while preparing Star Wars toast and waffles for the students uh, weekly at the school. RSORO is an integral part of our community. Um, we've been fortunate to have such a unique individual at Chaminade. He has intertwined himself in the culture of our school and has become a loved member of our brotherhood that characterizes our school. Last year, uh, we were told that we may lose the position of an SRO, and I think a true testament of what goes on in our school and the value he has is when the whole school community takes on uh, social media and puts it out there um, requesting that the position be brought back to our school. We hope, we hope that you consider our appeal uh, to facilitate our request for the continuation of the SRO program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you waiting much. around. Um, where am I? Josue uh, Mange? Sorry, I apologize. Uh, Sorry, it's a <laughs> perhaps you could Sorry. introduce yourself properly. I apologize. All right. Um, so my name is Josue Monge. I'm 18 years old. I'm of El Salvadorian and Guyanese descent. And I'm here to tell you all about my firsthand experience with the SRO program. My SRO was a woman by the name of Candy Graham. And I can tell you with complete honesty that this woman was one of the most influential people I have ever met. Officer Graham taught me that police aren't just unfeeling robots. They're mothers, fathers, women, men, daughters, sons, sisters, and brothers. They're people too, just like every one of us. And the more they connect with us, the students, the better. Officer Candy organized a pro program in our school called Cooking with Cops. Now at the time she organized this, my family wasn't in the greatest place financially. We were living paycheck to paycheck, and sometimes I didn't get a meal, right? So the Tuesdays and Thursdays when this program was running were some of my favorite days because I was guaranteed a meal that day, right? I looked forward, forward to it every day because I could get the meal and I learned how to cook and now it's one of my favorite things to do. It's, and I can thank Officer Candy Graham for that. So thankfully our situation isn't as bad anymore. We're still living paycheck to paycheck though, but Food is not an issue anymore. So Officer Candy made an, uh, an effort to make sure that she was there for absolutely everybody, regardless of age, race, gender, or sexuality. She, always she was always there to listen and provide support. She made me feel comfortable and safe, and she gave me as much love as a mother would give her child. Officer Candy is like a second, to me, second mother to me when I really think about it. Right. In a time where police and public relationships are tes tense, the SRO, the SRO program could potentially be one of the city's greatest assets. It taught me that police aren't to be feared. They're there to protect me and to serve me. They're, de they're there to make sure I get home at the end of the day, and I can be sure that they want to get home at the end of the day too. One minute. Right? So 
For those of you that don't agree with me and think SROs don't serve a purpose in our schools, don't make them any safer, I have one question for you all. What if they leave and what if you're all wrong? <laughs> Thank you very much. Colleagues, you. questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Leila uh, Veloci. Leila? No? Okay. Uh, Richard Gosling? Mr. Gosling was one of the originators, or the originator, of the school breakfast program back in the early 80s, and I think he's known to some of the people here. Um, he has uh, been involved in many children and police-related activities, and he was a strong supporter of the school okay. resource officer program. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Jamie Knox. Uh, Jamie, three minutes, and I'll give you the one-minute warning. <laughs> I'll try. Thanks. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, good evening. I'm here just to take a quick minute to address something uh, maybe a little bit different than what you've heard. You've heard from the students. You've heard from many community members, many uh, school administrators to talk to what SROs are doing for the communities. I want to address very briefly what my community did for me. Um, my community, I, when I was an SRO two years ago, I came into the program uh, a little bit exhausted. I came from a uh, mental health background where I was working with a crisis nurse and I was exhausted. It was a revolving door of, uh, you know, issues with the hospitals and, and struggling with people that are suffering from crisis. And I had a long talk with my boss before I took the position and he said, you know, are you sure? And I said, well, let me give it a go. I don't really know. So... I, uh, I got to Stephen Leacock Collegiate and it changed me. It changed me as a police officer. It allowed me an opportunity to get to know people, to actually get to know people. Um, unfortunately, as police officers, we go call to call to call to call and we don't have a lot of time to actually interact with people. Um, the SRO program afforded me that opportunity to actually interact. I'm no longer an SRO. I am now uh, four years into uh, what is now called the Neighborhood Officer Policing. But had it not been for my two years in the schools, I can guarantee you I wouldn't have had the success that I'm having now. Being an SRO gave me an opportunity to express a little bit of creativity, it, which you don't always get in policing. We have a lot of rules and a lot of things we have to follow and a lot of uh, you know, regulations, and that's fine. But being an SRO gave me a little bit of wiggle room, gave me an opportunity to use some of my schooling in the culinary arts and to express some of the things that are important to me, like women's issues and leadership programs, and I was able to be a little bit creative. Um, being an SRO absolutely catapulted my career <coughs> direction. I will never not work in a position where I am not involved directly with the people in my community. I am involved in my community. I spend a lot of time there, and I can tell you that the people in my community, they know me, they all know me, um, and, and that means a lot to me to be able to go into people's houses, sit down in their kitchens, have a cup of coffee with them, and talk to them about whatever the issues are, even if they're mad at the police, even if it's a difficult conversation that needs to happen. This is a thing that recharged my career and changed how I interact with the community, which in a climate of today, everybody's calling for change from our police and change in how we're interacting with the community, change in how we are doing business. These kinds of jobs allow officers to make that change in themselves. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, uh, Dennis Kishinro. Dennis? Oh, thank you. Sorry, we finally got to you. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but it didn't seem fair to, uh, but thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, this good afternoon, everyone. The only reason why I'm here is just because I have a visitation of some parents that um, requested that I should come and help them out or talk on their behalf. And um, 
Some young people came to our group last two weeks and they, make, um, they made a presentation and I was there again. At the end of the day, the group said, well, you are an educator, you should go and do this. And um, the first parent that, um, family that got me into this is the Manning's family. In 2007, I was at um, that school, Jeffrey, when the incidents happened, because I was pulling students from that school and some other schools to do media literacy program. So that's where I got connected to some of these families. The issue they had at first now was that they came crying. The police is using this boy's video to promote this meeting or what they do. They don't want that. They are very upset. Until this afternoon when I was coming, I was still with the aunt and I was telling her, don't worry, um, things will work out fine. The police might not be able to control the media but when the police now is using it in the, in the article, it affects this family greatly and it's not good. It's negative thing um, going on. Now, the culture of school boards are different. Catholic district school board, which I've seen a lot of them here, is different to um, Toronto Public School. The Catholic might be lucky to have a police in the school that through the pro-action money, they have helped them, uh, they have put program in the school and things happen. However, when you look at that, we have retired Ojotejo um, of 13th Division that did more than all this without being in the school, right? And we have new immigrants that are even scared of going to school today. So I'm the one that's responsible for all this, some of these immigrants now that are in the hotel, in shelters, in the areas, and um, I have to be talking to them. I'm trying to promote and tell them that they can be there. They're scared. They're coming from community countries that they're running away from police now. They see police locked up in a room. And another thing is that um, I've been invited to a school in the same Gin and Finch community that one of the boys in the community is in trouble, so I should secretly, they, told, they called me to the office and said, you have to go and help this guy because they have sent him to the station 31 division. And what happened at the end of the day, they are going to, to book him for all this kind of thing. And um, they found out to deal with situations like this through the police that was in the school. So that is something we have to look at. People can come in here and talk because they, they have relationship with all these police guys and all these things. I'm not involved with any group, with anybody. And this is the fact and things, I have a couple of things I put down, facts and the stories that I heard, that, that would be hearsay, but About I have 20 the seconds put here. down. One minute, good. 20 so, seconds. <laughs> what did you say? 20 seconds. 20 seconds, excellent, thank you. So, I mean, please, uh, if you are making decision to review or to do, do anything, um, research, Please put us in that group. Let us work with the group. Don't just pull people, companies that are getting paid to do it. They will put questions together to lead people into it. And if you want to scrap it and put other program outside, please do. Um, that's all I can say. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? Uh, Shelley, yeah, Councillor Carroll? We, we have a specific request. The, the name of your group? Um, I, well, <laughs> We're known as Carib Belka Enrichment Center, but it's Caribbean Global Missions. Yes, because you're not Dennis. I'm Dennis. <laughs> so you are Dennis. I am Dennis. I'm the, one, I'm the same guy you went to the school, um, to the um, community center with many years ago. But, but the person that I spoke to who said he was Dennis was not you. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. I am the one. You, but give us the full name of the, it again, it's the, of the center, so that we can follow Belka, up. Belka Enrichment Center, that's the one you know? Yes, yes. But yes. I am out of Belka now. It's, Belka is a, is a baby, it's a pretty name. And yes. um, Caribbean Global Mission is actually our charitable name. So I am now at that yes. group. Okay, got Monitoring it. Monitoring down. Got it, okay, so we'll follow up. Thank Dennis, you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for your patience, I'm sorry that it takes so okay. long. Uh, Belinda Long? Belinda Long, uh, Austin Souza Mugford, uh, uh, 
Jason Calero. So, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Which one are you? Um, I don't. I think I'm 59. Oh no, no, no. we're not quite there yet. Wait a second. Wait a second. So, Jason Calero, no. Uh, oh, Jason. Sorry. Jason, thank you. And um, I'm not Jason. You're not Jason. No. Okay. Well, it does wait, guys, until we're ready for you. So, uh, if Jason's not here, uh, Donardo Jones? No. Uh, ben Lau is not here. He's gone. Uh, Tom Bithoff is not here. Oh, yes, he was. Uh, Frank Tofina? Mandy Gala? John Smith? Okay. John, you're up. Oh, all right. Thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Now, <clears throat> am I in the starting blocks? Yeah, but as soon as you start presenting, I'll okay. punch the button here. Three minutes, one minute warning. All right. This is a case of a black child railroaded by the Toronto District School Board and the Toronto Police, whose negligence damaged his life. And this case points to why black students, I believe, it points to why black students are three times more likely to be suspended, three and a half times more likely to be carded, four times more likely to be charged. These are independently verified numbers. Now, I'd like the board, in considering this evidence, excuse me, sorry, what someone is drinking that, in considering this evidence, to consider my background. Um, I'd like you, in considering this evidence, to note that I went to law school, but pursued investigative journalism, and one of my investigations into systemic problems with bias in the Nova Scotia justice system was honored by the Canadian Bar Association with my award presented by Mr. Tory, your friend, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. My documentary findings were confirmed by the Royal Commission into the railroading of another racialized youth, Donald Marshall Jr. And those findings in turn reaffirmed by one of the best judges in the history of Ontario, Court of Appeals Justice Mark Rosenberg. Now, in the case, that I'm speaking of, the victim is the firstborn son of a white man and a black woman. He looks African, like his mother. The other two boys look European, like their father. This case began when a white child came to a principal's office in Toronto with a nosebleed and a false accusation about being bullied by some boys in gym class. The white accuser identified the ringleaders as two other white kids and a black child. The principal didn't bother to walk 50 steps to the gym and speak with a dozen eyewitnesses. If he had, he'd have known, yes? Well, that the white accuser was in fact the aggressor that he sucker punched the black kid and got a nosebleed when the black child defended himself. The principal didn't bother to get the black child's statement or speak to the many witnesses. Why? Because we've conditioned too many school officials to frame adolescent conflict in terms of criminality and to be hair trigger calling the police. Okay, here the police reflexively called the SRO and reported only the accusation against the black child. And the accused white children were never investigated. What ensued? A concatenation of undue process, negligence, and most importantly, implicit bias that spun so far out of control it ended up in the Deputy Attorney General's Office of Ontario. And I can say, gentlemen, that I'm a party to this, and I would like to thank the board, the Police Board of Ontario, for the check you recently wrote to me for the lawsuit that I brought against you for negligence. 
Now, I would ask the board, because I actually have relevant Come evidence, on. not emotional evidence, that's been admitted by most of the people who were stacked into this meeting, which I have to say, with all due respect, has not been very well run. I have actual factual evidence and a great degree of expertise in this area. I would ask to, for a few more minutes to speak, if uh, the board John, would I'm be sorry, so you're, pleased you're, you're, I'll, I'll give you, speak. John, I'll give you, a, 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 I'll give you a, about 40 seconds. So really? For you to sum up, yeah. Jeez, you've had such a great day. Why give up now? <laughs> really? Go for it. Okay. So let me tell you what pursued after that. Okay? It wasn't just this one case, because here's what happens when you get tagged in the Toronto Police Service. Okay? My son was charged by a police officer for stopped for jaywalking. The police officer later was found to be not credible on the stand when amongst the other charges that she concocted against this black youth was that she could see 100 yards in the dark that there was no bell on his bicycle. Another time, a different police officer, a different police officer arrived on the scene when that black boy was hit by a white driver who had recent convictions for speeding and distracted driving. The police checked the records. Did they charge the white driver who hit the child on the bicycle? No, they charged the black child under the Highway Traffic Act. When the charge was thrown out for lacking any evidence, they were asked, the police officer and the prosecutor, why did they waste the court's time? And they said it's because the boy has got all these charges pending and he needs to be taught a lesson. And that is how this system can work. And I think at least a lot more than just a whole lot of I love my SRO statements taking up all this court's time. And I know. John, thank and I you. Know thank Mr. you, John. Pringle, I know, Mr. Pringle, and I know you, John Tory. There were people in my household who distributed a lot of literature for John Tory in Parkdale because we believe we needed a fair and reasonable person to be mayor of this city who had fairness in mind in every consideration as well as an eye to a budget. And even if this program has some benefits, it has some budgetary questions that need to be addressed. John, and I John, thank you. And I happily volunteer my time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Devin Galton, thank you, John. Um, oh, sorry, Ken. In, in your um, you know, description of what has happened, um, are you identifying, are you identifying, are you identifying anti-black racism as part of systemic anti-black racism as part of, of, of what happens in, in yeah. uh, I mean, So then you then you're aware you're aware of the city's um, you know committee the mayor have meetings some time ago and identified anti-black racism as part of, of what is happening here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I applaud any uh, progressive efforts within the city and the police service to examine these things fully and not to reflexively defend them and say that everything's fine. That's not how you run a good organization and that's why I voted for John Tory. Uh, Mayor Tory? Well, leaving that aside, sir, I, I assume then that, that, we're, that where we started with this a week ago, or a month ago was to have a review uh, and then today we supplemented the language to sort of say we would reach out to a huge number of people in every corner of the community to get views on, on this program. We've heard some of them today, but I assume, some, from different corners. I assume you don't have a problem. In fact, I, I think I heard you offer to help with it. I would offer to help, but I would recommend the first thing is you need to hear from more young black men. Yeah. <laughs> Message received. Thank you very Question much. Colleagues? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, uh, Jessica Scriver. Jessica Scriver. She was earlier, okay. Um, Devin Galton. 
Where's, oh. Is Melanie Wilson here? Yes. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Hello. Thank you. My name is Melanie Wilson. I am a TDSP teacher and parent. Today I'm here to speak on behalf of Educators for Peace and Justice. We are here alongside students, parents, and community members to urge the board and Mayor John Tory to amend the motion to eliminate the SRO program immediately and remove police from Toronto schools. As educators, our top priority is ensuring that all students have access to high quality learning opportunities and inclusive school communities. We know that many barriers exist and not all students feel safe or included in Toronto schools. We also know that the roots of these problems are deep and complex. However, you, the TPS board members and Mayor John Tory, have the power today to remove one significant barrier, and that is police in Toronto schools. We acknowledge that there are hardworking SRRs who have organized events, volunteered their time, connected with particular students and staff. But there is a reason that the students who don't feel safe around police are not here today. This is about well-documented systemic injustice and the lived experience of students in our care. This is about the impact that the mere presence of a police officer on the education of some of Toronto's most marginalized students. Sorry about that. For many students, police officers are associated with surveillance, harassment, and trauma. A police officer is more than an individual. In a uniform or not in a uniform, they are a symbol that is upsetting and threatening to many students. The fears that students and family experience are not imagined. They are founded, they are re real realities, and they are founded and backed up by data. We know that racial profiling continues to be a significant problem in Toronto policing. The SRO our program acts as a, oh sorry, uh, I've edited a lot because I've got three one, minutes. One minute. Um, sorry, so, uh, the SRO problem acts also as a barrier to education for undocumented communities. As we heard from No One Is Illegal and many other speakers today, the Education Act entitles students without legal status to education up to 18 years. Access goes beyond simply attending school, but also the right to feel safe in schools. We hear from our undocumented students that they are afraid to be in the same hallway as an SRO. These are students who are working their hardest to do well in school, seeking a better life in Canada. Yet they are intimidated every day by the presence of police officers in school. Both TDSB Director John Malloy and Chief Mark Saunders have committed to more surveys, but we are here to tell you that we don't need another study. From the 2008 uh, Faulkner Report, 30, 30 the 2017 seconds. Ontario Human Rights Commission Report, and the courageous voices of students and parents here today, the message is clear. Stop pouring public money into a system that criminalizes and intimidates students. We want more youth counselors. Youth counselors are being cut from my school right now and are being replaced by police officers. We don't need police officers to run bike programs and Dungeons and Dragons and whatever. We need people who are trained and have those skills who are safe and welcoming. We have people who live in the neighborhood who are quite capable of doing those things, who want to be in the schools, who can really genuinely meet the needs of students and are not, stu students are not fearful of them. We also know that, uh, Police don't make schools safer. In 2014, a student was tragically killed and stabbed at NACI, North Albion Collegiate Institute. And there was a police, there was an SRO stationed in that school. It's also, Columbine was brought up today. There was a police officer stationed at Columbine too when the student was shot. So police officers don't make our schools safer. There, it's an you. illusion of safety for some students and a major barrier to education for students who might need our help Thank you very the much. Most. Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> Colleagues, uh, are, there any, are there any questions for Ms. Wilson? Colleagues, any questions? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Have you got a written presentation, uh, Ms. Wilson? Have you got a written, could you uh, hand it in? Is that possible? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Devin Galton. Uh, oh. Uh, Andrea, uh, yeah, Andrea Vasquez Jimenez and Sylvia uh, Argentine uh, Eros. Okay. So you're Andrea? Thank you very much. 
So just let me know when my time starts because I want to time myself. Well, at, uh, uh, when you're ready, I will just, you do start and I'll, I'll push the button. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Andrea Oscar Jimenez, writing and speaking to you as co-chair on behalf of Latinx, Afro-Latin America, Avia Yala Education Network. We are firm in our stance and request that you commit to the full removal of the SRO program and the implementation of any other similar programs in the future. This is not an issue. For instance, in 2009, there were around 100 youth from Northern Secondary School protesting against the SRO program. Yet all these voices and countless others and their stories have been put to the side, delegitimized and even silenced to a culture of fear and silence. What we are speaking to today is not to suggest that review studies and or reports are, nece are necessary prior to the cancellation of the program. Instead, we are using the space to counter the potential use of anyone using the Toronto Catholic District School Board and Peel Report in support of the SRO program program. We are aware that the TCDSB has openly voiced our support of the SRO program. We're also aware of their strategic moves to only bring up one voice and bus pro SRO students and administrations only. Where are the other voices? With that stated, I, Andrea Vasquez Jimenez, coach of Lion, had a telephone interview yesterday and spoke with education reporter Andrea Gordon from the Toronto Star. I had mentioned to Gordon regarding a major concern of the misrepresentation and misleading information that occurs from studies, surveys, and or reports such as the TCDSBs in order to presume that their findings support the SRO program. Be aware that the TCDSB supported the SRO program is misleading and has a response letter to the TCDSB from education, not incarceration, states, quote, the call to continue the program is not founded on research or reports specifically pertaining to the perceptions of SROs. In fact, on June 13, 2017, Education Not Incarceration made contact with the TCDSB Safe Schools Office and confirmed that the Safe Schools Survey Secondary Comparative Review are the only surveys that they have. Ultimately, the TCDSB has committed unethical practices and have misrepresented the data. Since as stated in the letter, quote, it is crucial to repeat that the survey report in no way seeks to get information about the impact or effect of SROs, end quote, on page two. Contrary, contrary to the TCDSB, one, one these minute, findings are not in support of the SRO program must be dismissed due to its misrepresentation of data. Just as there was misrepresentation, unethical practices, and detrimental flaws within TCDSB findings, there's just as many issues within the report from Peel. Although the the full report is not yet available. A major concern is that in reality, in contrast to today's Toronto Star article stating that the Peel study and findings come from an independent study is indeed false. In fact, in the Peel Regional Police report titled Annual Report 2016, a safer community together, both Dr. Linda Duxbury and Dr. Craig Benell are directly quoted stating, I know that we are certainly proud to be your partner in evaluation of this program. Why are not local academics um, uh, used? Dr. George J. Sefa Day, Professor of Social Justice Education from OISE U of T, and as well Dr. Carl James have provided letters in support of removal of the SRO program. Ultimately, these findings are not usable and should not be used in support of your SRO program. Once again, we take a firm stance and request that you dismiss the TCDSB and Peel Report due to their unethical practices and actually care about our students, children, youth, and their families. Because if they and you truly did care, you would not put data, studies, findings, and or reports over those lived experiences who have been for so many years attempting to be heard, but you all have been silencing them and devaluing their stories and experiences. Thank you very much. A, a, a tour de force of delivery. Uh, colleagues, questions? Any questions? Okay. I would admire okay. questions. That way uh, we can get people do, who are you, uh, against have, the program. If, if you've got that written out, would you submit yes, it? Yes, and we're also going to be providing a Dr. George J. Sefade, which is a very internationally okay. known anti-racist educator, as well as Dr. Carl James. And if we are attempting to battle anti-black racism within not only our schools, but within the city of Toronto, we have to do something about this. We have to remove the SRO program. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, sorry, Ken. Um, so why do you think um, you know, some of the, the, the students who obviously experience have these negative experiences wouldn't come forward and speak? Well, just as the nine-year-old who eloquently stated it a lot better than any other educator that was here present, there's a historical violence between police. It's a historical systemic issue and it's very concerning and actually it puts people's integrity, even their leadership who are unaware of how these systemic issues are connected to this state, right? A school to prison pipeline, criminalization of all students but particularly black and indigenous people of color. Youth, our youth understand how they experience um, these negative impacts by police, and if these are not the voices that are being heard, it's up to you to make this 
chance and remove the SRO program. There is no neutral. You either remove it or you're, up, you're supporting it. Yeah, we, we, we had, um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the Police Services Board, we had conducted a transformational task force report which um, made many recommendations. However, they were, there wasn't, we didn't see a lot of people coming forward you know, with the kinds of um, comments that you have. Why is that? Well, I myself right now am not employed. I was employed previously with Legal Aid Ontario. I'm currently doing my MA in social justice education. So I'm not uh, afraid of my bread and butter, right? And like my political stance as an advocate, as an activism is very much transparent from my personal life to um, my academic life, to my activist life, all throughout. We have people in the Catholic School Board, such as Kirk Mark. Personally, he has advised us off the record that he is against the SRO program. However, professionally, as a coordinator for the Community Relations Department, advises, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. There is a culture of fear and a culture of silence, and these are the voices that a lot of you all are not listening to and are unable to because of this fear. Uh, Mayor Tori? Well, just, just so I'm clear on that, it, we heard a lot of people come forward today, and I, I've never met 99.9% .9 of them. Are they all, like, they, sh they showed up to say supportive things, and a lot of them were young people. Um, were they all then here under some intimidation or spell or something? Whether well, the thing is with the Toronto Catholic District School Board, actually, um, their community relations officer, Erica Aguilera, when we had called them out on anti-black racism, they provided a cease and desist. And we had to get a pro bono lawyer in order to do a response. And I've also, with George Day, in George, uh, sorry, George Day and another uh, person doing their PhD, and myself an MA candidate, we had done anti-black racism professional development at the Peel School Board. And a lot of educators, not only in the Peel School Board, take offense, personal offense. We are not talking about personal individual issues. We are talking about a systemic issue. And the lack of understanding that it is systemic very much warrants worries, such as the Toronto Catholic District School Board, only and strategically and politically aligning with a certain agenda by only bringing students, administration that are pro-SRO. Where are the bus filled with people who are against the program? Where are the bus filled that have had negative impact from the Toronto Catholic District School Board? We have already spoken with the Director of Education, Angela Gautier, from last year, talking about our three-year action plan as LAEN for full removal of SROs. Nothing has been done. When is something going to be done? Someone has to take a stance, and we truly hope that Mayor John Tory and the Toronto per uh, uh, personnel here take the stance. Right. Any other questions, colleagues? Again, thank you both very much. Uh, Maxine uh, Newbold. Uh, Maxine, uh, three minutes. I'll give you a one-minute warning. Thanks. I'm Cyrus. Maxine had to leave because this is taking a really long time. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, so are you speaking on, on her behalf? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So I just want to start by saying that we actually want the motion amended. We want a full removal, not a review. Um, I'm very disheartened by the fact that it took until 6.30 p.m. to actually hear the word anti-black racism and a discussion about the impact of the SRO program on black children. We're seeing our children being brutalized. We're seeing five-year-olds being handcuffed in school. I have a five-year-old daughter who's in the TDSB. Unlike the Toronto Catholic Dis District School Board children who were bused in to try to stack the deck for the conversation, um, my child goes to a TDSB school and she has witnessed firsthand police brutality. So her fear that she has around the police in our community comes based on her experience and no SRO program or pizza or cops or barbecue is going to take away from what she witnessed at five years old. Um, we've only been talking today about pizza and cookouts and basketballs, and I think that those programs are not things that we're against. Other people can provide those. People who aren't wearing guns can provide those services to our communities. My mother um, was a high school teacher in a TDSB school that was an SRO school, 
and I know the kinds of supportive programs that she tried to set up in her school that she was constantly trying to find funding for, that she couldn't find funding for, and then I see that we're spending $2 million, $2 million on an SRO program, and I think that this is completely out of whack. It's also predicated on the idea that we don't quite know why there's poor relations between police and some of the, stu the students in the schools. We know why it's related to anti-black racism, and that this program is predicated on the idea that in the future when we have further conflict with the law, which is an assumption, that there will be better relations because we've seen police officers around our school. I think we need to challenge that. There's also extensive research that suggests that even when students have a great relationship with a police officer in their school, it doesn't change their overall perception of the police in general. So that actually isn't really working. Um, we know that uh, this meeting today has gone quite poorly. It seems like you've only uh, chosen certain people to kind of be in the room and to speak. You've stacked the deck. You've strategically avoided discussion and follow-up questions from brilliant speakers. Uh, I am a PhD myself. You could listen to me, but there are people much more brilliant than I who you asked no questions to. Educators who came with statistics uh, and information. Uh, so anyone who is speaking in a critical way to the SRO program, thanks so much for the timing. I'm Thanks for timing me. Um, anyone who is critical of the SRO program and didn't get any questions asked of them. So it seems clear that you don't really want to hear from us. So what we have instead is a petition with a thousand names of people who are in support of removing the SRO program from our school. And I know you like to have written depositions. So here is a quote from a student who had an experience of an SRO in their school. And you can take this as my deposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, any question. questions? Ken, you have a question? And yeah. Shelley, Ken first. Um, Thanks. You, 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 mentioned, you made mention of um, what some folks would refer to as, like myself, as the black elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, and, and because there's a need for people to understand the systemic anti black racism, do you think that doing a full um, consultation where that is out there? so that we can address it and, um, and look at ways in which we can deal with that in a positive way and make that happen? Do you not think that that would be a, a way to do that? Well, because I think, nobody wants to talk about it. I much. think we absolutely need to talk about anti-black racism within the school system and within the police system and how those are coming together as a nexus within this SRO program. However, we know that the SRO program, studies are showing that the SRO program are not making our schools safer or more secure. Somebody just spoke about that. So what we instead need to do is talk about a, a rehauling. We, we don't need more studies and research. We don't need another review. We need something different that doesn't involve having armed police officers in our schools because the, dis the results have been disastrous. And I think that uh, a review is a dangerous side tactic that distracts us from the conversation of actually setting up something different. What I meant was um, having more voices heard about you. Yeah. Absolutely. We needed, to have, we, we needed to have the kind of voices that were outside, the black students who were outside who came to try to share their story and their experiences who we didn't get to hear from today. That's who we need to be having in this conversation. The students who are most dramatically affected by the SRO program, if you look at the map and you look at where the schools are who have the SRO programs, it's racialized communities, it's students who have the schools that have a predominantly racialized student body. Those are the people who need to be in here talking about their experiences. And that's not who we heard. We had a parade of people who were who who seemed to have like wooden robotic scripted stories that were very supportive of the SRO program and we didn't get to hear a balanced report. And now it's 6.30 p.m. People have had to leave. This is a really disappointing outcome because you had some brilliant people in the room who really could have helped you to think through how to solve this problem, how to create something better for all of our students and you kind of wasted this opportunity. You wasted our genius, you wasted their genius, and you've wasted your time. Unfortunately, so I really hope that you consider having another meeting where you actually speak to the young black men, as somebody mentioned earlier, who are mostly being targeted, talking to trans and disabled students who are black as well, who are experiencing multiple, you know, targeted policing in their communities. These are the people who we should have heard from today. These are the people who you should have asked questions of when they graced you with their presence at the end of this table. That was just disappointing. Any other questions? I mean, I know Ken is the only person who asks questions of people um, who are against yeah. the SRO. Do any of you have questions Councilor for me? Carol, you had a question. 
Uh, no, Thanks, I don't. Ken. But as a result of Ms. Newbold's uh, um, uh, deputation, I'm not I will Newbold. have questions. Uh, I beg your pardon? I'm Cyrus. Remember, I'm just stepping in for, for sorry, things. Sorry, sorry. I'm just, uh, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry I'm not looking at you. I'm addressing the chair. No problem. That's yep. what we're supposed to sure. do. Sure. Um, I will have questions of staff as a result of this deputation. So we're, yep. we're going to have to be careful not to rush through that. Um, I, I did ask many questions, as did we all, of Akio Maroon and her daughter. I, I just don't have questions right now. That's fine. I understand that. But you can understand why, where I'm coming from. I stood here the whole day, and it was very disappointing when you had, you know, lawyers and, 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 and academics and, and, and firsthand students giving their testimony and their account, and you seemed to not be taking it in. Or maybe that was just my perception. And I heard a lot of questions about pizza and barbecue and, and et cetera. And so I just think that perhaps that could have gone a bit differently. Thank thanks so much. Thank you much I, thanks. Input, and thank you for waiting around. Um, Cheryl Tomlinson Thompson. Cheryl, thank you for, yes, could you give it to Deirdre, please? Uh, the Cheryl, thank you. You've got three minutes, and I'll give you the one minute warning, and uh, thank you for waiting around. Thank you for having me. I had not always wanted to be a police officer. My credentials are in computer science and management studies. I had worked in the IT sector for over a year, for over decades, with my last job doing database maintenance in the AT&T billing system. It was quite a discourse in my family when I told them I left a safe career coding in binary to become a police officer. It has been near 10 years now, and I have not had one day of regret. I saw that policing in Toronto was a perfect conduit for me to fulfill my passion for helping people. It is an amazing feeling when you realize that your passion and your, and your purpose in life coincide. The unit in the service that offered me the greatest opportunity to realize this was when I worked at a, as a school resource officer. Everyone in this room will agree when I say our children are our future. I am humbled at the chances I had had to meet and work with many of our future generation. Our young people get the opportunity to know a member of the police service as not someone who is called in when there is an emergency or need for incarceration, but to get to know a police officer as a person, a confidant, a support, as just another member of our society that they have no need to be fearful of. I have worked in collaboration with some amazing police officers who have chosen to work as an SRO as well because they do share the passion for the betterment of our society, starting with our youth. The school resource program has built many bridges which can only make our future brighter. I have had situations where parents have come to me in tears requesting an intervention and I have been able to work with the family. I have had youths who were at risk because of paths they, have, they are on and have been able to help steer them in the right direction. I have had school personnel ask for assistance in figuring the best way to aid students in crisis. And of course, there's the fun part, where lifelong relationships are formed. One day I was driving a marked scout car one, one minute. on Shepherd Avenue when I heard a car honking and I saw a person flagging me down. I thought this was an emergency, but to find it was one of my past students who I had not seen for over three years, who just could not pass up the opportunity to say hello and to tell me how great he's doing at university and to thank me for being there for him in high school. <coughs> just a couple weeks ago, I was in a civilian attire at a car wash and a young man approached me. Officer Titi, don't you remember me? It's me. And he went on. This was a young man who was an at-risk youth who would have never wanted any affiliation with the police or on how he is more any affiliation with the police if it weren't for the opportunity that we had when we met in school. Thank he continued you. to update me on how, it is more how he's more cautious with the companies he keep and how he enrolled for college and that he's keeping out of trouble. The intrinsic satisfaction you feel when you know you have made a difference in a young person's life, it is the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Gita Madden. 
Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. Uh, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Geetha Madden. Um, I recently completed my master's at the Faculty of Education at U of T, where I studied actually policing in schools um, with renowned race and legal scholar, Dr. Shreen Razak. So today I want to comment, I want to speak on how irresponsible the administration of this program has been. And um, you've heard about some of the really grave consequences for some of our most marginalized students today. But what you also need to be reminded of is that you have not created an accessible forum for those students to be here today and to feel like they can come speak up. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about policy around this. The only policy document that I could find was something called the Police School Board Protocol. Um, and this is an agreement between the Toronto Police Service and the two public school boards. Um, this document provides rules and procedures governing the relationship between the TPS and the school boards and includes many provisions to protect students in the context of their interactions with officers in their schools. So the SRO program, it actually violates the established police school board protocol, which is your own policy. Um, and for 10 years, you've lacked the oversight to even realize this. So I'm going to talk about two ways in which it violates the, school, the police school board protocol. So one is, according to the protocol, there is supposed to be a clear distinction between school-based incidents that require mandatory notification of the police and discretionary notification of the police. Um, so normally, principals are the ones who decide when police are called for discretionary, um, you know, it's up to police discretion. And they're required under the protocol to consider other other sorry, other mitigating factors in this decision. So surely one of these mitigating factors should be the systemic anti-black racism that plagues both the educational and policing institutions. Um, however, in SRO police schools, the procedures for discretionary notification of the police become irrelevant as officers are always just already there, ready to respond. Indeed, if you had done your research on SRO programs, you would know that in many other jurisdictions across the board, schools with SROs experience far greater rates of arrest for discretionary offenses than those who are not SRO policed. So to the officer before who was talking about um, that how he doesn't think that the school to prison pipeline exists, this is actually not a matter of opinion. So black, indigenous, racialized, and undocumented students are criminalized through school-based policing. There is a lot of research about it out there, and it was actually your responsibility to do this research before you implemented this program. Yay. Secondly... We've got one, one minute. Okay, I'll just make a quick point about access to information. So the police school board protocol presents clear procedures required for interviews of students by police officers when related to criminal investigations. However, there are no parameters for defining any other types of interviews that exist outside of this scenario. And certainly, as we know, SROs do engage in informal interviews on a routine basis. So as you've seen, they encourage students to see them as friends and to disclose personal information to them. But let's be clear, this program is an intelligence gathering project. We know that. You have, you have written that yourselves. Others have shown here today that this is at, the SRO program is in direct violation of Toronto Sanctuary City policy and the school board's don't ask, don't tell policy and the school board's equity policies. We've even had teachers come forward indicating that SROs in their schools have access to student records. According to your own protocol, disclosure of student records to the police requires written permission of parents or guardians or... It requires a search warrant or an appropriate court order. So with that, I'll just end there. I'm calling for the immediate removal of the SRO program. And in the absence of that, we will be escalating this as a human rights issue at the provincial level. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions? Um, yes, uh, Councillor Carroll. So, so I hear what you're saying about, about uh, removing it. But we have a motion before us. And you've just... You've just listed uh, uh, a number of things that we didn't ask 10 years ago. Well, whoever was here, we did not ask those things 10 years ago, and we should be asking them now. They seem to me like what should be the proper terms of reference of us properly examining this now. So would you not, would you not agree that, that if we are reaching out to people like yourself and mm -hmm. actually taking a hand and saying the terms of reference reference ourselves of properly looking at this, that we will this time 
do a proper job of that? So I brought up those things because I'm actually in no way advocating for better governance or any reforms or a review of this program. I brought those, th those things up to demonstrate how for 10 years you have been unable to ensure that the SRO program doesn't violate your own policies, never mind other policies in the city, and you have been unable to protect the students who are most put at risk by this program. So I'm, I brought those things up to demonstrate that you, this lack of oversight is completely reprehensible and the program just needs to go. Any other questions, colleagues? Ken, did you have one? As a human rights issue, um, you, you mentioned that, of course, that you're going to pursue this um, as a human rights issue as well, right? That's where um, we'll have to go if it's not yeah, resolved just, at this yeah, level. Yeah, so I'm asking, um, have you been in touch with the, with, with the Human Rights Office to determine this at all? No, I mean, hold on. The reason I'm asking that is because um, I think, quite frankly, the human rights, um, you know, we haven't seen and heard a lot from the human rights uh, tribunal, right? And so I'm trying to understand if that is communicated so that we, if in factoring what we need to do as a board, we need to factor some aspect of that. And so I'm just trying to get, get a sense of that. We are willing, we are going to pursue this in, in service of students and young people in the city at whatever level we need to take it to. So whether that is the Human Rights Commission or some other, you know, we will let you know. Okay, all right. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Andre Bro. Andre, thank you for your patience. Uh, three minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning. Hi. Um, my name is Andre Bro. I am a co-chair of the Parent Council at uh, Western Technical and Commercial School. As I say, this has uh, been a very uh, emotional day for me. Um, I, this is something that our Parent Council has struggled with. So this goes back to my son's grade nine when the, within the second week of school he was robbed by another student within the school. Um, and it happened to be on a parent council night, which, so this has become a, a for the last two years, an ongoing conversation um, at our parent council um, about, about the, the, the issues within the school. Um, for our parent council, it is an elephant in the, in the room. We've discovered through our discussions that our school community is divided. We do have racialized youth in the school. We do have all these issues but we've been struggling for two years to actually address those issues. Um, from what I hear today, I do recognize that there is questions about the SRR program, but I do know from our experience at Western Tech, um, they have been a positive influence. But again, personally, I do recognize, yes, it's been said here, the elephant in the room. I can go on about the three programs that the, um, the SRs have run. They have ran a boxing program, they have ran a fitness program. They've all been very positive. For our, and I do agree, I do agree. One of the things that we've been trying to do with our own parent council, to use your own language, it is a shame within the Toronto District School Board that there isn't the funding for the other adults to support these students. We have, we, we have been writing the uh, Ministry of Education, we've been writing the Toronto District Catholic School Board to get those children and youth workers within our school to support the, the communities that we know. We're struggling as a parent council to bring the community together. It, well, I don't want to get in discussion with you, but it, yeah. That, that's easy you said to done. We uh, talked to, the, we talk to the Ministry of Education, they say talk to TDSB. These are all different. This is... You've got one minute left. Thank you very much. This is bureaucracy. So we're struggling as a parent council on how to bring our community together. Now, for us, the SRRs are part of our community. But we do recognize that there is an issue with their presence in this school. We're, we're, our own parent council are investing money 
We brought the, uh, the Unity program into our school. That's $15,000 that the parent community is investing to bring other aspects of our community into the conversation. We want to build a community within our school. So for me, this has been very emotional. It's been very emotional. I, I know I sit here as a white man. I can't imagine, you know, to, can't imagine the life of some of the racialized youth within our community. I, no, but I'm trying. I'm trying to have that conversation. I can't imagine the life of the youth that robbed my son. I can't imagine that, where he came from. But, but, but we're trying as a, a parent council. So I, you know, support, our, our parent council supports the SOR program. Um, Thank you. But we recognize much. it's not perfect, and we would like to see it to, can be, you right. know, studied, not just. Uh, but we'd also like for our community to make the decision. Our parent council supports it. That should be our school, our school community's decision, um, and bring the other parts of our. We'd like to bring the other parts within our school to have that conversation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, questions, colleagues, Mayor Tory. Well, I think you just sort of answered my question. I mean, I think you were very balanced and very open. But I was just going to say, if you recognize the struggle that's gone on in this room. You say you support it, but um, you know, isn't the proper way we would normally deal with that in, in the city of Toronto to have to, to actually have a, an open review with all the consultation going on that was described in the motion you might have seen earlier on? I mean, I think that's what you just said. Yes, yeah. yes, I like you know, from what I heard today, it's obvious that the program needs to be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. Again, any other questions, colleagues? No. Thank you very much, and again, thank you for your patience and staying. Thank you. Uh, uh, Butterfly Gopal. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience in, in staying. Um, So I'll give you it's, uh, three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute uh, warning, okay? Um, so my name is Butterfly. I'm a resident of uh, Jaden Finch for almost 40 years, a survivor of the TDSB system in the same neighborhood, a parent of two black sons, uh, 120 and almost four or five, and a community health worker in the neighborhood for 18 years. So when we look at the experience, the lived experience, I think I'm clocking in about 100 years. Um, I'm here representing Jane and Finch Action Against uh, Jane and Finch Action Against Poverty, which is the largest yes, thank you, which is the largest resident-led social justice group in the community. Growing up in Jane and Finch, we have the strongest we have a strong distrust towards electoral politics. The fact that the city politicians, school board and the Toronto Police Services Board signed off on a deal that let armed and uniformed cops who have been responsible for numerous violent incidents, including murders in our community, to monitor and control our children and youth is a clear example why we don't trust our politicians. In our community, we have a history of police oppression. There are numerous reports to prove that. So many mothers, if they're fearful of police retaliation could attest that their kids have been betrayed, beaten by cops, had to face fake charges, and had been threatened, and so on. These armed men, and at times women in uniforms that can, that can and have killed our children with immunity, these men are in our schools. They're watching our kids while we're at work or at home. With targeting police, Policing, Tavis, police carding, and SROs, for the past 10 years, we've lived under 24-7 surveillance. That money given, to city, given by the City of Toronto, province, and the feds could have gone to mediation, restorative justice, youth workers, community workers, educators, sexual health workers, jobs for our young people. It's not just the city of Toronto who's liable. The school boards are responsible for their oppressive, racist policies and practices as well. I'm speaking about Jeffries, Westview, Emory, Downsview, Jane and Finch schools. I have two sons, a 21-year-old and a four-year-old. I worry about their safety and future. 
But it's not just the black men, it's black females who are getting roughed up out here by the police, Latina, Vietnamese, Indian, indigenous, African, Afghan. If you're from these parts, you, you, if you're from these parts, if you're racialized and poor, you're hunted. We are Canada's inner colony, and, and every effort is made to remind us of it. Our community has rallied to stop schools from closing, lock down our local welfare offices, shut down intersections, march to 31 Division several times. We will continue to do so until there is justice. There is no place for the SROs in our educational system or any reason to delay this. Following JFAP's most important recent statement was issued yesterday and our demand is clear, the end of special resource officers in our schools. Th thank you. Your, your time's not gave you the No, point. no. These policies, these racist practices came from our neighborhood. We're not done. Uh, okay. JFAP is seconds. calling on Toronto Services Board to vote immediately to end the special resource officers program of the Toronto District School Board, the Toronto Catholic School Board, and its implementation of any other similar program in the future tonight. Our community has opposed the presence of police officers in our schools from the very beginning. The tragic and heartbreaking death of Jordan Manners in our community 10 years ago provided a pretext of police and school boards and the city politicians to push push with their laws and order and racist approach. Instead of focusing on the resources in the systemic prevention by addressing social and economical, political causes of violence that, that impose cops in schools. Programs despite strong oppression and opposition and community condemnation. Our youth have experienced the negative effects of having armed and uniformed cops in our schools. The SRO program aid in our schools aids the prison to prison pipeline. This so-called program has an extension of targeting police practices, police carding, Tavis in our neighborhood and across the city. Programs such as Tavis SROs have continuously built profiles on our youth, their families and our communities in criminalizing ways. Throughout the years, we had had the highest incidence of criminalization of residents, mostly black, racialized and poor, poor youth. Our community and communities affected by SROs programs have the largest population of low income households, high levels of poverty and unemployment, and one of the highest proportions of racialized people and immigrants in Toronto. For years, JFAP has opposed police violence, police racist policies, and the occupation of our community spaces by these police. We want them out and we demand social and economic justice. We demand an end to the racialization of poverty and the elimination of poverty and all its forms and oppressions altogether. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, uh, questions? Dr. Carroll? Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm looking at social media. Is, is it the case that right now the public is not being allowed into headquarters? The front doors were locked at 5.30. Social media that so the working the poor, media, working people have been locked session, out from this consultation. People want to come in and watch. They're not being allowed. Is that the case? Young people who go to school that work hours all over all I'm different not, I'm times trying to get are locked the out. From, from, uh, leadership. But you need to know who's out there. Yeah, the doors will be locked. The doors there's are an locked auto, at there's an auto locking system after 5:30. It's not because of this meeting. It is a standard issue, but we'll go and check and see who wants to come in. There's a sign on the door that said the police uh, headquarters is closed due to a protest. So, ah. FYI, oh. they're not. Are there I have any a question other questions? for the board. Yeah, I actually have a question for you guys. If the SROs are so important, Doesn't why aren't they in way. the high schools of your children? Thank you. Uh, any but other questions area, yes. of, uh, of Butterfly? Okay, thank you very much for your deposition, and thank you for giving us a written copy. Uh, Kate, Katie German. Uh, Katie, uh, it's three minutes, one minute warning. Great. Thank you. Uh, first off, we want to demand an amendment or a new motion calling for the full removal of the program immediately tonight. What I will share 
Many of you know me from last month. I was here at the meeting and shared my direct experiences with the SRO program. I've worked in the TDSB and TCDSB schools for the past 10 years, including schools with SROs. I've seen them every day. I shared with you stories at the time I watched an SRO grab a black student by the shirt collar and aggressively shake him because he missed hockey practice. That is an assault. How many stories of students being assaulted do you need to hear before you take action to stop it? I shared with you the time I witnessed a student be asked their immigration status in front of an armed SRO. How many stories of officers participating and violating the don't ask, don't tell policy do you need to hear before you will stop it from happening? Councillor Shelley, you said today that the deputations from last month stuck with you. What are you prepared to do about it? Yeah. When I did one of my teaching placements at a school in Rexdale, the SRO organized a trip to a local police station as part of a civics class field trip. He gave students a tour of the holding cells and said, this is where we keep the bad people. When they come in, they get half a pizza pocket. The students said, that's not enough food. He said, they're criminals, what do you expect? This is an SRO who's been in the Toronto Star many times because he coaches a football team. One of the students in that class had been detained previously in that cell. He dropped that class that week. I need, I could line up 98% of that class to come in here and tell you that SROs are great. They engage with me, they tell me great stories. I need you to care about that one student who dropped a compulsory course because of that SRO. We've heard today about youth who participate in sports programs and music programs with SROs. I need you to care about the kids who do not go to those programs because there are SROs. SROs are not educators and they are not counselors. Educators and counselors have five-year degrees that include in-school practicums and annual oversight by certifying bodies like the Ontario College minute. Teachers. SROs. Uh, run programs as we were told by Chief Saunders and they might get two days worth of training in September about how to run a program like Music Not Mischief. That is not enough to act as a counselor in a school. Food insecurity in the city is at 12%. We consider that a crisis. Enough that we're going to fund daily universal student nutrition programs. Saunders told us last week 52% of students said that they feel safe. That means 48% of students do not feel safe in school because of SROs. When we want to address the issue of hunger in our city, we don't line up a room full of people who have enough to eat to tell us about the issue. We listen to the people that are closest to the issue and then we take action. I want to remind you of what you said last month. Marie Molnar, you stated in the context of the Transformational Task Force Committee, we need to do something significant. And if a motion was put forward to suspend the SRO program today, I would postpone it. That's what you said. Mayor Tory, you stated that SROs came up in three of the four anti-black racism consultations that you attended. Parents and residents of those communities came and shared their stories. People were concerned about armed officers in their schools and that you were ready to listen and take action. Katie. You said that last month. Katie. Councillor Carroll, you said that you, we, should, we should suspend Katie. and we should make it obvious that we are hearing these concerns loud and clear. That's what you said. Dunaria, you said we need to suspend and we need to then engage the community. I urge at least one of you to be courageous and call for the removal of this program. Since the last meeting, we have been contacted without solicitation by multiple principals and teachers who want to express their deep concern with this program. And when we said, great, here are the ways that you can share, they all said that they could not speak up because they fear reprisal from their employer, the TDSB and the TCDSB. What makes Katie, you think Katie, if you conduct you. a review that they Katie, would tell you anything you. different? If you conduct a review, you do nothing about the culture of fear, the culture of silence, the culture of reprisal. Why were there teachers here in support of the program and teachers who wanted to come and voice their concern were denied release time to do so? Why is the administration Katie, allowing that to much. happen? Could you wrap it up? I need you to know. Oh, they turned it off. Education, Wrap not incarceration. You're at five minutes now. Great. Thank you. We have parents, teachers, youth, community workers, nonprofit. We have a wide, wide breadth of support. What I have for each of you is a folder containing letters saying you need to suspend or end this program immediately. This Thank is you. one of you.
All of you get one. This petition has 1,000 names in it. We put this up one week ago, and it already has 1,000 names. We printed and bound a copy for each of you, and you need to look at each of these names and ask which one of you at this table is going to be courageous enough to do something. You've expressed concern. You've heard these people here take action. Reviewing is not action. Katie, thank you very much. Uh, Colin. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, two and a half minutes or two minutes or so to speak uh, again today as a researcher and teacher with the Toronto District School Board, most recently at CW Jeffries. I've been an educator for over 10 years and I've been conducting community-based research at York University since 2011, including a study entitled School Safety in the Urban Neighborhood, which I talked about last, uh, last month. And... Uh, we partnered with a respected community organization in the Jane Finch community for this research, which had developed trust uh, relationships with a lot of students. So we um, got, got information from some of the most vulnerable um, students uh, in that community. So I want to highlight a several elements of our study that I didn't speak to last month. And first, I want to say that this research study had uh, TDSB, Toronto Catholic District School Board, and Ministry of Children and Youth Services approval. And it involves students and staff from all of these institutions. I want to emphasize again that our findings demonstrate that with the young people we interviewed, the safety, health, and educational traje trajectories of these youth were continually placed at risk through their experiences with police that were described in the words of youth as aggressive, unwanted, harassing, intimidating, and actually included a f fair number of egregious experiences of physical and sexual assault. Uh, and for these reasons and many others, the current motion on the table needs to be amended to include an immediate suspension of the program, as the previous uh, speaker spoke to. One instance, two instances, three instances, four instances. How many do you need of these kinds of egregious situations to happen before you stop this uh, program that is violating so many things? Our findings were based on interviews with 63 young people and 48 professionals who work with youth. So these can't be dismissed as purely anecdotal, although I would suggest that people's stories and anecdotes, in fact, do constitute legitimate research. I want to emphasize that in our interviews with youth, we spoke to several young people who identified as Catholic school students and many more youth that had previous experiences in the Catholic system. They were predominantly black, racialized, and indigenous. They sat down and shared with us in great detail their experiences of constant police surveillance in their communities, on their way to schools, on their way from schools, and with the SO program inside the school. Um, our research findings were solicited and sent to the Toronto Catholic District School Board Research Department, but given the public statements of the TCDSB director, seem to have been ignored. I didn't hear anything about this. So the students in our study uh, clearly stated very over overwhelmingly they felt more watched, more s unsafe, and more surveilled. So I just want to end uh, and pass it over uh, to Desmond to just say, if if the best test of whether a program or service is equitable is by listening very carefully to the most vulnerable populations in our society. And this is why we need to end this program immediately. Today, in a motion by folks here. Thank you. Uh, okay, you got Speaking of the most vulnerable among us, first of all, shout out to all the people who stuck it out even though they tried to silence you today. We love you, we see you. The most fascinating thing for me about today's proceedings has been how many people here who say that they are devoted to and engaged in and overseeing education, saying that they have never heard the stories of abuse that are coming here today, that it is the first time. 
I'm going to explain to you the reason why you have never heard these stories, because you don't want to know. If you guys wanted to know about potential abuses of our kids, look, you should have never implemented this program in the first place because you never asked the community, as has been said over and over again. But if you wanted to know about potential abuses, you would have numbers in front of you about how many SROs have engaged in arrest and how many SRO have engaged in talking to CBSA. You would know how many officers have engaged in charges in our schools, but you don't collect that data because you don't want to know. You don't let young people who are outside into the room, but you have police officers to confront us because you don't want to hear from them. Because if you do, and those stories pierce your hearts, you will have to do something about it. That's why you don't ask. And then you say, well, we realize we haven't asked for almost 10 years, so give us another chance. Give us another chance to do what? Mess up our kids' future? We're not going to allow you guys to do that. And this is not about me trying to make a cogent, persuasive argument to you. All the information and data is on our side, and you guys have stories about pizza and coaching football. But what I want to say to you simply is, you want to roll the dice with our kids' future, and we cannot allow you to do that. If you say today we need to review rather than suspend, Mr. Jeffers, if the motion that you are going to bring here, that you now want to take away, if you don't bring it back, what you're saying to the community is that you're willing to roll the dice, that you haven't collected the information about CBSA, you haven't collected the information about arrests, you haven't collected the information about charges, but not knowing you are willing to roll the dice. Don't do that to our children. Thank you very much. Thank you very our much. Our children's future is far, far too yes, important Nicole, for you, you to and continue to roll the dice, even though you have acknowledged that you don't know. And I'm going to say one more thing. It's been a long day, if you don't mind, because I had to put myself here again to get arrested, potentially, today, just to be able to talk. And that's what I want to say. That's what I want to say, is that these folks who are standing here next to my friends here, this is what y'all do. You talk about how you want to hear from everyone, but you don't want to hear from everyone. When people who threaten you come to talk to you in a public proceeding, you put cops next to them just like you put cops next to our kids in school. We are on to y'all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We see exactly in front of us, we see exactly what you're doing when you bring them near us every time to intimidate us. We are stronger than you because we can go through this, and we're going to keep fighting you until you do the right thing. Do the right thing for our children. Thank you very much, Desmond. Any questions? Colleagues? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Donna Linkletter? Oh, sorry, Ken. Um, <clears throat> my question is this, right, that um, we've heard from a lot of people here who've said the program is great and what have you, right? Um, you've mentioned that, and, and uh, others have too, that the, the voices of, of a lot of African Canadian youth and racialized youth and, are not being heard. Um, what opportunity you think we should give them to be heard. I'll tell you why, and let me just finish. Because, um, it's, as you've heard me say before, it's, it's the elephant in the room. And so, the, the opportunity that, for other, the, the rest of the world to know, right, what is going on, I think is really important. And so when you, when you speak on behalf of, I think that's great, but what about the youth, African youth, and racialized, other racialized youth speaking, about their own experiences. So I want to say a couple of things about that. It has, it has already been brought to your attention that this is, and I told you this last month actually, Ken, and I'm going to tell you again since you asked. This is not a community forum where we are right now, okay? This is a place where the building doors get locked at 5.30, and those of you who are running the meeting don't even realize that the community is outside, and we have to tell you 
The community have to shout through the door, literally shout through the door in order to be heard. Ken, this is a police headquarters. There are people here who are here specifically, hey man, to intimidate us. That's why they're here. You might not want to hear that. Y'all might not want to hear that. But if you're actually trying to hear people, you would hear that this is actually not a, you guys should never have another police services board meeting in this building again. Because this is not the place to hear community concerns and it is not safe, particularly when being outspoken means that armed officers are once again gonna come and threaten your body. So I would say that if you wanna hear from those people, you have to actually go and meet them where they are and find them, however, Ken, however, however, once again, if you're only saying, well, we're here to entertain and listen and we desperately want to hear from these young people, but in the interim, we're not going to do what is being advocated to keep them safe, that's not a real conversation. Students don't just want to be listened to. They want to be heard. They want their experiences to actually be valued. You guys actually have to be prepared to receive the feedback if you're going to solicit it, not just go and find these young people, which you have not done. Well, you see, one of the reasons for my question, too, is the fact that in the transformational task force, um, part of what um, the outreach was apparently, and I say apparently because, you know, it was said to us that all of the communication around coming and seeing how you feel in the old neighborhood was necessary, right? And so it, the task force went out into a number of neighborhoods, and yes, they were up, there was an absence of some of the voices that we, we, we you know, that you're referring to. So... Uh, in the interest of hearing the voices, what I'm asking is, uh, yeah, you know, outside of this 40 College Street, what, how, can you, how can we hear those voices that you're talking about? You can hold a series of meetings. You can work with people in consultation in community to make that happen. But I want to I be clear about this, okay? Yeah. Because you guys seem to be surprised of a lot of things that are such common knowledge here. Are you not aware that there are thousands of people in this province that don't go to school, don't go to work, don't go to the hospital, don't access services of any kind because they are undocumented and afraid that accessing services will get them potentially removed from this country? Are you not aware of that? Because you need to appreciate the fact that special considerations that you have not even begun to make need to be made to hear from even a fraction of those people and that they have a legitimate reason not to come here because they have a legitimate reason to fear for their lives. You know what? When the Toronto District School Board, in an attempt to make those folks feel more safe in school, when they said, don't ask, don't tell, the police's response was, we can't abide by the don't tell part. So what you did was you had a police, uh, or a, a, a school board, that said, school should be a sanctuary. We won't ask about status, and if we find out, we won't tell. But then you invited police into the school, and those police said, we don't acknowledge the don't tell part. So you took away the sanctuary from the school and alienated countless numbers of people, numbers that you're not even aware of. In order to even begin to bring those people back. You guys need to do more than tell us there's gonna be consultation. You need to build a bridge by saying we will stand up to the police when it's necessary, and now is the time, Ken, now. My last question, my last question on that then, my, is that, so um, you, you obviously, you know, I'm pointing out the need for, uh, I would call them intermediaries for now, for the people from the community organizations Right to people to like the ones you've heard from today. So, yeah. are, are you are you um, do you think that there are those enough organizations out there to help do that? I, I I think that there are any number of organizations, and it's been repeated here that this is not the place for them to come to give give to give you that testimony. However, mark my words, if you guys decide to stall once again and you don't take a decision today, our resources are not going to be spent trying to find those people for you. Our resources are going to be spent protecting our children. Look me in my eyes, Ken, you know I'm telling you the truth. We are not gonna give up. 
and all these folks who were bused here today because that was the only way they were going to come when their teachers and principals told them to come fluff up this program. They are not going to be in the streets the way that we are if you do wrong by our kids. We're going to be out here, and you know it. Questions, colleagues? Okay, thank you very much. Do the right thing. Uh, Donna Linkletter. Is uh, Donna Linkletter here? Uh, so, Nana? Donna, Donna couldn't be here okay. to deliver the, the deputation. Okay. Uh, so, the Kids and Families Working Group of Showing Up for Racial Justice Toronto calls for the immediate dissolution of the School Resource Officer Program and an amendment to the, the motion on the table. As white parents, caregivers, and educators, we are showing up in solidarity with the black, indigenous, and other racialized and or undocumented youth and families who are most directly and adversely impacted by the SRO program. We reject the presumption that white parents support the SRO SRO program or that white students are protected by it. Schools should be a place for learning, growth, and community, not for presumed criminality and police surveillance. We therefore extend both support and gratitude towards Black Lives Matter Toronto, Education Not Incarceration, and others for their mobilizing around this important issue. We are profoundly concerned about the profiling and harassment of black and other students of color by SRO officers. We're alarmed that information about immigration status is being collected and shared in violation of the board's own don't ask, don't tell policy. While not targeted in the same way that students of color are, having their peers profiled and harassed and having their entire school stigmatized and criminalized has negative impacts for white youth as well. The full-time presence of armed SRO officers has a consequence for the culture of the school for everyone, unnecessarily escalating any issue into a criminal justice one and leading to a climate of anxiety and surveillance. Any benefits that some may have identified as stemming from the SRO program would be better attained through increased educational and counseling resources, professional ones, people who are trained to do this. The SRO program causes harm to the young people and communities that it claims to serve, and this harm is especially borne by racialized and undocumented students. We know this, you know this, the studies are there, you don't need to do any research. Read the Carl James report, the one that just came out. Read the Curling McMurtry report. Read the Falconer School Safety Advisory Panel report. Read the Toronto Police Service's own 2011 survey. Read the data that you have asked for. You know this. Um, armed officers permanently stationed in the TDSB and TCDSB hallways are not a solution, and they do not make our schools safer. Um, and if I can just add one thing, uh, thank you. So this time of year in the TDSB, and, and I, I presume in the TCDSB, there's usually a moratorium on field trips out of school excursions. And yet you had school administrators and teachers bringing their students to, to this, spending a day outside of class during summatives, during the exams. I think that's just a point of information that you need to know in terms of, I think many of you were moved by some of those stories that you heard today. That wasn't happenstance. And, and that was actually a, a, a very strong exception to board policy. You need to know that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, could you just identify yourself? You're standing in for Donna, but... For Donna are... Linklater, my name, sir, is James Campbell. James, thank you very much. Uh, and and any you, questions, you have colleagues? A, you have a written version of this. Yes, we do. Thank you. Any questions, colleagues? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Nama Raz? Thank you for coming. Thank you for your patience. And I'll give you three minutes, and uh, I'll give you a one-minute uh, uh, warning, OK? My name is Naima Raza, and I'm the school board's lead for the Toronto Youth Cabinet. The, Tr the TYC is the city's official youth advisory body. My name is Layla. I'm a 10th grade student, and I've been here since 1 o'clock. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a member of the school board's group on the TYC. My name is Riley. I'm also a member of the TYC, and I go to Vaughan Road Academy. Today, we would like to highlight numerous dimensions of the SRO program by referencing at the assist by Gita Madan for you. It's important to recognize that the program represents an institution of security and surveillance. Through policing, racialized and black bodies have become associated with violence and criminality. We know this. Black, Live Ma black Lives Matter has told us this. This also holds true within our schools. TDSB data shows that by the time black students graduate from high school, 
42% of black students have been suspended at least once, compared to only 18% of white students. Through the SRO program, racialized students become the victims of control, surveillance, and intimidation in schools. Police presence in schools results in excessive reliance on law enforcement. Minor incidents previously dealt with by the school administration become criminal justice matters and increase students' subjectivity to the school-to-prison pipeline. We recognize that there are youth who say that they have good relationships with their SROs. But the issue here is not about whether we can build positive relationships with officers. It's about an institution of surveillance being present in our place of education. We ask, what benefit is provided by having police officers fulfill these roles? Our professionals, such as teachers who have skills, training, and experience in education and youth engagement, not better equipped to deliver such extracurricular programming. Moreover, the SRO's program, SRO program's rhetoric of positive relationship building is problematic because it blankets any discussion around racial implications of the program. It's by avoiding a nuanced discussion about race and instead using polite, race-neutral language that the SRO program continues to function and cause harm. So what can we do instead? The Falconer Report made 126 recommendations and not one of them called for the placement of armed officers in our schools. In fact, the Fal Falconer cautioned that surveillance-based solutions would undermine the creation of healthy and safe learning environments. Instead, the report recommended an increased investment in professionals trained in youth work, such as guidance counselors and social workers, as well as investment, as, sorry, as investment in evidence-based methods such as conflict resolution programs and peer mediation. Such obvious solutions have yet to be implemented, yet still the SRO program, which has been said to be cheaper than these solutions, was implemented. The SRO program does not need reform. SROs do not need to be provided with greater training. The SRO program needs to be abolished and police officers must be removed from our schools. We urge you to consider this matter through a lens of anti-racism, equity, and justice. We urge you to have a nuanced discussion on race. We urge you to consider the implications that keeping SROs will have on marginalized youth. We urge you to consult more youth, like the TYC. We urge you, we urge that you place youth who are unable to provide a voice, who aren't asked to share their voice, and don't have the resources to be here today. We urge you to put them at the center of this decision. We urge you to consider the ample evidence and research present on both systemic causes of youth violence and the impact of police in schools. One minute. We urge you to recognize that individuals who are better trained in youth work should be the first contact point person rather than SROs. We urge you to answer the question, why do we insist in keeping cops in our schools? Thank you. Thank, thank you very, thank, thank all three of you very much. Uh, Shelley, question? Uh, yes, it's specifically because you're the youth cabinet. I, I know that this year, the, the, and, and really starting last year, the youth cabinet is back to having pretty far outreach. So, so um, in your view, if we want to get out there and talk to some of the young black men that didn't feel comfortable coming here, what are the places we, we should go to, to quickly get that conversation going? <laughs> You need to go to their communities. I mean, it's been said before. I'm just restating what's been said. There are people who have suffered trauma by being in contact with police. There is a significant culture of fear. That's why they're not here today. There are people who do not have the resources to be in this room today. You need to go to their communities, go to Rexdale, go to Jane and Finch, go speak to these students and provide an atmosphere where they can feel comfortable sharing their experience. Right. But I know that I know the youth cabinet is trying to do a lot of that work. So, so you could probably help us get quickly to the to the agencies that where they would feel this is a safe space to have that conversation. Yes, the TYC is eager to be of help in that area. Yes, okay. there are plenty of organizations already doing these work and in, in involving these young people. Thank you. But I just like to add, I think we've heard enough to that this needs to end. It's not. There's been reviews, right? So I think that's what we're hearing as well with the cabinet. 
Any other questions, colleagues? Again, thank you very much, all three of you. Appreciate it. Uh, Ren Niles. Ren, thank you very much for your patience, and uh, I'll give you three minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute signal, okay? Okay. Thank you. I think a lot of us who are positioned against this program are puzzled by why this even needs to be such a difficult decision. The history of the black body and policing is long, it's violent, and it's proven to target us. That's not speculation or a matter of opinion. That is extensive, there is extensive academic discourse and a mapping of about the history of policing and its relationship to the black body that document and reflect on the endless abuses of power policing has performed on the racialized, including that police in schools do not make our schools safer. It's also puzzling because our collective request to cease and desist is not opposed by other participants of the program from a diverse stream of socioeconomic locations throughout the schooling communities of Toronto. We all know very well that is because the program does not include any other socioeconomic demographic but this one. So let's discuss the demographic community and neighborhoods that are underfunded and undersupported by the city of Toronto, lacking of resources, barrier dense, underemployed, job poor, lower income households, predominantly populated by black and POC bodies, everyone struggling with making ends meet in, around, and below the poverty line. Poverty and crime are interdependent social phenomena. If you want to reduce crime, you reduce poverty. Textbook. Yes. Yet here we are in the 21st century on a Thursday evening debating whether the answer to the public safety of black and POC bodies in underserviced areas is more policing versus working towards social, sound social policy to address the inequalities of poverty and to alleviate the pressure of those who suffer from it. Seriously. People are going to try and pretend that it's just a coincidence that the communities that these schools are located in are the very same communities with high police presence already or to ignore that the histories policing in these neighborhoods have produced relationships within that are tenuous and distressful. There is a significant contingent of students, parents, teachers, and faculty who don't want police in their schools. And I'm going to say this. As a black woman in a black body, I am often told not to take space. Today, I respectfully will claim that space and finish this. It is important, okay? I just really need you to know this, okay? With respect to others, you've got a minute. Respect. Schools and thousands more of us who stand in solidarity with this demand, having either done our homework or know personally the relationship of the black body to policing. These communities resisted the decision in its inception throughout its tenure, and they are resisting it 10 years later. In that time, they have borne witness and held account. They are the experts of this experience. They are the databases of empirical evidence. The information gathered via their bodies on the front lines of their lived experience do not need to be called into question when countless studies can be referenced to corroborate their claims. Therefore, further desire to study the situation at the detriment of the community is both reckless and admission of failure to properly monitor a city program that involves the lives and safety of minors. That the minors in question are predominantly black and POC youth is further damning. Further study could also be interpreted as the infantilization of a community by paternalistic authority, in essence making a bold statement that the city of Toronto does not believe that a community of grown-ass adults are capable of deciding what is good for themselves, their children, or their community. <laughs> No, what? no. If it's established common knowledge that poverty and crime are backside and bench and that the way to lower criminal activity is to provide resources, why is it that the city continues to choose more policing at the resistance of the community? It comes to mind that the city is either very stupid, and I know that's not true, or that the choice of policing is deliberate. The city knows exactly what the impacts are because this is what it's paying for. Because again, school to prison pipeline, because capitalism. 
racism. Claims of this collective action, one must hold skeptically the claim that this program is about the safeguarding, the safeguarding of student lives. I don't think I'm alone in my assertion that this program is more about breeding a culture of criminalization from which to mine resources into that pipeline. No doubt these no jails have quotas. So, are you woefully ignorant, in which case rescind this program, or are you willing to admit that you are culpable and that the decision to police these schools is deliberate and performing as planned? We'd like to know. Um, colleagues, questions with Ms. Niles? Okay, I would like to say one more thing. I know that I took up my time, but I would like to say one more thing in a much more collective manner. Teenage livelihood is incredibly difficult because as parents of teenagers, we understand that parenting them is difficult because they are resistant to authority. The process of being a teenager is to break free from authority, to create civil disobedience, to make stupid choices. We have all done it as teenagers. And to know that there are other schools whose teenagers are not held to the criminality of civil disobedience. That these children, that these teenagers are put in a position where they don't have the freedom or the space to be able to be teenagers is disconcerting. Every single one of us here have been teenagers who made stupid decisions, who grew out of those decisions, who became better, amazing people, who learned how to integ integrate and deal with society in very valuable ways. But what tends to happen in this situation is once a child is criminalized, they are forever criminalized. And shame on you for thinking that people with guns, guns, are somehow the kinds of people that should be around when children, young adults, are figuring out how to be adults. That is disgusting, guys. It's disgusting. Uh, Councilor Carroll, did you have a question or not? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, the Rupa Chima. It's been a long day. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you for waiting so long. Uh, about three minutes, and I'll give you a one minute warning. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rupa Chima, and I've been a teacher in Toronto for 10 years. I hold a Master of Education in Social Justice Education with a focus on anti colonialism and anti racism. I've always had a school resource officer in my school. This is not about individual cops who do extracurriculars. This is about systemic racism, violence, and fear that the police represent. If I were before you 10 years ago, I would have been in favor of SROs. I used to think SROs were a good thing. I was taught police were around to protect me. And perhaps they are. But that's because I do not fit the description of those targeted by police in our world. I am not black, nor indigenous, nor Muslim, nor disabled, nor queer. 10 years later, I stand before you today and my mind has changed about SROs in schools. I am in opposition of the program and support the notion for the immediate suspension of armed police in our schools. What's changed my mind, you're wondering? It's simple, and Desmond talked about this at length. I started listening to marginalized folks, particularly black folks, about how this program affects their ability to succeed and how it affects their mental health and safety. I also critically analyze and confront my own ingrained anti-blackness. I implore you, Mr. Tory, and the rest of the board to do the same. By not listening to black folks, we are actively engaging in anti-blackness and white supremacy. I ask you, Mr. Tory, and the other members of the board, which side of history do you want to be on? The one of subjugation, fear, oppression, and anti-blackness, or the one of freedom, love, equity, and social justice? The arguments in support of this program often tout under the guise of safety, but in actuality, it is a fear-based notion. I work in one of the city's high-risk neighborhoods, read, black, and a school community that is predominantly black. So I ask you, is the implication here that my students, my black students, are people to fear? 
These covert notions are steeped in anti-blackness. Let me make myself very clear. I am not afraid of my black students. Black students do not make our schools unsafe. And to imply otherwise is anti-black racism. There's a falsehood here that our schools are dangerous. This criminalizes all students and hyper-criminalizes black students. The people who feel safe with cops in our schools are the same people who feel safe with cops outside of the school. And this just isn't the case for black, indigenous, Muslim, disabled, and queer folks. You want more studies, more research. This, is, this should have been done before the SROs were unleashed into schools and not by capitalizing on the pain of Jordan Manor's murder. How many students yeah, saying they feel seconds. unsafe will it take before you suspend this program? Is it five? Is it 500? What is that magic number? Thing is, the data will always be skewed because if you are looking for a majority, like the people who were bussed in today, you will get the numbers you seek because the program, uh, to keep the program because black students by the number are a minority in Toronto. Even just one black student or one undocumented student dodging an SRO out of fear is and should be enough. I have a story about a class who were given the assignment of writing a rant on the topic they wanted. A black student chose to rant about police brutality. This student's presentation was interrupted by the teacher because she was offended by the content. The teacher then proceeded to call the SRO and asked him to come up to the class to give his perspective on police brutality. This is actively silencing and humiliating a student. Both teacher and SRO worked together to invalidate a student's lived experience with police. We should all be ashamed of this. I am only one teacher, but I need you to know there are many teachers who feel the way I do, but are afraid to speak out. I find it very telling that the majority of the voices heard by those who work in schools, sorry, I find it very telling that the majority of the voices heard uh, today are those, uh, sorry, I didn't write that sentence properly. They, they had a positive perspective on the program. The majority that we heard today I also find it very questionable that students were bussed in from Toronto Catholic during the moratorium period, which is when students should be focusing on culminating tasks and exam review. New and occasional teachers who have insecure jobs fear the repercussions of speaking on this topic. Contract teachers, like myself, with seniority, like myself, are afraid to speak out because it might affect their chances for upward mobility in their careers. Is this the culture of silence and fear we want for our students? Are we teaching our students to remain silent when there's injustice in the world? True social justice work seeks to pull in from the margins the most marginalized. You have enough studies to know black students are the most marginalized. We have an opportunity here to make things right. Lastly, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for waiting. Uh, Michelle Hughes. Michelle, three minutes, please. Okay. All right, so I know that everybody's very uncomfortable with the whole idea of racism and anti-black racism. So let's start off with the fact that everybody has prejudices. Everybody prejudges a situation before they go into it. And we set our prejudices from experiences, family, media, and our friends and our community. I have three black children in the TDSB system, including two black sons. I do not have time for the mayor's wait and see attitude. When the mayor was courting the black vote to which I fell victim of, we should have had a wait and see attitude because so far my black sons are no safer with you here. And I'm extremely disappointed. Ken, I came here. I'm supposed to be home right now resting because I'm on chemo. I came here because there was supposed to be a motion about getting rid of the SROs. However, somehow that got changed to another research situation. I am here because I am scared for my children. I should be home resting. I'd love to take the wig off my head right now because I've been here since one o'clock. But I am here because I am scared for my boys. There is already statistics showing the, dis the disproportionate rate of black children who are suspended and expelled in the TDSB system program. Why? Because of prejudices. Kids are expelled because people are afraid. When a black woman talks, for example, Kamala Harris, politician a couple of days ago, she was considered hysterical. Why? Her other counterparts, her white counterparts, her male counterparts were giving the same, you know, speaking the same way, but she was considered hysterical. Why? Prejudice. 
When we see a black strong woman or a black strong male, we have certain prejudices. This is why there's already, like I said, kids being disproportionately expelled and suspended based on their race that another white child or non-black child would not have that issue. I have to worry for my children of have, going to a school. Now I've got to look at schools. Now I know for sure, thank goodness I'm not Catholic because I would not send my kids to Catholic school board. <laughs> and I live in Etobicoke and I already know now there's no way my kids are going to Silverthorne or Etobicoke Collegiate. Right? Because I have to worry about my boys going to a school with armed officers who could criminalize, harm, or kill my children with no accountability. We have already seen we are in a system where there's been no justice for uh, atrocities against the black community. All the people that you had here, been here since 1 o'clock, what, I'm number 71? What, 50 out of 75 or 60 out of 75, all stacked earlier, were all pro. Yeah. I've been here all now. None of those people, and I don't even think any of you, because if you guys had the same worries and the same concerns that, you, that I had when my boys were born, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. When my black sons were born, I had to worry about minimizing the risks in their lives. Do any of you have to worry about that? Do any of you that have children ever have to tell your children that they have to play differently than other kids in the neighborhood because they are black? Have you ever had to tell your children that they cannot buy certain cars? I know when my boys get old enough, they cannot buy certain cars because they will be targeted. As a black female, I have been stopped by the police because I've been speeding twice, so I can't say anything, right? No problems. But when I'm a passenger and there's a black male driving that car, I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've been stopped. Where we see a police car coming this way, they see us and we go, okay, we're going to be stopped. The car turns around, we're stopped. Not once. I've had tickets, too, and I was guilty. These guys, not once have we been stopped and they've received a ticket for anything. So why were we stopped? So when my boys grow, your boys don't have to worry about that. Your sons don't have to worry about that. My sons, I have to say, don't you dare. I don't care how much money you make. Don't buy no Range Rover. Don't buy a BMW. Don't buy a luxury car. Yep. Buy yourself a little Mazda. Huh? Buy a Lada. Right. Only those who are old know what a Lada is. <laughs> okay? thank, thank you very much. All um, right. Thank but you. that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, colleagues, so Ken, questions? I'd like to hear if you plan on changing that motion to what I was here since yeah. 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Michelle, thank you. M Michelle, thank you, and thank you for waiting around. Um, questions? Okay. Stephanie? No questions. Nice. No questions, no answers. Stephanie? I'll speak to it when I, when I make my motion, okay? You're going to redo uh, your motion, uh, you mean? I'll Thank you. Okay. Hey. okay, as long as you redo it. Hey. Uh, is uh, Stephanie here? Leroy Newbold? Okay. So... Three minutes, guys, and I'll give you the one minute warning. Thank you for giving us the chance to speak in the seventh hour of this meeting. You thought we would get tired. You thought we would leave. We would never leave our children in danger. Yes. I'm a parent. I'm a child who's currently started of a child who's currently starting school in the TDSB, and I'm a teacher at a school within the TDSB whose entire population is black kids. I witnessed an incident at my school where police were called on a five-year-old child who was having a tantrum. The child came up the stairs crying and shaking uncontrollably. He kept repeating to me, the police are going to take me to jail. The police are going to take me to jail. He had a pack of five-year-olds running behind him. Some others were crying as well. Two minutes later, I saw an armed officer come up the stairs. I had to tell them the situation was under control and I would talk to the kids. The kids were traumatized by how the officer had a gun. Even though I reassured them, he wouldn't use his gun and no child is going to jail. This program is traumatizing our children in an environment where they need to be relaxed, 
enough to learn and demonstrate what they're capable of. Whether police are, are stationed in schools or whether they are called, police have no place in schools ever. This isn't creating safety, this is creating fear. Almost 1,000 parents signed a petition to remove police from schools. We don't need a review to find out how community feels about the program. Mm. I'm a parent in the TDSB and I never asked for this program. Yep. I would be deeply uncomfortable and furious if there was an SRO in my child's school. Police deal with crime. Our children are not criminals. Our children go to school to, to, school to learn. Police aren't teachers, principals, or guidance counselors, so what qualifies them to be in schools? Police need to engage with youth. You have a plethora of opportunities to do that, many of which are listed in the Transformative Policing Task Force document. This is sending the wrong message to our children. They don't need to be policed. Our children are being questioned by police without the presence of their parents, guardians, or legal counsel. This is illegal. This is wasting taxpayers' money. What we need is affordable housing. What we need is mental health services that are adequate and appropriate for our communities. What we need is an education system that understands the brilliance of our children and approaches them with the love and the care that we know they deserve. We have a list of schools and we know where SROs are being stationed. You wouldn't give us the list, we found it. They're primarily being stationed in North York and West Toronto where black kids are going to school. Myself and Black Lives Matter Toronto are demanding that you end this program today. Not review it, not suspend it, end it. We will not sit back and watch while our children are being abused. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, any questions? Councillor Carroll? I'm, I'm just wondering, you, the, the list of schools, I, I got it off Twitter from a police officer. I'm wondering, are, is it that you had it, you had it before? It was given by a TDSB source. Ah, thank you. We had asked for it previously from the TDSB and also at another event that we had um, where there were some uh, people from the city there who said that, one, that it didn't exist and that, two, it wouldn't be provided to us if we asked. And we said that it should be made public information and uh, they told us that it wasn't. So we got it in another way. Yeah. Okay. The, the Catholic District School Board one? If it's on Twitter, you should put it on your website. That's not accessible to people. They need to know what's happening to their children. That's not acceptable. Sorry, can I just ask, is that the Catholic District School Board one that you're talking about? Well, I'm glad that we were able to mobilize enough people to come here to allow that to happen, because honestly, it's not public, and it hasn't been public until today. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, thank you all very much, and uh, sorry it's taken so long to get here in the seventh hour. Um, Leroy Newbold. Uh, uh, Giorgio Manamaliti. No. Okay, that gets us down to, that's it, finally. Um, colleagues, um, we've had four hours of uh, depositions and uh, uh, questions. Uh, it's now a, a question of going back to the, uh, the um, uh, resolution. Uh, so I open it for discussion. Yep, uh, by all means, uh, Councillor Carroll. I just, uh, for, for those who were asking, I just retweeted the thing that, 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 that I got. Um, uh, so, so I know it's not in the item, but I, I have to ask because we have to, to uh, uh, ask uh, according to things that we heard in the delegation. Do we know who arranged for deputants to be bused down here and how they all came to be first on the list? Well, I actually want the answer. I actually want the answer. Thank you. I'm going to have uh, the Superintendent Rinsick come up.
Constable McGarry as well, who's the uh, coordinator of the program, to come up as well. I'm sorry, Councilor, the question was... Do we know who arranged to bus uh, uh, a, uh, a large collection of very pro-SRO program uh, folks down, uh, actually bus them down, and how they all came to be first on the list? I'm not aware of anybody being bused down here, and we didn't arrange that. Uh, how they became first on the list, uh, my understanding is, is they are in order of signed up on the on the police service board website. So, okay. So, so I guess we could inquire of school boards. Although I think I only have to inquire of one school board. Oh. So, okay. So we we don't know exactly, but. Given how things have unfolded today, um, I, and I don't need a lot of uh, uh, yelling and screaming, it's late. Um, if, we're to, if we're going to proceed with the study that, that's in the motion, if we're, if we're going to set terms of reference, um, today it seemed like a lot of effort went into to stacking opinion before we even go out to get this objective third party report from Ryerson. But given what happened today, uh, how can you give us assurances that there we are going to get a balanced report and a concerted effort is going to be made to go out there and talk to the people who were afraid to come here? Well, that, that's exactly why we wanted to... I started this process back in February or March because I wanted to have a thorough review of the program because of my experience with it. Uh, I think it's very positive and the relationships that are being built uh, are... are uh, they, they are exactly the stories that you saw here today. And I've been part of some of those programs and in the schools. I wanted to uh, be able to establish that for a fact. Uh, we have done some reviews in the past, but what we are good at capturing a lot of times is the numbers. And I wanted to, uh, and in discussions with our business intelligence folks, wanted to capture that social return on investment piece, which is why that partnership with Ryerson is key, because they are the experts and have a, a complete, I guess, uh, staff there that are dedicated to that social return on investment piece. And that's why I wanted but to have that as well. social return on investment is, but with all due respect, it's late. That's why I'm rushing this along. We heard a lot about the social return on investment. How can I be sure that I'm going to get the warts and all? Sometimes there isn't a social return on investment. Sometimes we don't get a return on the investment. We get we get a, 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 an actual... Uh, a, uh, polar opposite of that. That's what we're hearing. We're, uh, but at the late hour, how can I be sure that both of these phenomena are going to be reported on if we say today we'll study first? Well, we didn't start at this alone. We consulted with both boards, and I can tell you that uh, between the three of us, one of the most key factors was was hearing the student voices. Um, and so that has been relayed to our, through our business intelligence, and it's going to be one of the key factors. And that was why uh, one was one of the um, uh, issues that the boards had brought forward, because they had to provide letters of support to, to go forward with this review, that they wanted that piece to be heard, the voices of the students to be heard. So that's going to be a key piece in Ryerson's review of this, as well as ours. I, I hear... I hear you saying that when you reach out, what comes back to us from educators is uh, a need to tell you who's supportive. But, but we know from their own surveying that 52% are supportive. How am I going to get documentation of the impact on the other, the 48%? Can well, I be assured tonight that if I vote for this study, there will be a concerted effort to reflect the 48%? Well, Councillor, I can assure you that we want to make sure that uh, the truth comes out and both sides of the story gets told here. Uh, again, that was one of the key pieces when we went, met with the boards about wanting to do this review was that all voices got heard. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I'll give you my assurance as being part of this program that we will uh, definitely make sure that all sides are heard and we'll go to whatever it takes efforts wise to be heard and go out and meet with the community where they need to be met with whether it's in the schools or in community meetings uh, and we'll use Ryerson as an independent to be able to go out and do that so that it is a true independent review of the program. No, no, no. 
those those are my questions for now. Um, <clears throat> I'm really glad that we had this um, today for a number of reasons. One is that, um, and I'll have to get a little bit personal so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I spent most of my life working with African people and all people. Um, I have been on all sides of the police and involvement and what have you. From South Carolina against the sled officers who tried to kill me, having guns in my face on the Columbia steps, I've been there. I fought the Ku Klux Klan in South Carolina. I understand racism in its most brutal form. Friends of mine were killed. Okay, so I'm not coming into this as a neophyte in many ways. And I want you to understand, or everybody to understand this, that working with African Canadian youth and youth of, all youth of color, as a matter of fact, in the city of Toronto and outside of that, Tamil youth, Chinese youth, all youth, but particularly African Canadian youth, because as I said, I'm not living in the past. The past lives in me. You know, sir? And when I hear the, the voices of people saying, look, get rid of the program, and I hear other people busting, as that's uh, presumably, and so forth, it concerns me for a number of reasons. In that the African youth, in particular, and, and racialized youth, as I, I'm not particularly crazy about that racialized youth expression. But however, what happens is that like we did a transformational task force consultation, and, it, and if you recall, Mr. Chair, that um, I was insistent on ensuring that all of the voices would have been heard. And I you know, talked to the, the media, I talked to Caribbean camera, like everybody, right? They didn't show. I talked to community organizations, and I said, bring the youth, let them speak, and give them a safe space. And, yeah, you, know, and you know, we were in Jane Finch, we were all over the place, right? And I tried to get, we worked with some community groups. It was difficult. I said that with carding, 2 o'clock in the morning, when an African-Canadian youth feels he's carded, who does he go to? Or she go to? Nobody. I used to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning just like that. This is not about me, but I want you to understand what, where I'm coming from, right? I am not trying to pretend and, and all that. I'm giving you straight up, okay? So at 2 o'clock in the morning, a youth is stopped, and that, and that has happened. I've received calls, and I know other people in Alexandra Park who have received calls at 2 in the morning. They're not getting paid, a lot of them and they come down to try to help to see what they can do. Okay, now, I think that the, the whole question of youth being alienated by choice sometimes because they're afraid and with good reason, um, we need to hear them. And I want all of us to hear them, not just going through, you know, and with all due respect, other people speaking on their behalf, okay? I, I've been in the jails, I've been everywhere. And when they speak, the young people speak, African youth in particular, they're angry, they're bitter. So I am saying here today that um, one of the reasons that I wanted to see this, um, not a review as much as it is, to have everybody understand 
where these young people are coming from, what is the basis of their fear and their anger, right? Because it's the black elephant in the room, and it always has been. When we walked in the protest against police um, on the so-called Young Street riots, the African-Canadian youth who came up to me and said, we're not taking this anymore, right? And, and it went on. We made promises that were not delivered, right? And now, you know, I'm, you know, when I hear this, you know, and we talk around this table, and we say, look, we are making decisions on behalf of, without the involvement, the direct involvement, that, as I said, that concerns me. I want to see these young people who are afraid, or who say to me, in Malvern, the group said to me, can we not come into any transformation or whatever you call it, because the cops gonna look at me, I have to walk in this community when you sleep in. Okay, and, that, and, and that's understandable. So we all have to be educated, we all have to learn. This is a teaching moment and a learning moment. So when I ask for, a not a review, but to, to have people understand, all of us, where these young people and how they're feeling, it's not a, just a question of, of, a, of a reality show. Okay? This is something that has to happen, and they have to be here. I've tried to also help them understand with the help of a lot of good community workers who work in diverse communities, Alexandra Park, uh, Lawrence Heights, and so on and so forth, right? Trying to get them to understand how the system works so they're not overwhelmed by it. And not because I'm on this board. You know, and I want to say this too. I'm going to say it. I am on this board. And immediately, some people feel as soon as you come, no matter what you do, put your life on the line, whatever, as soon as you come into a board that is made up like this, you say, ah, you know, they are supreme, so I'm going to have to be thinking like them. We're going to find out right now. Yeah. My, so what I'm saying here is this. If we want to truly understand where these young people are coming from. We have to give them a safe space to speak. And, and, you know, but you know, you cannot, you know, canceling the program, you know, doesn't give them a, choice, a chance to, 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 to. Yeah, they are, hold on, hold on. They're doing that with the community, but they have to speak. You can't speak for them all the time. You can't speak. Let them speak for themselves. You know? So my point is this. Yeah, I have the floor. I have the floor. How treat our kids like this and then demand trust? Yeah, but the thing is, you know, you know, everybody speaks, everybody speaks on their behalf, and they cannot speak for themselves. No, no, no. They have to speak for themselves. Today, and you want young, vulnerable people to come here? Listen, listen, um, listen, you have to understand that there aren't any community groups that could bring 20 young people here. You know, in spite of all of the talk and rhetoric, when you, as I said, two o'clock in the morning, when you're in your bed, is they have to deal. And so I say, I say. I think you need to understand that history isn't on your side. This yeah, yeah, but. History is not on my side? No, Ken, it's not. Ken, you're betraying us right now. Yeah, I'm betraying you? You talking about betrayal? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, let me tell you something. Let me, you know, let me tell you something. We came here to back you. How long have you been working in the community? Don't do this, bro. Don't make this personal, bro. We came here to back you up. Listen to me. And let me tell you something. Right? You deny, you deny African people. I, am, I consider myself an African-centered individual. And if you deny, if you deny. You are always late. You are always late to the table. We die, we bleed, we suffer, and you are late. We, we you suffer. die and you suffer? You I, ever had a bullet placed on you? I in your have face? Black huh? woman, black you ever had a gun placed in your face? To in you know? To Come on, man. I am saying to you, you need Anyhow, to I say my motion is this.
Oh, I'm more serious this. That we, I, that, 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 um, You're that, 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 right now. my motion is this. My motion is this. That we, that, that, that my motion is this. My motion is this. Here's my motion. My motion is that, my motion is this. <laughs> my motion is this, Mr. Chair. That the board, my motion is this, that the board suspend the school resource program pending consultation with groups that have been part of the process and that the community groups that are here now and who speak on behalf of the youth be part of the leadership in, in this initiative. And that, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And that, and, and that we, the, and that we develop recommendations after the community engagements by the police and the youth. You know? What? 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 This is all your good for is to come here and drag it out and waste our lives and continue to put us in danger. Go do what you do. This happened last We're going to find you all wherever you are until you are accountable to us. Go on. We're going to be here. We have our youth what? digital stories in their voices. Yeah. This is all you, Mayor Tory. It's all you. Just like Cardin, you say you hear the story.
Right. It has been a long 10 minute break, uh, but it's been a long, uh, long time since one o'clock and uh, um, so, uh, we were at the point, uh, Mr. Jeffers, that you wanted to make um, a, a motion. Uh, perhaps you would make that motion again, now that we've got some it's all, it's all silence. Okay. Okay, I made, I made the motion. Can you read it? The one he was just putting forward a minute ago. The, second, the one I just made. Yes. Right. I don't have it. I, I, isn't it? Has it not been recorded? Can you please repeat it so we can all hear it? No, it's, it's the one. You, you better make it uh, because I don't think everybody heard you a second ago. Is that a part of its mandate? 
that as part of its mandate and following the board's receipt of the injury report of August 20, the meeting, this steering committee expand, the steering committee expand its membership to include participants who reflect the diversity of views on the SRO program, including but not limited to youth, educators, school boards, parents, school administrators, youth advocacy organizations, and other community representatives. That the board suspend the school resource program pending receipt of the final report expected by December the 1st after conducting specific consultation with groups that have not been um, in, in the last process. Okay, did you capture that? Ken, have you got it written down? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I've got it written, so maybe I can just... Yeah. You want to, I can give it to you so you can put it on the screen. Hmm? Okay. No. Well, do you want me to read it again? Yes, please, Ken. Uh, but you're, you're paraphrasing. Yeah. Okay. That the board suspend the school resource program. Yes. Pending it. consultation with groups that have not been part of the process, and that community groups be part of the leadership in this initiative, and develop after recommend develop other recommendations. Um, for community engagement with police and youth. Okay. Can we have a clarification? Would you please let us get on with it? Thank you. Good question. Can just read it slowly so that she can uh, Deirdre can type it. Okay. Uh, Ken, why don't you just come down here and, and read it to Deirdre slowly so that she can put it in the machine.
Read the motion one more time. Deirdre will put it up. Yep. Hopefully the technology is still working. <laughs> Okay, there's the motion on the board. Ken, do you want to just read it one more time for your colleagues? Uh, okay. Uh, Ken, this is your motion up there that the board suspend the school resource officer program pending consultation of groups that have not been part of this process, of the process, and that community groups be part of the leadership of this initiative and further develop recommendations of alternative community engagement between police and youth. Ken, that's the motion you're putting yeah. forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a seconder? Is there a seconder? Okay, uh, hearing no seconder, the, the motion fails. Is there a, a another motion that anybody wishes to put forward? Councillor Lee? There's no seconder? I was... Uh, at the start of this item, uh, Mr. Ken Jeffers put up another motion. I'd like to move that particular motion because I like it. Great. So can we flash that up? Deirdre, do you have that motion? So that motion is on, on the screen. A supplement to the motion moved by the mayor with respect to review of the SRO program. The board appoint a steering committee comprised of two board members and the chief of police to establish terms of reference and governing principles and to oversee and participate in the development of a, of a report on the SRO program requested by the board at the last meeting. That as part of this mandate uh, and following the board's receipt of the interim report at its August 2017 meeting, this steering committee expand its membership to include participants who reflect a diverse view of uh, views on the SRO program, including but not limited to youth, educators, school boards, parents, school administrators, youth advocacy organizations, and other community representatives. And third, that the board defer consideration of the motion from uh, the meeting last uh, year until the end of December, uh, uh, December 31st. So put forward by Councillor Lee, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Carroll. Any discussion? All in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you. Any opposed? Any opposed? Thank you. Is there any other business? Is there any other business to come before the board? If not, may I have a motion to adjourn? Councillor Lee, Dr. Noria, all in favor? Any contrary? Carried. Thank you. Thank you.